Dedication, Preface, and Chapter 1 of Boots and Saddles, or Life in Dakota with General Custer. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Sue Anderson. Boots and Saddles or Life in Dakota with General Custer by Elizabeth Custer Dedication Dedicated to my husband, the echo of whose voice has been my inspiration. Preface One of the motives that has actuated me in recalling these simple annals of our daily life has been to give a glimpse to civilians of garrison and camp life about which they seem to have such a very imperfect knowledge. This ignorance exists especially with reference to anything pertaining to the cavalry, which is almost invariably stationed on the extreme frontier. The isolation of the cavalry posts makes them quite inaccessible to travelers, and the exposure incident to meeting warlike Indians does not tempt the visits of friends or even of the venturesome tourist. Our life, therefore, was often as separate from the rest of the world as if we had been living on an island in the ocean. Very little has been written regarding the domestic life of an army family, and yet I cannot believe that it is without interest, for the innumerable questions that are asked about our occupations, amusements, and mode of housekeeping lead me to hope that the actual answer to these queries contained in this little story will be acceptable this must also be my apology for entering in some instances so minutely into trifling perplexities and events which went to fill up the sum of our existence e b c 148 east 18th street new york city chapter one change of station general custer graduated at west point just in time to take part in the battle of bull run he served with his regiment the fifth cavalry for a time but eventually was appointed aide-de-camp to general mcclellan he came to his sister's home in my native town monroe michigan during the winter of 1863, and there I first met him. In the spring he returned to the army in Virginia, and was promoted that summer, at the age of 23, from captain to brigadier general. During the following autumn he came to Monroe to recover from a flesh wound, which, though not serious, disabled him somewhat. At that time we became engaged. When his twenty days' leave of absence had expired, he went back to duty, and did not return until a few days before our marriage, in February 1864. We had no sooner reached Washington on our wedding journey than telegrams came, following one another in quick succession, asking him to give up the rest of his leave of absence, and hasten without an hour's delay to the front. I begged so hard not to be left behind that I finally prevailed. The result was that I found myself in a few hours on the extreme wing of the Army of the Potomac in an isolated Virginia farmhouse, finishing my honeymoon alone. I had so besought him to allow me to come that I did not dare own to myself the dissolution and fright I felt. In the preparation for the hurried raid which my husband had been ordered to make, he had sent to cavalry headquarters to provide for my safety, and troops were in reality near, although I could not see them. The general's old colored servant, Eliza, comforted me, and the southern family in the house took pity upon my anxiety. It was a sudden plunge into a life of vicissitude and danger, and I hardly remember the time, during the twelve years that followed, 
when i was not in fear of some immediate peril or in dread of some danger that threatened after the raid was ended we spent some delightful weeks together and when the regular spring campaign began i returned to washington where i remained until the surrender and close of the war after that we went to texas for a year my husband still acting as major general in command of volunteers in eighteen sixty six we returned to michigan and the autumn of the same year found us in kansas where the general assumed charge of the seventh regular cavalry to which he had been assigned with the rank of lieutenant colonel in the regular army we remained in kansas five years during which time i was the only officer's wife who always followed the regiment we were then ordered with the regiment to kentucky after being stationed in elizabethtown for two years we went to dakota in the spring of eighteen seventy three when orders came for the seventh cavalry to go into the field again general custer was delighted the regiment was stationed in various parts of the south on the very disagreeable duty of breaking up illicit distilleries and suppressing the ku klux fortunately for us being in kentucky we knew very little of this service it seemed an unsoldierly life and it was certainly uncongenial for a true cavalryman feels that life in the saddle on the free open plain is his legitimate existence not an hour elapsed after the arrival of the official document announcing our change of station before our house was torn up in the confusion i managed to retire to a corner with an atlas and surreptitiously look up the territory to which we were going i hardly liked to own that i had forgotten its location when my finger traced our route from kentucky almost up to the border of the british possessions it seemed as if we were going to lapland from the first days of our marriage general custer celebrated every order to move with wild demonstrations of joy his exuberance of spirits always found expression in some boyish pranks before he could set to work seriously to prepare for duty as soon as the officer announcing the order to move had disappeared all sorts of wild hilarity began i had learned to take up a safe position on top of the table that is if i had not already been forcibly placed there as a spectator the most disastrous result of the proceedings was possibly a broken chair which the master of ceremonies would crash and perhaps throw into the kitchen by way of informing the cook that good news had come we had so few household effects that it was something of a loss when we chanced to be in a country where they could not be replaced i can see eliza's woolly head now as she thrust it through the door to reprimand her master and say chairs don't grow on trees in these year parts general as for me i was tossed about the room and all sorts of jokes played upon me before the frolic was ended after such participation in the celebration i was almost too tired with the laughter and fun to begin packing i know that it would surprise a well-regulated mover to see what short work it was for us to prepare for our journeys we began by having a supply of gunny sacks and hay brought in from the stables the saddler appeared and all our old traps that had been taken around with us so many years were once more tied and sewed up the kitchen utensils were plunged into barrels generally left uncovered in the hurry rolls of bedding encased in waterproof cloth or canvas were strapped and roped and the few pictures and books were crowded into chests and boxes at the last moment there always appeared the cook's bedding to surmount the motley pile of possessions loaded on the wagon 
Her property was invariably tied up in a flaming quilt, representing souvenirs of her friend's dresses. She followed that last installment with anxious eyes, and, true to her early training, grasped her red bandana, containing a few last things, while the satchel she scorned to use hung empty on her arm. In all this confusion, no one was cross. We rushed and gasped through the one day given us for preparation, and I had only time to be glad with my husband that he was going back to the life of activity that he so loved. His enforced idleness made it seem to him that he was cumbering the earth, and he rejoiced to feel that he was again to have the chance to live up to his idea of a soldier. Had I dared to stop in that hurried day and think of myself, all the courage would have gone out of me. This removal to Dakota meant to my husband a reunion with his regiment and summer campaigns against Indians. To me, it meant months of loneliness, anxiety, and terror. Fortunately, there was too much to do to leave leisure for thought. Steamers were ready for us at Memphis, and we went thither by rail to embark. When the regiment was gathered together, after a separation of two years, there were hearty greetings and exchanges of troublous or droll experiences. And, thankful once more to be reunited, we entered again, heart and soul, into the minutest detail of one another's lives. We went into camp for a few days on the outskirts of Memphis and exchanged hospitalities with the citizens. The bachelors found an Elysium in the society of many very pretty girls, and love-making went on either in luxurious parlors or in the open air as they rode in the warm spring weather to and from our camp. Three steamers were at last loaded and went on to Cairo, where we found the trains prepared to take us into Dakota. The regiment was never up to its maximum of 1,200 men, but there may have been eight or 900 soldiers and as many horses. The property of the companies, saddles, equipments, arms, ammunition, and forage together with the personal luggage of the officers, made the trains very heavy, and we traveled slowly. We were a week or more on the route. Our days were varied by the long stops necessary to water the horses and occasionally to take them out of the cars for exercise. My husband and I always went on these occasions to loose the dogs and have a frolic and a little visit with our own horses. The youth and gamins of the village gathered about us as if we had been some traveling show. While on the journey, one of our family had a birthday. This was always a day of frolic and fun, and even when we were on the extreme frontier, presents were sent for into the States, and we had a little dinner and a birthday cake. This birthday that came during the journey, though so inopportune, did not leave utterly without resources the minds of those whose ingenuity was quickened by affection. The train was delayed that day for an unusually long time. Our colored cook, Mary, in despair because we ate so little in the twenty minutes for refreshments places, determined on an impromptu feast. She slyly took a basket and filled it at the shops in the village street. She had already made friends with a woman who had a little cabin tucked in between the rails and the embankment, and there the never-absent Eureka coffee pot was produced and most delicious coffee dripped. Returning to the car stove, which she had discovered was filled with a deep bed of coals, she broiled us a steak and baked some potatoes. The general and I were made to sit down opposite each other in one of the compartments. A board was brought, covered with a clean towel, and we did table legs to the impromptu table. We did not dare move, and scarcely ventured to giggle. 
for fear we should overturn the laden board in our laps for dessert a large plate of macaroons which were an especial weakness of mine was brought out as a surprise mary told me with great glee how she had seen the general prowling in the baker's shops to buy them and described the train of small boys who followed him when he came back with his brown paper parcel miss libby she said they thought a sure enough general always went on horseback and carried his sword in his hand we were so hungry that we scarcely realized that we were anything but the embodiment of picturesque grace no one could be otherwise than awkward in trying to cut food on such an uncertain base while mary had taken the last scrap of dignity away from the general's appearance by enveloping him in a kitchen towel as a substitute for a napkin with their usual independence and indifference to ceremony troops of curious citizens stalked through the car to stare at my husband we went on eating calmly unconscious that they thought the picture hardly in keeping with their preconceived ideas of a commanding officer when we thanked mary for our feast her face beamed and shone with a combination of joy at our delight and heat from the stove when she lifted up our frugal board and set us free we had a long stroll talking over other birthdays and those yet to come until the train was ready to start end of chapter one chapter two of boots and saddles or life in dakota with general custer by elizabeth custer this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by sue anderson chapter two a blizzard after so many days in the car we were glad to stop on an open plain about a mile from the town of yankton where the road ended the three chief considerations for a camp are wood water and good ground the latter we had but we were at some distance from the water and neither trees nor brushwood were in sight the long trains were unloaded of their freight and the plains about us seemed to swarm with men and horses i was helped down from the pullman car where inlaid woods mirrors and plush surrounded us to the ground perfectly bare of every earthly comfort the other ladies of the regiment went on to the hotel in the town the general suggested that i should go with them but i had been in camp so many summers that it was not a formidable matter for me to remain and fortunately for what followed i did so the household belongings were gathered together a family of little new puppies some half-grown dogs and the cages of mockingbirds and canaries were all corralled safely in a little stockade made of chests and trunks and we set ourselves about making a temporary home the general and a number of soldiers composing the headquarters detail were obliged to go at once to lay out the main camp and assign the companies to their places later on when the most important work was done our tents were to be pitched while i sat on a chest waiting the air grew suddenly chilly the bright sun of the morning disappeared and the rain began to fall had we been accustomed to the climate we would have known that these changes were the precursors of a snowstorm when we left memphis not a fortnight before we wore muslin gowns and were then uncomfortably warm it seemed impossible that even so far north there could be a return winter in the middle of april we were yet to realize what had been told us of the climate that there were eight months of winter 
and four of very late in the fall on the bluffs beyond us was a signal station but they sent us no warning many years of campaigning in the indian territory kansas colorado and nebraska gave one an idea of what the weather can do but each new country has its peculiarities and it seemed we had reached one where all of the others were outdone as the afternoon of that first day advanced the wind blew colder and i found myself eyeing with envy a little half-finished cabin without an enclosure standing by itself years of encountering the winds of kansas when our tents were torn and blown down so often had taught me to appreciate any kind of a house even though it were built upon the sand as this one was a dugout which the tornado swept over but could not harm was even more of a treasure the change of climate from the extreme south to the far north had made a number of the men ill and even the superb health of the general had suffered he continued to superintend the camp however although i begged him from time to time as i saw him to give up i felt sure he needed a shelter and some comfort at once so i took courage to plan for myself before this i had always waited as the general preferred to prepare everything for me after he had consented that we should try for the little house some of the kind-hearted soldiers found the owner in a distant cabin and he rented it to us for a few days the place was equal to a palace to me there was no plastering and the house seemed hardly weatherproof it had a floor however and an upper story divided off by beams over these mary and i stretched blankets and shawls and so made two rooms it did not take long to settle our few things and when wood and water were brought from a distance we were quite ready for housekeeping except that we lacked a stove and some supplies mary walked into the town to hire or buy a small cooking stove but she could not induce the merchant to bring it out that night she was thoughtful enough to take along a basket and brought with her a little marketing before she had come within sight of our cabin on her return the snow was falling so fast it was with difficulty that she found her way meanwhile the general had returned completely exhausted and very ill without his knowledge i sent for the surgeon who like all his profession in the army came promptly he gave me some powerful medicine to administer every hour and forbade the general to leave his bed it was growing dark and we were in the midst of a dakota blizzard the snow was so fine that it penetrated the smallest cracks and soon we found white lines appearing all around us where the roof joined the walls on the windows and under the doors outside the air was so thick with the whirling tiny particles that it was almost impossible to see one's hand held out before one the snow was fluffy and thick like wool and fell so rapidly and seemingly from all directions that it gave me a feeling of suffocation as i stood outside mary was not easily discouraged and piling a few light faggots outside the door she tried to light a fire the wind and the muffling snow put out every little blaze that started however and so giving it up she went into the house and found the luncheon basket we had brought from the car in which remained some sandwiches and those composed our supper the night had almost settled down upon us when the adjutant came for orders knowing the scarcity of fuel and the danger to the horses from exposure to the rigor of such weather after their removal from a warm climate the general ordered the breaking of camp 
all the soldiers were directed to take their horses and go into yankton and ask the citizens to give them shelter in their homes cowsheds and stables in a short time the camp was nearly deserted only the laundresses two or three officers and a few dismounted soldiers remaining the townspeople true to the unvarying western hospitality gave everything they could to the use of the regiment the officers found places in the hotels the sounds of the hoofs of the hurrying horses flying by our cabin on their way to the town had hardly died out before the black night closed in and left us alone on that wide deserted plain the servants mary and ham did what they could to make the room below comfortable by stopping the cracks and barricading the frail door the thirty-six hours of our imprisonment there seem now a frightful nightmare the wind grew higher and higher and shrieked dismally about the little house it was built without a foundation and was so rickety it seemed that it surely would be unroofed or overturned in a great gust of wind the general was too ill for me to venture to find my usual comfort from his reassuring voice i dressed in my heaviest gown and jacket and remained under the blankets as much as i could to keep warm occasionally i crept out to shake off the snow from the counterpane for it sifted in very rapidly between the roof and clapboards i hardly dared take the little vial in my benumbed fingers to drop the precious medicine for fear it would fall i realized as the night advanced that we were as isolated from the town and even the camp not a mile distant as if we had been on an island in the river the doctor had intended to return to us but his serious face and impressive injunctions made me certain that he considered the life of my husband dependent upon the medicines being regularly given during the night i was startled by hearing a dull sound as if something falling heavily flying down the stairs i found the servants prying open the frozen and snow-packed door to admit a half dozen soldiers who becoming bewildered by the snow had been saved by the faint light we had placed in the window after that several came and two were badly frozen we were in despair of finding any way of warming them as there was no bedding and of course no fire until i remembered the carpets which were sewed up in bundles and heaped in one corner where the boxes were and which we were not to use until the garrison was reached spreading them out we had enough to roll up each wanderer as he came the frozen men were in so exhausted a condition that they required immediate attention their sufferings were intense and i could not forgive myself for not having something with which to revive them the general never tasted liquor and we were both so well always we did not even keep it for use in case of sickness i saw symptoms of that deadly stupor which is the sure precursor of freezing when i fortunately remembered a bottle of alcohol which had been brought for the spirit lamps mary objected to using the only means by which we could make coffee for ourselves but the groans and exhausted and haggard faces of the men won her over and we saw them revive under the influence of the fiery liquid poor fellows they afterward lost their feet and some of their fingers had also to be amputated the first soldier who had reached us unharmed except from exhaustion explained that they had all attempted to find their way to town and the storm had completely overcome them fortunately one had clung to a bag of hardtack which was all they had had to eat at last the day came but so darkened by snow it seemed rather a twilight 
the drifts were on three sides of us like a wall the long hours dragged themselves away leaving the general too weak to rise and in great need of hot nourishing food i grew more and more terrified at our utterly desolate condition and his continued illness although fortunately he did not suffer he was too ill and i too anxious to eat the fragments that remained in the luncheon basket the snow continued to come down in great swirling sheets while the wind shook the loose window casings and sometimes broke in the door when night came again and the cold increased i believed that our hours were numbered i missed the voice of the courageous mary for she had sunk down in a corner exhausted for want of sleep while ham had been completely demoralized from the first occasionally i melted a little place on the frozen window pane and saw that the drifts were almost level with the upper windows on either side but that the wind had swept a clear space before the door during the night the sound of the tramping of many feet rose above the roar of the storm a great drove of mules rushed up to the sheltered side of the house their brays had a sound of terror as they pushed kicked and crowded themselves against our little cabin for a time they huddled together hoping for warmth and then despairing they made a mad rush away and were soon lost in the white wall of snow beyond all night long the neigh of a distressed horse almost human in its appeal came to us at intervals the door was pried open once thinking it might be some suffering fellow creature in distress the strange wild eyes of the horse peering in for help haunted me long afterwards occasionally a lost dog lifted up a howl of distress under our window but before the door could be opened to admit him he had disappeared in the darkness when the night was nearly spent i sprang again to the window with a new horror no one until he hears it for himself can realize what varied sounds animals make in the excitement of peril a drove of hogs squealing and grunting were pushing against the house and the door which had withstood so much had to be held to keep it from being broken in it was almost unbearable to hear the groans of the soldiers over their swollen and painful feet and to know that we could do nothing to ease them to be in the midst of such suffering and yet to have no way of ameliorating it to have shelter and yet to be surrounded by dumb beasts appealing to us for help was simply terrible every minute seemed a day every hour a year when daylight came i dropped into an exhausted slumber and was awakened by mary standing over our bed with a tray of hot breakfast i asked if help had come and finding it had not of course i could not understand the smoking food she told me that feeling the necessity of the general's eating it had come to her in the night watches that she would cut up the large candles she had pilfered from the cars and try if she could cook over the many short pieces placed close together so as to make a large flame the result was hot coffee and some bits of the steak she had brought from town fried with a few slices of potatoes she could not resist telling me how much better she could have done had i not given away the alcohol to the frozen men the breakfast revived the general so much that he began to make light of danger in order to quiet me the snow had ceased to fall but for all that it still seemed that we were castaways and forgotten hidden under the drifts that nearly surrounded us help was really near at hand however 
at even this darkest hour a knock sounded at the door and the cheery voices of men came up to our ears some citizens of yankton had at last found their way to our relief and the officers who neither knew the way nor how to travel over such a country had gladly followed they told us that they had made several attempts to get out to us but the snow was so soft and light that they could make no headway they floundered and sank down almost out of sight even in the streets of the town of course no horse could travel but they told me of their intense anxiety and said that fearing that i might be in need of immediate help they had dragged a cutter over the drifts which now had a crust of ice formed from the sleet and the moisture of the damp night air of course i declined to go without the general but i was more touched than i could express by their thought of me i made some excuse to go upstairs where with my head buried in the shawl partition i tried to smother the sobs that had been suppressed during the terrors of our desolation here the general found me and though comforting me by tender words he still reminded me that he would not like any one to know that i had lost my pluck when all the danger i had passed through was really ended the officers made their way over to camp for they were anxious and uncertain about what might have happened to the few persons remaining there i had been extremely troubled for each of the soldiers for whom we had been caring had with a trooper's usual love of the sensational told us of frozen men and of the birth of babies to the laundresses these stories had reached town through stragglers until we imagined from the exaggeration that enough newly born children might be found to start a small orphan asylum the officers soon returned with the story reduced to one little stranger who had come safely into this world in the stormy night sheltered only by a tent no men were frozen fortunately though all had suffered the soldier detailed to take care of the general's horses found his way back with them and in his solemn voice told us that in spite of every effort sharing his blankets and holding the little things through the storm the thoroughbred puppies had frozen one by one there was one little box stove in camp which the officers brought back accompanied by its owner an old and somewhat infirm officer in the midst of all this excitement and the reaction from the danger i could not suppress my sense of the ludicrous when i saw the daintiest and most exquisite officer of ours whom last i remembered careering on his perfectly equipped and prancing steed before the admiring eyes of the memphis bells now wound up with scarves and impromptu leggings of flannel his hat tied down with a woolen comforter buffalo gloves on his hands and clasping a stovepipe necessary for the precious stove some of the officers had brought out parcels containing food while our brother colonel tom custer had struggled with a large basket of supplies in a short time another officer appeared at our door with a face full of anxiety about our welfare he did not tell us what we afterward learned from the others that fearing the citizens would give up going to us and knowing that he could not find the way alone over a country from which the snow had obliterated every landmark he had started to go the whole distance on the railroad coming to a long bridge he found the track so covered with ice that it was a dangerous footing the wind blew the sleet and snow in his face almost blinding him but nothing daunted he crawled over on his hands and knees and continued to use the track as his guide 
stopped when he thought he might be opposite our cabin and ploughed his way with difficulty through the drifts when the officers had returned to town we made a fire in the little stove which had been put upstairs as the pipe was so short we ensconced our visitor to whom the stove belonged nearby he was a capital fireman we divided our bedding with him and put it on the floor as close as possible to the fire the shawl and blanket partition separated our rooms but did not seem to deaden sound and at night i only lost consciousness of the audible sleeping of our guest after i had dropped the point of a finger in my ear he was the one among us who being the oldest of our circle and having had a varied experience was an authority on many subjects he had peculiar and extreme ideas on some questions we listened out of respect but we all drew the line at following some of his advice and over one topic there was general revolt he disbelieved entirely in the external or internal use of water and living as we did in countries where the rivers were flowing mud and the smaller streams dried up under the blazing sun his would have been a convenient system to say the least unfortunately our prejudices in favor of cleanliness increased with the scarcity of water bathing became one of the luxuries as well as one of the absolute necessities of life from being compelled to do with very little water we had learned almost to take a bath in a thimble and to this day i find myself pouring the water out of a pitcher in a most gingerly manner so strong is the power of habit even now with the generous rush of the unstinted croton at my disposal the theory of our venerable friend on the danger of bathing was fortified with many an earnest argument and the advantages of his improved system of dry rubbing were set out elaborately in his best rhetoric nevertheless taking a bath with the palm of the hand was combated to the last by his hearers when i had heard him arguing previously i had rather believed it to be the vagary of the hour i had proof to the contrary the next morning after the storm for i was awakened by a noise of vigorous friction and violent breathing as of someone laboring diligently i suddenly remembered the doctrine of our guest and realized that he was putting theory into practice as softly as i awakened my husband and tried to whisper to him he was on nettles instantly hearing the quiver of laughter in my voice he feared that i might be heard and that the feelings of the man for whom he had such regard might be wounded he promptly requested me to smother my laughter in the blankets and there i shook with merriment perhaps even greater because of the relief i experienced in finding something to counteract the gloom of the preceding hours and if i owned to telling afterward that the old officer's theory and practice were one it could not be called a great breach of hospitality for he gloried in what he called advanced ideas and strove to wear the martyr's crown that all pioneers in new and extreme beliefs crowd on their heads our friend remained with us until the camp was inhabitable and the regular order of military duties was resumed paths and roads were made through the snow and it was a great relief to be again in the scenes of busy life we did not soon forget our introduction to dakota after that we understood why the frontiersman builds his stable near the house we also comprehended then 
when they told us that they did not dare to cross in a blizzard from the house to the stable door without keeping hold of a rope tied fast to the latch as a guide for their safe return when the stock was fed afterward when even our cool-headed soldiers lost their way and wandered aimlessly near their quarters and when found were dazed in speech and look the remembrance of that first storm with the density of the downcoming snow was a solution to us of their bewilderment End of chapter 2 Chapter 3 of Boots and Saddles or Life in Dakota with General Custer by Elizabeth Custer This LibriVox recording is in the public domain Recording by Sue Anderson Chapter 3 Western Hospitality the citizens of Yankton, endeavoring to make up for the inhospitable reception the weather had given us, vied with one another in trying to make the regiment welcome. The hotel was filled with the families of the officers, and after the duties of the day were over in camp, the married men went into town. We were called upon, asked to dine, and finally tendered a ball. It was given in the public hall of the town, which, being decorated with flags and ornamented with all the military paraphernalia that could be used effectively, was really very attractive. We had left gas far behind us, and we had not the mellow, becoming light of wax candles. But those Western people were generous about lamps, as they are about everything else, and the hall was very bright. The ladies had many trials in endeavoring to make themselves presentable. We burrowed in the depths of trunks for those bits of finery that we had supposed would not be needed again for years. We knew the officers would do us credit. Through all the sudden changes of fashion which leave an army lady when she goes into the territories, quite an antediluvian in toilet after a few months, the officer can be entirely serene. He can be conscious that he looks his best in a perfectly fitting uniform, and that he is never out of date. The general and I went into the hotel and took a room for the night of the ball. Such good humor, confusion, and jolly preparations as we had, for the young officers came to borrow the corner of our glass to put on the finishing touches, carrying their neckties, studs, sleeve buttons, and gloves in their hands. The aigrettes had been taken from their helmets and placed across their broad chests, brightening still more their shining new uniforms. I remember with what pride the plebs called our attention to the double row of buttons which the change in the uniform now gave to all without regard to rank. The lieutenants had heretofore only been allowed one row of buttons, and they declared that even an Apollo could not do justice to his figure with a coat fastened in so monotonous and straight up and down a manner. Yankton, like all new towns, was chiefly settled with newly married people, who ornamented their bits of front yards with shining new perambulators. The mothers had little afternoon parades, proud enough to trundle their own babies. If anyone's father ever came from the States to a western town, we all felt at liberty to welcome his gray hairs. There were but few young girls, but that night must have been a memorable one for them all the town and even the country people came to the ball the mayor and common council received us and the governor opened the festivities we crossed to the hotel to our supper we were asked to sit down to the table and the abundance of substantials proved that our hosts did not expect us to nibble the general was of course taken possession of by the city fathers and mothers. 
finding among them a woman he knew i would appreciate he placed me beside her at supper i had but little time to eat for she was not only clever and brave but very interesting in her description of the dangers and hardships she had endured during the ten years of her pioneering the railroad had been completed but a short time and before that the life was wild enough she sat quietly among these people in her simple stuff gown honored and looked up to though not even elderly she was still almost the oldest citizen and an authority in the history of the country all classes and conditions came to the ball for yankton was not yet large enough to be divided into cliques besides the rough and hazardous life these people had shared endeared them to one another the days after this passed very rapidly the officers were already getting the command into condition to begin the long march of five hundred miles that lay before us before we left the general desiring to return some of the civilities of the citizens gave the governor and his staff a review the wide plain on which our camp was located was admirably adapted to the display of troops my heart swelled with pride to see our grand regiment all together once more and in such fine condition when the review was closing and that part came where the officers leave their companies and joining ride abreast to salute the commanding officer the general could hardly maintain the stereotyped motionless quiet of the soldier the approach of this fine body of men made him so proud of his command all were well mounted the two years station in the south had given them rare opportunities to purchase horses the general being considered an excellent judge had at the request of the officers bought several from the stables of his kentucky friends he told me that if a colt failed a quarter of a second in making certain time expected the owner was disappointed and willing to sell him at a merely nominal sum so it came about that even the lieutenants with their meager pay owned horses whose pedigree was unending there were three officers belonging to each of the twelve companies some were detailed on duty elsewhere but those remaining with the adjutant surgeon quartermaster and commissary made a long line of brilliantly caparisoned and magnificently formed men mounted on blood horses no wonder that the moment they saluted the general he jumped from the saddle to congratulate them and show them his pride in their soldierly appearance the governor and his staff were not chary in their expressions of admiration it was a great event in the lives of the citizens and the whole town was present every sort of vehicle used on the frontier came out filled to overflowing and many persons walked the music of the band the sun lighting up the polished steel of the arms and equipments and the hundreds of spirited horses going through the variety of evolutions which belong to a mounted regiment made a memorable scene for these isolated people besides they felt the sensation of possession when they knew that these troops had come to open the country and protect those more adventurous spirits who were already finding that a place into which the railroad ran was too far east for them one day we were all invited to take luncheon on board the steamer that had been chartered to take the regimental property up the river to bismarck the owner of the boat was very hospitable and champagne flowed freely as he proposed old-fashioned toasts the officers and ladies of the regiment received with pleasure all this politeness and since these occasions were rare in the lives of those of us who lived always on the outskirts of civilization we were reluctant to go home my horse had been sent away by some mistake 
and the general accepted the offer of the host to drive me out to camp he riding for a time beside the carriage and then with his usual restlessness giving rein to his horse for a brisk gallop it was not long before i discovered that the uncertain swaying of the vehicle from side to side and the hazardous manner in which we skirted the deep gullies was due to the fact that our friend was overcome with hospitality trying to talk intelligently and to appear not to notice the vagaries of the driver and at the same time to control my wandering eyes as they espied from afar a dangerous bit of road i spent a very uncomfortable hour fortunately the dear polly was most demure in harness and possibly having been left before that to find her way under similar circumstances she did not attempt to leap with the carriage over ditches as her gay owner invited her to do when we came up within shouting distance of the general i cried out in what i meant to seem like playful menace but he had taken in the situation and seeing that polly was to be trusted he mischievously laughed back at me and flew over the country finally we neared our little cabin and my last fear came upon me mary had spread the clothesline far and wide it was at the rear of the house but my escort saw no door and polly soon wound us hopelessly up in the line and two weeks washing while she quietly tried to kick her way through the packing boxes and wood piles mary and ham extricated me and started the old nag on the road homeward and i waved a relieved good-bye to the retreating carriage only such impossible wives as one reads of in sunday school books would have lost the opportunity for a few wrathful words i was not dangerous though and the peals of laughter from my husband as he described my wild eyes peering out from the side of the carriage soon put me into a good humour next day i was called to the steps and found that polly's owner had discovered that we had a door he said an offhand how do you and presented a peace offering adding my wife tells me that i was hardly in a condition to deliver a temperance lecture yesterday as what she says is always true i bring my apologies ham carried in the hamper and although i urged our guest to remain he did not seem quite at ease and drove away while we were at yankton something happened that filled us with wonder the indians from the reservation near brought in reports that came through other tribes of the modoc disasters it was a marvel to the general to find that at that distance north news would come to us through indian runners in advance of that we received by telegraph end of chapter three chapter four of boots and saddles or life in dakota with general custer by elizabeth custer this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by sue anderson chapter four cavalry on the march when the day came for us to begin our march the sun shone and the townspeople wished us luck with their good-bye the length of each day's march varied according to the streams on which we relied for water or on the arrival of the boat the steamer that carried the forage for the horses and the supplies for the command was tied up to the river bank each night as near to us as was possible the laundresses and ladies of the regiment were on board except the general's sister margaret who made her first march with her husband riding all the way on horseback as usual i rode beside the general our first few days were pleasant and we began at once to enjoy the plover 
the land was so covered with them that the hunters shot them with all sorts of arms we counted eighty birds in the gunny sack that three of the soldiers brought in fortunately there were several shotguns in the possession of our family and the little things therefore were not torn to pieces but could be broiled over the coals of the campfire they were so plump that their legs were like tiny points coming beneath the rounded outline that swept the grass as they walked no butter was needed in cooking them for they were very fat some of the officers had not left behind them all of their epicurean tastes and preferred to have the birds cooked when they were decidedly gamey in this way they secured the privilege of taking their odiferous luncheon quite apart from the others the general had invited two officers besides his brother tom and his brother-in-law mr calhoun to mess with him we had a table full and very merry we were even in the early morning to joke before daylight seems impossible but even at breakfast peals of laughter went up from the dining tent one of the officers was envied and we declared he got more to eat than the rest because he insisted upon carving the hash while to cut meat for all our hungry circle as the general did at the other end of the table took many precious moments one of our number called us the great grab mess and someone slyly printed the words in large black letters on the canvas that covered the luncheon hamper which was usually strapped on the back of our traveling carriage how gladly we gathered about that hamper when the command halted at noon how good the plover and sandwiches tasted while we quenched our thirst with cold coffee or tea since we were named as we were we all dared to reach over and help ourselves and the one most agile and with the longest arms was the best fed no great ceremony is to be expected when one rises before four and takes a hurried breakfast by the light of a tallow candle the soldiers waiting outside to take down the tent the servants hastily and suggestively rattling the kettles and gridiron as they packed them made it an irresistible temptation for one hungry to grab we had a very satisfactory little cook stove it began its career with legs but the wind used to lift it up from the ground with such violence it was finally dismembered and afterward placed flat on the ground being of sheet iron it cooled quickly was very light and could be put in the wagon in a few moments after the morning meal was cooked when we came out from breakfast the wagon stood near partly packed and bristling with kitchen utensils buckets and baskets tied outside the cover axe and spade lashed to the side while the little stove looked out from the end the mess chest stood open on the ground to receive the dishes we had used at a given signal the dining tent went down with all those along the line and they were stowed away in the wagons in an incredibly short time the wagon train then drew out and formed in order at the rear of the column at the bugle call boots and saddles each soldier mounted and took his place in line all riding two abreast first came the general and his staff with whom sister margaret and i were permitted to ride the private orderlies and headquarters detail rode in our rear and then came the companies according to the places assigned them for the day finally the wagon train with the rear guard we made a long drawn-out cavalcade that stretched over a great distance when we reached some high bluff we never tired of watching the command advancing with the long line of supply wagons under their white covers winding around bends in the road and climbing over the hills every day the breaking of camp went more smoothly and quickly until as the days advanced 
the general used to call me to his side to notice by his watch how few moments it took after the tents were ordered down to set the whole machinery for the march in motion and i remember the regiment grew so skillful in preparation that in one campaign the hour for starting never varied five minutes during the whole summer the column was always halted once during the day's march to water the horses then the luncheons were brought forth they varied decidedly sometimes an officer took from his pocket a hard biscuit wrapped in his handkerchief the faithful orderly of another took his chief's sandwiches from a haversack and brought them to him wherever he was often a provident officer as he seated himself to his little spread on the grass was instantly surrounded by interested visitors who heedless ever of any future believed that the world owed them a living and they were resolved to have it when the stream was narrow and the hundreds of horses had to be ranged along its banks to be watered there was time for a nap i soon acquired the general's habit of sleeping readily he would throw himself down anywhere and fall asleep instantly even with the sun beating on his head it only takes a little training to learn to sleep without a pillow on uneven ground and without shade i learned the moment i was helped out of the saddle to drop upon the grass and lose myself in a twinkling no one knows what a privilege it is to be stretched out after being cramped over the horn of a lady's saddle for hours until she has experienced it i think i never quite got over wishing for the shade of a tree but there was often a little strip of shadow on one side of the travelling wagon which was always near us on the journey i was not above selfishly appropriating the space under the wagon if it had not been taken by somebody else even then i had to dislodge a whole collection of dogs who soon find the best places for their comfort we had a citizen guide with us who having been long in the country knew the streams and the general and i following his instructions often rode in advance as we neared the night's camp it was always a mild excitement and new pleasure to select camp the men who carried the guidons for each company were sent for and places assigned them the general delighted to unsaddle his favorite horse dandy and turn him loose for his attachment was so strong he never grazed far from us he was not even tethered and after giving himself the luxury of a roll in the grass he ate his dinner of oats and browsed about the tent as tame as a kitten he whinnied when my husband patted his sleek neck and looked jealously at the dogs when they all followed us into the tent afterwards after tramping down the grass to prevent the fire from spreading my husband would carry dry sticks and underbrush and place them against a fallen tree that made an admirable backlog and in a little while we had a glorious fire the general having a peculiar gift of starting a flame on the wildest day the next thing was to throw himself down on the sod cover his eyes with his white felt hat and be sound asleep in no time no matter if the sun beat down in a perfect blaze it never disturbed him the dogs came at once to be beside him i have seen them stretched at his back and curled around his head while the nose and paws of one rested on his breast and yet he was quite unconscious of their crowding they growled and scrambled for the best place but he slept placidly through it all when the command arrived the guidons pointed out the location for each company the horses were unsaddled and picketed out the wagons unloaded and the tents pitched the hewing of wood and the hauling of water came next 
and after the cook fires were lighted the air was full of savory odors of the soldiers dinner sometimes the ground admitted of pitching the tents of the whole regiment in two long lines facing each other the wagons were drawn up at either end and also at the rear of the two rows of tents they were placed diagonally one end overlapping the other so as to form a barricade against the attack of indians down the center of the company street large ropes were stretched to which the horses were tied at night our tents were usually a little apart from the rest at one end of the company street and it never grew to be an old story to watch the camp before us after i had changed my riding habit for my one other gown i came out to join the general under the tent fly where he lay alternately watching the scene and reading one of the well-thumbed books that he was never without i always had sewing either a bit of needlework that was destined to make our garrison quarters more attractive or more often some necessary stitches to take in our hard-worn clothes as we sat there it would have been difficult for a stranger seeing us to believe that it was merely the home of a day our camps along the river were much alike and each day when we entered the tent our few things were placed exactly as they were the day before the only articles of furniture we had with us were two folding chairs a bed a wash bowl with bucket and tin dipper and a little mirror this last fastened to the tent pole swayed to and fro with the never-ceasing wind and made it a superfluous luxury for we learned to dress without it the camp chairs were a great comfort they were made by a soldier out of oak with leather back seat and arms the latter so arranged with straps and buckles that one could recline or sit upright at will i once made a long march and only took a camp stool for a seat i knew therefore what an untold blessing it was to have a chair in which to lean after having been sitting in the saddle for hours we had tried many inventions for cot beds that folded but nothing stood the wear and tear of travel like the simple contrivance of two carpenters horses placed at the right distance apart with three boards laid upon them such a bed was most easily transported for the supports could be tied to the outside of the wagon while the boards slipped inside before the rest of the camp equipage was packed an ineffaceable picture remains with me even now of those lovely camps as we dreamily watched them by the fading light of the afternoon the general and i used to think there was no bit of color equal to the delicate blue line of smoke which rose from the campfire where the soldiers suppers were being cooked the effect of light and shade and the varying tints of that perfect sky were a great delight to him the mellow air brought us sounds that had become dear by long and happy association the low notes of the bugle in the hands of the musician practicing the calls the click of the curry comb as the soldiers groomed their horses the whistle or song of a happy trooper and even the irrepressible accordion at that distance made a melody it used to amuse us to find with what persistent ingenuity the soldiers smuggled that melancholy instrument no matter how limited the transportation after a few days march it was brought out from a roll of blankets or the teamster who had been bribed to keep it under the seat produced the prized possession the bay of the hounds was always music to the general the bray of the mules could not be included under that head but it was one of those sounds from home to which we had become attached mingling with the melodies of the negro servants as they swung the blacking brushes at the rear of the tents were the buoyant voices of the officers lying under the tent flies 
smoking their consoling pipes. The twilight almost always found many of us gathered together, some idling on the grass in front of the campfire or lounging on the buffalo robes. The one with the best voice sang, while all joined in the chorus. We all had much patience in listening to what must necessarily be twice told tales for it would have taken the author of the arabian nights to supply fresh anecdotes for people who had been so many years together these stories usually varied somewhat from time to time and the more munchausen like they became the more attentive was the audience the territories are settled by people who live an intense exaggerated sort of existence and nothing tame attracts them in order to compel a listener i myself fell into the habit of adding a cipher or two to stories that had been first told in the states with moderate numbers if the family overheard me their unquenchable spirit of mischief invariably put a quietus on my eloquence in fact i was soon cured of temptation to amplify by the repeated asides of my deriding family. Oh, I say, old lady, won't you come down a hundred or two? Sometimes, when we were all gathered together at evening, we improved the privilege which belongs to long-established friendships of keeping silent. The men yielded to the soporific influence of tobacco in quiet content, knowing that nothing was expected of them if they chose not to talk my husband and i sometimes strolled through the camp at twilight and even went among the citizen teamsters that were employed for the march when they were preparing their evening meal these teamsters mess together on the march as the officers do with rarely more than four or five in the circle one of the number buys the supplies takes charge of the rations and keeps the accounts the sum of expenses is divided at the end of the month, and each pays his portion. They take turns in doing the cooking, which is necessarily simple, so that each can bear a share of the labor. Sometimes we found a more ambitious member of the mess endeavoring to rise superior to the tiresome hardtack. He had bared his brawny arms and was mixing biscuit on the tailboard of the wagon let down for the purpose he whistled away as he molded the dough with his horny hands and it would have seemed that he had a delmonico supper to anticipate we had not left yankton far behind us before we were surprised to see one of its most hospitable citizens drive up he acknowledged that he had missed us and described the tameness of life after the departure of the cavalry as something quite past endurance we were so stupid as not to discover until after he had said the second good-bye that he really wanted to join us on the march still had he kept on i am sure his endurance would have been tested for while i do not remember ever to have been discouraged before in all our campaigning i was so during the storm that followed the weather suddenly changed, and we began our march with a dull, gray morning and stinging cold. The general wound me up in all the outside wraps I had, until I was a shapeless mass of fur and wool as I sat in the saddle. We could talk but little to each other, for the wind cut our faces and stiffened the flesh until it ached. My hands became too numb to hold my horse, so I gave him his own way. As we rode along like automatons, I was keeping my spirits up with the thought of the camp we would make in the underbrush of a sheltered valley by some stream, and the coming campfire rose brightly in my imagination. We went slowly, as the usual time a cavalry command makes is barely four miles an hour it was a discouraging spot where we finally halted it was on a stream but the ice was thick along the edges 
and all we could see was the opposite bank, about thirty feet high, so frozen over that it looked like a wall of solid ice. It was difficult to pitch the tent, for the wind twisted and tore the canvas. The ground was already so frozen that it took a long time to drive in the iron pins by which the ropes holding the tents were secured. All the tying and pinning of the opening was of little avail, for the wind twisted off the tapes and flung the great brass pins I had brought on purpose for canvas far and wide. No campfire would burn, of course, in such a gale, but I remembered, thankfully, the Sibley stove that we always carried. The saddler had cut a hole in the roof of the tent for the pole, and fastened zinc around it to make it safe from the fire. I shall never think about a Sibley stove without gratitude, nor cease to wonder how so simple an invention can be the means of such comfort. It is only a cone of sheet iron, open at the top and bottom. The broader part rests on the ground, while the little pipe fits on the top. The wood is put through a door cut in the side. Only billets can be used, for the aperture is, of course, small. It requires almost constant attention to keep the insatiable little thing filled. But it never occurs to one, where half a dozen are huddled together, to ask who shall be the fireman, and there is equal division of labor. The stove is so light that, in marching, the pipe is removed and a rope run through the openings, which enables it to be tied underneath the wagon, beside the bucket which is always suspended there to be used to water the horses. The general was busy in the adjutant's tent, so I sent for the sergeant, who was our factotum, and asked him to hunt up the Sibley stove. I felt disheartened when he told me it had been forgotten. It was afterward recovered. I could have gone to the next tent where a provident officer had put his up, but I felt in too disagreeable a humor to inflict myself on anyone, and so crept into bed to keep warm. It was an unmistakable fit of sulks, and I was in the valley of humiliation next morning for I knew well how difficult it is to have ladies on the march, and how many obstacles the general had surmounted to arrange for my coming. My part consisted in drilling myself to be as little trouble as I could. I had really learned by many a self-inflicted lesson never to be too cold or too hot, and rarely allowed a thought of hunger if we were where no supplies could be had. It was a long struggle, but I finally learned never to drink between meals, as it is always difficult to get water on a march. I can remember being even mortified at dropping my whip, for I wished to be so little trouble that everyone would be unconscious of my presence so far as being an inconvenience was concerned. The cold of Dakota overcame me on that one day, but it was the last time I succumbed to it. End of chapter 4「Chapter 5 of Boots and Saddles – or – Life in Dakota with General Custer by Elizabeth Custer. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Sue Anderson. Chapter 5 Camping Among the Sioux. Our march took us through the grounds set apart by the government for the use of the Sioux Indians at peace with our country. We had not made much progress before we began to see their graves. They do not bury their dead, but place them on boards lashed to the limbs of trees or on platforms raised from the ground by four poles, perhaps twenty feet high. The body is wound round and round with clothing or blankets, like a mummy. 
and inside the layers are placed firearms, tobacco, and jerk beef, to supply them on the imaginary journey to the happy hunting grounds. In the early morning, when it was not quite light, as we filed by these solitary sepulchres, it was uncanny and weird, and the sun, when it came, was doubly welcome. Our first visitor from agency Indians was Fool Dog, a Sioux chief. He was tall, commanding, and had really a fine face. When he was ready to go home, he invited us to come to his village before we left on our next march. At twilight, my husband and I walked over. The village was a collection of teepees of all sizes, the largest being what is called the Medicine Lodge, where the councils are held. It was formed of tanned buffalo hides sewed together with buckskin thongs and stretched over a collection of thirty-six poles. These poles are of great value to the Indians, for in a sparsely timbered country like Dakota, it is difficult to find suitable trees. It is necessary to go a great distance to procure the kind of sapling that is light and pliable and yet sufficiently strong for the purpose. The poles are lashed together at the tops and radiate in a circle below. The smoke was pouring out of the opening above, and the only entrance to the teepee was a round aperture near the ground, sufficiently large to allow a person to crawl in. Around the lodge were poles from which were suspended rags. In these were tied their medicines of roots and herbs, supposed to be a charm to keep off evil spirits. The sound of music came from within. I crept trembling in after the general, not entirely quieted by his keeping my hand in his and whispering something to calm my fears as I sat on the buffalo robe beside him. In the first place, I knew how resolute the Indians were in never admitting one of their own women to counsel, and their curious eyes and forbidding expressions toward me did not add to my comfort. The dust, smoke, and noise in the fading light were not reassuring. Fool Dog arose from the circle of what composed their nobility, and solemnly shook hands with the general. Those next in rank followed his example. The pipe was then smoked, and the general had to take a whiff when it came his turn. Fortunately, we escaped the speeches, for we had not brought an interpreter. Coming out of the light into this semi-darkness with the grotesque figures of the plebeians, as they danced around their chiefs and contorted their bodies to the sound of the Indian drum and minor notes of the singers, there was something unearthly in appearance. Their painted faces, grunts and grins of serious mirth as they wheeled around the teepee, made me shiver. How relieved I felt when the final pipe was smoked and the goodbye said. The curious eyes of the squaws who stood in the vicinity of the lodge followed us as they watched me clinging to the general's arm while we disappeared in the direction of camp through the thickening gloom. As we went further north, the twilights became longer, and I was greatly deceived by having so much daylight. Every morning when the reveille sounded, in attempting to obey its summons, I found myself actually mystified from the excessive drowsiness, and I announced my resolve to go to bed at dark, as was often my custom on previous marches, when I was informed that we had marched into a land where daylight continues into the night hours. The general, who was always looking at the curious effects in the heavens, delighted in the clearness of the atmosphere, and the myriads of stars that seemed to far outnumber all we had ever seen in other skies. All the strange phenomena of northern climes revealed themselves to us day by day. The sun and moon dogs, the lunar rainbows, and sometimes three perfect arcs of brilliant color formed directly above us in the heavens as we made our day's march through spring showers. 
the storms came down in great belts of rain sometimes and if the country were level enough we could look ahead on the plain and see where the storm was crossing this enabled us to halt in time to escape a perfect sheet of pouring rain which fell like a wall of water directly before us once we found ourselves in the midst of it and not knowing then the peculiarities of such storms we took our drenching philosophically and believed that it was like too many others that had kept us soaked to the skin for hours seeing the sun shining in advance on the plain the general and i put spurs to our horses and rode out of the storm to perfectly dry ground the sun came down on us so hotly that we were soon enveloped in a halo of steam from our drying clothes the history of one day's march was that of many they were varied by small misfortunes over which we amused ourselves but which were very serious affairs to the melancholy ham he had cooked by fireplaces in kentucky but never having lived outdoors before he gained his experience by hard trials the little sheet iron cooking stove which we considered such a treasure was placed in the kitchen tent on stormy nights and the bit of pipe put through a hole in the canvas had an elbow so that it could be turned according to the direction of the wind one day after camp was established the general saw the smoke pouring out of the opening of the kitchen tent and hurried to see what was the matter it was one of those days when the dakota winds like those of kansas blow in all directions poor ham was barely visible in the dense smoke inside the tent why don't you turn the pipe the general called above the tempest and ham shouted back general i did see whar she's pointin now his master's side shook with laughter for sure enough the pipe would have been right if there had been any uniformity in the course of the wind the general was hungry but he did not stop to complain he found a place somewhat sheltered and digging a hole in the ground taught the discouraged darky how to build a fire outside at last we sat down to a burned smoky meal and had to go to bed hungry another day when there was a small tornado we began to wonder why dinner was delayed we looked out to find the cook tent blown flat to the ground the general ran to the rescue and found ham interred as the old-time child stories buried their heroes in a pot of grease he had been thrown among skillets and kettles and the half-cooked dinner was scattered over him the general helped him out and was too much exhausted with laughter over the old fellow's exasperated remarks about such a low-down country to mind the delay of the dinner indeed he soothed him by telling him to wait and begin again when the wind went down as it usually does when the sun sets one day we caught sight of our american flag on the other side of the river floating over a little group of buildings inside a stockade when they told me that it was a military post i could hardly believe it possible it seemed that no spot could be more utterly desolate then i remembered having met an officer at yankton who had told me that was his station as i looked at his fine face and figure i could not help thinking how thoroughly some woman would appreciate him thinking aloud i said that i hoped he had improved each shining hour of his leave of absence and was already engaged he replied that i would see his post as we went up the river and then might comprehend why he did not dare ask any woman to be his wife i argued that if some girl grew fond of him it would little matter to her where she went if it were only by her husband's side 
I confess, however, that when I saw that lonely place, I thought that it would require extraordinary devotion to follow him there. It was an infantry station, and the soldiers' barracks, officers' quarters, and storehouses were huddled together inside a wall made of logs placed perpendicularly and about fifteen feet high. The sand was so deep about this spot that nothing could be made to grow. Constant gusts of wind over the unprotected plain kept little clouds of fine alkaline dust whirling in the air and filling the eyes and mouth. Not a tree was near, as the Missouri, the most uncertain of rivers, kept constantly changing its channel and the advancing water washed away great hollows in the banks. The post would then have to be moved further back for safety. The soldiers would be obliged to take up the stockade and bury the logs as deep as they could to keep them from blowing over. The frail buildings built upon the sand rocked and swayed in the wind. Besides the forlorn situation of this garrison, no one could go outside to ride or hunt without peril. The warlike Indians considered that side of the river theirs, and roamed up and down it at will. They came incessantly to the small sliding panel in the gates of the stockade, and made demands, which, if not consented to, were followed by howls of rage and threatening gestures. All that the handful of men could do was to conciliate them as best they could. The company was not full, and possibly, all told, there were but fifty white men against hundreds of Indians. The only variety in their lives was the passing of an occasional steamer in the brief summer. Then settled down the pitiless winter, burying them in snow which never left the ground, until late in the spring. The mail only reached them at irregular intervals. They were compelled to live almost entirely on commissary stores, for even though they lived in the midst of game, it was too hazardous to attempt to hunt. When we found that one regiment had been seven years on the river, and some of the officers had never taken leave of absence, it seems strange that any one stationed at such a post had not gone stark mad. It makes me proud of women when I recall the fact that the wife of an officer did live in that wretched little post afterward and did not complain. The cavalry, turning to look their last at that garrison, thanked the good fortune that had placed them in a branch of the service where there was the active duty of campaigns to vary a life otherwise so monotonous. The dogs had almost as hard a time to become accustomed to the vagaries of a Dakota climate as we did. We had to be their nurses and surgeons. In our large pack of hounds there were many that had marked individuality of character. Not many days could be passed in their company before we were noting new peculiarities not previously observed. The general had a droll fashion, as we rode along, of putting words into their mouths when they got into trouble, fought among themselves, or tried to lord it over one another. One of them had been given us, and had been called by her former owner, Lucy Stone. In vain did we try, out of respect for the life of the useful woman for whom she was named, to rechristen the dog. She would neither listen nor obey, if called anything else. I can see her now, sitting deliberately down in the road directly in front of us, holding up a paw full of cactus thorns. The general would say, There sits Lucy Stone and she is saying, If you please, sir, since you choose to bring me into a land of bristling earth like this, 
will you please get down immediately and attend to my foot her howls and upturned eyes meant an appeal certainly and her master would leap to the ground sit down in the road and taking the old creature in his arms begin with surgery he carried one of those knives that had many adjuncts and with the tweezers he worked tenderly and long to extract the tormenting cactus needles lucy was a complaining old dame and when the general saw her sit down like some fat old woman he used to say that the old madam was telling him that she would like to drive a bit if you please so it often happened that my travelling wagon was the hospital for an ill or footsore dog the general had to stop very often to attend to the wounded paws but experience taught the dogs to make their way very skillfully where the cactus grew a dancing master tripping the steps of instruction could not have moved more lightly than they did if there were no one near to whom they could appeal in the human way those dumb things have they learned to draw out the offending thorns with their teeth while we were all getting accustomed to the new climate it was of no use to try to keep the dogs out of the tent they stood around and eyed me with such reproachful looks if i attempted to tie up the entrance to the tent and leave them out if it were very cold when i returned from the dining tent i found dogs under and on the camp bed and so thickly scattered over the floor that i had to step carefully over them to avoid hurting feet or tails if i secured a place in the bed i was fortunate sometimes when it had rained and all of them were wet i rebelled the steam from their shaggy coats was stifling but the general begged so hard for them that i taught myself to endure the air at last i never questioned the right of the half-grown puppies to everything our struggles to raise them and to avoid the distemper which goes so much harder with blooded than with cur dogs endeared them to us when i let the little ones in it was really comical to hear my husband's arguments and cunningly devised reasons why the older dogs should follow a plea was put up for the hound that had the fits there was always another that had been hurt in hunting and so on until the tent would hold no more fortunately in pleasant weather i was let off with only the ill or injured ones for perpetual companions we were so surrounded with dogs when they were resting after the march and they slept so soundly from fatigue that it was difficult to walk without stepping on them my favorite a great cream-colored stag hound was named cardigan he never gave up trying to be my lap-dog he was enormous and yet seemingly unconscious of his size he kept up a perpetual struggle and scramble on his hind legs to get his whole body up on my lap if i pieced myself out with a camp-stool to support him he closed his eyes in a beatific state and sighed in content while i held him until my foot went to sleep and i was cramped with his weight one thing that made me so fond of him was that on one occasion when he was put in the kennel after an absence he was almost torn to pieces by the other dogs he was a brave hound but he was at fearful odds against so many great slices of flesh were torn from his sides and gaping wounds made by the fang-like teeth showed through his shaggy coat it was many months before they healed although the stag hound is gentle with human beings he is a terrible fighter they stand on their hind legs and facing each other claw and tear like demons it was always necessary to watch them closely when a new dog or one that they had not seen for some time was put in their midst 
I will anticipate a moment and speak to the final fate of Cardigan. When I left Fort Lincoln, I asked someone to look out for his welfare and send him as soon as possible to a clergyman who had been my husband's friend. My request was complied with, and afterward, when the poor old dog died, his new master honored him by having his body set up by the taxidermist, and a place was given him in one of the public buildings in Minneapolis. I cannot help thinking that he was worthy of the tribute, not only because of the testimony thus given to the friendship of the people for his master, but because he was the bravest and most faithful of animals. Most of the country passed over in our route belonged to the Indian reservations, and the government was endeavoring to teach the tribes settled there to cultivate the soil. They had hunted off most of the game, an occasional jackrabbit, the plover, and a few wild ducks were all that were left. I must not forget the maddening curlew. It was not good eating, but it was always exciting to see one. There never was a more exasperating bird to shoot. Time and again a successful shot was prophesied, and I was called to be a witness, only to see, finally, the surprise of the general when the wily bird soared calmly away. I believe no person was able to bring one down during the entire trip. As we approached an Indian village, the chiefs came out to receive us. There were many high-sounding words of welcome, translated by our guide, who, having lived among them many years, knew the different dialects. The government had built some comfortable log houses for them, in many of which I would have lived gladly. The Indians did not care for them, complaining that they had coughs if they occupied a house. A teepee was put up alongside, in which one or two families lived, while the little low lodges, looking like the soldiers' shelter tents, were used for the young men of the circle to sleep in. The tools and stores given by the government were packed away in the otherwise empty houses. End of chapter 5 Chapter 6 of Boots and Saddles or Life in Dakota with General Custer by Elizabeth Custer This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Sue Anderson Chapter 6 A Visit to the Village of Two Bears A Sioux chief called Two Bears had the most picturesque village that we saw. The lodges were placed in a circle, as this was judged the most defensive position. The ponies were herded inside the enclosure at night. This precaution was necessary, for the neighboring tribes swept down on them after dark and ran off the stock if they were not secured. As we dismounted, we saw an old man standing alone in the circle, apparently unconscious of everything, as he recounted some war tale in loud, monotonous tones. He had no listeners. All were intently watching the approaching regiment. Still, the venerable Sioux went on as persistently as if he were looking upon a sea of upturned faces. He was the medicine man, or oracle of the tribe, or possibly the poet laureate of the village. For the guide told us he sang of the deeds of valor of his people far back in history. Just outside the village, the chiefs sat in a circle awaiting us. Two bears arose to welcome the general and asked him to go with him to his lodge. I was asked to go also and be presented to Miss Two Bears, for the guide afterward explained that she was too royal in birth to be permitted outside and it was not in keeping with the dignity of her rank to mingle with the others. The honor of going alone into the teepee was one that I could have foregone, 
for my courage was much greater if I did my Indian sightseeing surrounded by the regiment. The general, fearing that their amour propre might be offended if I declined the invitation, whispered an encouraging word, and we dipped our heads and crept into the teepee. The chief was a dignified old man, wrapped in his blanket, without the usual addition of some portion of citizen's dress, which the Indians believe adds to their grandeur. His daughter also was in complete squaw's costume. Her feet were moccasined, her legs and ankles wound round with beaded leggings, and she had on the one buckskin garment which never varies in cut throughout all the tribes. A blanket drawn over her head was belted at her waist. To crown all this, however, she had an open parasol, brought to her, doubtless, as a present by some Indian returning from a council at Washington. She held it with dignity, as if it might be to her as much an insignia of state as the mace of a Lord Mayor. Fortunately, they did not ask us to sit down and partake of jerked beef, or to smoke the never-ending pipe, so we soon got through our compliments and returned to the outer entrance of the village. Here the tribe was assembled, and evidently attired in gala dress in our honor. We were most interested in the village belle, and the placid manner in which she permitted us to walk around her, gazing and talking over her good points, showed that she expected homage. She sat on a scarlet blanket spread on the ground, and over her, stretched from poles, was another for an awning. She was loaded with ornaments, row after row of beads around her neck, broad armlets and anklets of brass, pinchbeck rings, and a soft buckskin dress and leggings, heavily embroidered. Her ears were pierced twice, on the side as well as on the lobe, and from these holes were suspended circles of gilt. Her bright eyes, the satin smoothness of her hair, and the clear brown of the skin made a pretty picture. There was no attempt to blend into the brown the bright patch of carmen on each cheek. Only extreme youth and its ever-attractive charms can make one forget the heavy, square shape of Indian faces and their coarse features. It was surprising to see all the other squaws giving up the field to this one so completely. They crouched near, with a sort of every dog must have its day look, and did not even dispute her sway by making coy eyes as we spoke to them. There were but few young men. Their absence was always excused by the same reason. They were out hunting. We knew how little game there was, and surmised, what we afterward found to be true, that they had joined the hostile tribes, and only came in to the distribution of supplies and presents in the fall. A few rods from the village a tripod of poles was set in the ground, and lashed to it the Indian's shield, made of the hide of the buffalo where it is thickest around the neck. There were rude paintings and Indian hieroglyphics covering it. The shield is an heirloom with the Indian, and the one selected to hang out in this manner has always the greatest war record. One of their superstitions is that it keeps away enemies. These nomads had some idea of luxury, for I recollect seeing some of them reclining on a kind of rest made of a framework of pliable rods over which was stretched buckskin. Afterward I found how comfortable such contrivances were, for one was given me. The slope is so gradual that you half recline and can read with great ease. When we had reached camp and were taking our afternoon siesta the same day, with the tent walls raised for air, we were roused by the sound of music. Looking off over the bluffs, we saw a large body of Indians approaching on ponies, while squaws and children ran beside them. It was the prompt response of two bears to the general's invitation to return his call. 
the warriors stopped near camp and dismounting advanced toward us the squaws unbridled and picketed the ponies and made themselves comfortable by arranging impromptu shades of the bright blankets they staked down two corners closely to the ground and propped up the others with poles stuck in the sod when the indians came up to us the council was as usual begun the pipe being smoked two bears gave us a eulogy of himself he then demanded on behalf of the tribe payment for the use of the ground on which we were encamped and also for the grass consumed even though it was too short to get more than an occasional tuft he ended as they all do with a request for food the general in reply vaguely referred them to the great father in payment for the use of their land but presented them with a beef in return for their hospitality only half satisfied they stalked away one by one we watched them at a distance kill and divide the beef it surprised us to see how they dispatched it and that hardly a vestige of it was left many of the indians coming from reservations carried papers which they valued and carefully guarded after burrowing under robe and shirt they would produce something wrapped in layers of soiled cotton cloth it was a recommendation of them obtained from some officer or indian agent this was presented on entering as their letter of introduction most of these papers read very much the same way giving the indian's name it stated that he had been living on the reservation for a certain length of time that he was friendly to the whites etc one of our guests that day carried something a little different he was called medicine joe lingering behind the rest he presented his letter with perfect good faith and great pomposity some wag had composed it and it read something like this medicine joe says he is a good indian that you can trust him if he is he is the first i have ever seen and in my opinion he like all the rest will bear watching it was all the general could do to keep his face straight as he handed back to the unconscious owner this little libel on himself the interpreter kept constantly before us the fine post that we were approaching and the last day before we reached there it was visible for a long distance the atmosphere of dakota was so deceptive that we imagined ourselves within a few miles of the garrison when in reality there was a march of twenty-nine long miles before us our road led up from the river valley on the high bluffs and sometimes followed along the backbone of hills from which on either side we looked down a great distance there was barely room for the traveling wagon occasionally i had been obliged to take refuge from the cold for a little while and drive our lead mules were tiny quick-moving little dots and i soon discovered that they were completely demoralized at the sight of an indian they could see one in advance long before the driver could a sudden shying and quick turning of these agile little brutes a general tangle of themselves in the harness and legs of the wheelers loud shouts of the driver and a quick downfall of his foot on the brake to keep us from overturning made an exciting melee nothing could get them righted and started again they would have to be unharnessed and the rebellious pair tied to the rear of the wagon until we had gone far beyond the object of terror part of the day that we were following the wanderings of the road alongside hills and over the narrow smooth level of the hilltops i was compelled to drive and i watched anxiously the ears of these wretched little beasts to see if they expressed any sentiment of fright we came to such steep descents that the brake holding the wheels seemed of no use looking down from the wagon on to the mules below us 
we appeared to be in the position of flies on a wall. As we came to one descent, more awful than the rest, the general, who was always near, rode up to the carriage and told me not to be afraid, for he would order the wheels manned. The headquarters escort of over one hundred men dismounted, attached ropes to the wheels, and held on with all their strength while I went down the steepest declivity I had ever descended. After that I begged to get out, and the general carried me to a bank and set me down where I could watch the repairing of the road. He took off his coat and joined the soldiers in carrying logs and shoveling earth, for they were obliged to fill up the soft bed of the stream before the command could cross. It took a long time and much patience, but the general enjoyed it all and often helped when the crossings needed to be prepared. When the logs were all laid, I had to laugh at the energy he showed in cracking a whip he borrowed from a teamster and shouting to the mules to urge them to pull through where there was danger of their stalling. When the road was completed, I was ready to mount my horse, for it seemed to me preferable to die from accident surrounded with friends than to expire alone in the mule wagon. The ascent was rendered so wet and slippery that the general feared my saddle would turn, and I was once more shut in by myself. The soldiers again manned the wheels to prevent the carriages sliding back, the mules scrambled, and with the aid of language prepared expressly for them, we reached the summit. The driver had named the lead mules Betty and Jane, and when they were over their tempers he petted and caressed them. But their repeated rebellion at last wore out even his patience. One morning I noticed new leaders, but the imperturbable face of the driver gave no hint of his successful plotting. Mary told me, however, that he was worn out with his struggles and had gone after dark into the herd of mules with Betty and Jane, and, as he expressed it, lost them. He selected two more from among those belonging to the wagon train, and returned triumphant over his premeditated exchange. He carefully reclipped their manes and tails, and disguised them still further with blotches of black paint to give them a mottled appearance. When the other teamster prepared to harness in the morning, of course he discovered the fraud perpetrated on him. There was no redress then, and he had to take out his wrath in language more forcible than elegant, which the teamsters have adapted expressly for extreme occasions. Our driver told Mary, with a chuckle, that with a command of many hundred men waiting for a teamster to harness, he found no time for swapping horses. Berkman, the soldier who took care of our horses, was a middle-aged man, so deliberate in speech and slow in his movements, he seemed as incongruous among the spirited cavalrymen as would be an old-time farmer. Early in the march I had heard him coughing as he groomed the horses. When I asked if he had done anything for his cold, he replied, bottle after bottle of stuff, mum, but it don't do no good. So I begged the surgeon to look more carefully into his case. He made an examination and told me, as the result, that the man must have only light work and nourishing food. After that, I asked Mary to save everything for Berkman and make his recovery her especial care. The officers made fun of me, as they were rather incredulous, and thought a bit of shamming was being practiced on me. But I knew better. They never failed to comment and smile when they saw the old defender of his country coming out of the kitchen tent, his jaws working and his mouth full, while he carried all the food his hands would hold. To tell the truth, he kept up this prescription of nourishing food long after he had quite recovered. 
it became the delight of my husband and the officers to chafe me about old nutriment for such was the sobriquet they gave him at last even mary began to narrate how he swept everything before him with voracious convalescing appetite why miss libby she said to me one day i thought i'd try him with a can of raw tomatoes and set them before him asking if he was fond of them and he just drawled out always was and the tomatoes were gone in no time his laconic answer passed into a proverb with us all when invited to partake of anything we liked such a tender heart as that old soldier had i had noticed this first in kentucky my horse which i prized above all that i have ever ridden died during my temporary absence from home i was too greatly grieved to ask many questions about him but one day some time afterward when we were riding through a charming bit of country berkman approached me from the place where he usually rode behind us and said i'd like to tell mrs custer there's where poor phil lies i picked the prettiest place i could find for him and he had indeed for the green valley under wide-spreading trees would have gone far to reconcile many a weary human heart to be placed under the sod we thought we had made the first step toward savage life when berkman brought the mother of the one baby of our regiment the dried vertebra of a rattlesnake that he killed because he had heard that it was the best of anything on which the infant could cut its teeth i had made some scarlet flannel shirts for my husband's use on the summer campaign and he was as much pleased as possible beginning at once to wear them not many days march proved to me what an error i had made the bright red color could be seen for miles when the form itself was almost lost on the horizon i had to coax to get them away again and replace them with the dark blue that he usually wore although i triumphed i was met with a perfect fusillade of teasing when i presented the red shirts to berkman the officers of course hearing all the discussion over the subject as no trifle was too small to interest us in one another's affairs attacked me at once if i had been so anxious to protect the general from wearing anything that would attract the far-seeing eye of the vigilant indian on the coming campaign why should i be so willing to sacrifice the life of old nutriment they made no impression on me however for they knew as well as i did that the soldier although so faithful was not made of that stuff that seeks to lead a balaclava charge my husband and i were so attached to him and appreciated so deeply his fidelity we could not thank the good fortune enough that gave us one so loyal to our interests before we reached the post we were approaching the commandant sent out ice for our use and the dispatches of the associated press the general was greatly delighted to get news of events that had occurred all over the world in this far distant land we found afterward that the officers joined in paying for the dispatches the indians had such a superstition about molesting the wires that the lines ran through even the most dangerous country i can hardly say how good it seemed to us to see a telegraph pole again we were not surprised after seeing the other posts below on the river that the guide had praised fort sully it was the headquarters of one of the infantry regiments and the commanding officer had been at the post long enough to put it in excellent order it was situated on an open plateau from which there was an extensive view below in the valley the companies had gardens and they also kept cows pigs and chickens we looked upon this as an el dorado 
and the thought of remaining long enough at one fort to get any good out of a garden was simply unknown in our vagrant existence. Our camp was very near the post, on the same open plain, without trees or shelter. We were received with genuine hospitality, and finally all of us were invited to luncheon. The ladies came up from the steamer, and the large house was filled with happy people. The post band played outside on the parade ground while we lunched. We had nine kinds of game on the table. Some of it was new to us, the beaver tail, for instance, but it was so like pork and so fat I could only taste it. We had, in addition, antelope, elk, buffalo tongue, wild turkey, black-tailed deer, wild goose, plover, and duck. The goose was a sort of fatted calf for us. The soldiers had caught it while young, and by constantly clipping its wings had kept it from joining the flocks which its cries often brought circling around the post. At last it began to make the life of the chickens a burden to them, and we arrived in time to enjoy the delicious bird served with jelly made from the tart wild bullberries that grew near the river. The homemade bread, delightful cake, tender ham of the garrison's own curing, and the sweets made with cream, fresh butter, and eggs, three unheard of luxuries with us, proved that it is possible for army people to live in comfort if they do not belong to a mounted regiment. Still, even though they had a band and a good library belonging to the regiment, the thought of being walled in with snow and completely isolated for eight months of the year made me shudder. The post was midway between Yankton and Bismarck, each the termination of a railroad, and each two hundred and fifty miles away. The wife of the commanding officer was known throughout the department for her lovely Christian character and the contented life she led under all circumstances. I was much amused at her account of her repeated trials in trying to secure a permanent governess. She said all the posts along the river seemed to know intuitively when a new one arrived from the east. The young officers found more imperative duties calling them to Fort Sully than they had dreamed of in a year. Before long, the governess began to be abstracted and to watch longingly for the males. A ring would next appear on the significant first finger. This would be the forerunner of a request to allow her to resign her place. This had happened four times when I met our hostess, and although she was glad to furnish the officers with wives, she rather sighed for a woman who, though possessing every accomplishment, might still be so antiquated and ugly that she could be sure to keep her for a time at least. The commandant had some fine greyhounds, and joining the general with his packs of stag and foxhounds, they had several hunts in the few days that remained. Of course, after so bright a visit and such a feast, it was hard to begin again on the march with baking powder biscuit and tough beef. The cattle that supplied us with meat were driven along on the march and killed every other day, and could not be expected to be in very good condition. The interest of our journey, however, made us soon forget all deprivations. Grateful sentiments toward those who had been so kind to us as strangers remained as a memory. End of chapter 6 Chapter 7 of Boots and Saddles or Life in Dakota with General Custer by Elizabeth Custer this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Sue Anderson. Chapter 7 Adventures During the Last 
days of the march my husband and i kept up our little detours by ourselves as we neared the hour for camping each day one day one of the officers accompanied us we left the higher ground to go down by the water and have the luxury of wandering through the cottonwood trees that sometimes fringed the river for several miles as usual we had a number of dogs leaping and racing around us two of them started a deer and the general bounded after them encouraging the others with his voice to follow he had left his friend with me and we rode leisurely along to see that the younger dogs did not get lost without the least warning in the dead stillness of that desolate spot we suddenly came upon a group of young indian warriors seated in their motionless way in the underbrush i became perfectly cold and numb with terror my danger in connection with the indians was twofold i was in peril from death or capture by the savages and liable to be killed by my own friends to prevent my capture during the five years i had been with the regiment in kansas i had marched many hundred miles sometimes i had to join my husband going across a dangerous country and the exposure from indians all those years had been constant i had been a subject of conversation among the officers being the only woman who as a rule followed the regiment and without discussing it much in my presence the universal understanding was that any one having me in charge in an emergency where there was imminent danger of my capture should shoot me instantly while i knew that i was defended by strong hands and brave hearts the thought of the double danger always flashed into my mind when we were in jeopardy if time could have been measured by sensations a cycle seemed to have passed in those few seconds the indians snatched up their guns leaped from their ponies and prepared for attack the officer with me was perfectly calm spoke to them coolly without a change of voice and rode quickly beside me telling me to advance my horse reared violently at first sight of the indians and started to run gladly would i have put him to his mettle then except for the instinct of obedience which any one following a regiment acquires in all that pertains to military directions the general was just visible ascending a bluff beyond to avoid showing fear when every nerve is strung to its utmost and your heart leaps into your throat requires superhuman effort i managed to check my horse and did not scream no amount of telling over to myself what i had been told that all the tribes on this side were peaceable and that only those on the other side of the river were warlike could quell the throbbing of my pulse indians were indians to me and i knew well that it was a matter of no time to cross and recross on their little tub-like boats that shoot madly down the tide what made me sure that these warriors whom we had just met were from the fighting bands was the recollection of some significant signs we had come upon in the road a few days previous stakes had been set in the ground with bits of red flannel peculiarly fastened on them this the guide explained meant warnings from the tribes at war to frighten us from any further advance into their country whether because of the coolness of the officer or because the warriors knew the size of the advancing column we were allowed to proceed unharmed how interminable the distance seemed to where the general awaited us unconscious of what we had encountered i was lifted out of the saddle a very limp and unconscious thing encouraged by references to other dangers i had lived through without flinching i mounted again and closely followed the leader he took us through some rough country where the ambitious horses finding that by bending their heads 
they could squeeze through forgot to seek openings high enough to admit those sitting in the saddle we crashed through underbrush and i with habit torn and hand scratched was sometimes almost lifted up absalom like by the resisting branches often we had no path and the general's horse vic would start straight up steep banks after we had forded streams it never occurred to his rider until after the ascent was made and a faint voice arose from the valley that all horses would not do willingly what his thoroughbred did he finally turned to look back and tell me how to manage my horse i abandoned the bridle when we came to those ascents and wound my hands in the horse's mane to keep from sliding entirely off while the animal took his own way all this was such variety and excitement i was delighted and forgot my terror of the morning we found a bit of lovely road which only those who go hundreds of miles under a blazing sun can appreciate fully the sunshine came flickering down through the branches of the trees and covered the short grass with checkered light and shade here we dawdled and enjoyed looking up at the patches of blue sky through great grown-up treetops it was like a bit of woods at home where i never thought to be grateful for foliage but took it as a matter of course my husband remembered my having put some biscuit in the leather pocket of my saddle and at once invited himself to luncheon we dismounted and threw ourselves on the ground to eat the very frugal fare after resting we gave ourselves the privilege of a swift gallop over the stretch of smooth ground before us we were laughing and talking so busily i never noticed the surroundings until i found we were almost in the midst of an indian village quite hidden under a bluff my heart literally stood still i watched the general furtively he was as usual perfectly unmoved and yet he well knew that this was the country where it was hardly considered that the indian was overburdened with hospitality oh how i wished ourselves safely with the column now so far away there were but few occupants of the village but they glowered and growled and i could see the venomous glances they cast on us as i meekly followed i trembled so i could barely keep my seat as we slowly advanced for the general even slackened his speed to demonstrate to them i suppose that we felt ourselves perfectly at home he said how of course which was his usual salutation to them and echoing how beside him proved that i still had power of utterance when we came to one indian who looked menacingly at us and doggedly stood in our road the officer with us declared that i accompanied my how with a salaam so deep that it bent my head down to the pommel of my saddle at all events i meant if politeness would propitiate not to be deficient in that quality at such a critical moment in a few moments which seemed however a lifetime we saw the reason why the village appeared so empty men women and children had gone nearly to the top of the bluff and there with their bodies hidden were looking off at a faint cloud of dust in the distance my husband appreciating my terror quickly assured me it was the seventh cavalry even then what a stretch of country it seemed between us and that blessed veil of sand through which we perceived dimly that succor was at hand my horse was rather given to snuggling and pressed so against the general that he made his leg very uncomfortable sometimes but then in my terror it seemed to me an ocean of space was dividing us i longed for the old puritan days when a wife rode on a pillion behind her liege as a matter of course 
I found courage to look back at last. The bluff was crowned with little irregularities, so still they seemed like tufts of grass or stones. They represented many pairs of bead-like eyes that peered over the country at the advancing troops. The next day, the general thought I might rather not go with him than run the risk of such frights, but I well knew there was something far worse than fears for my own personal safety. It is infinitely worse to be left behind, a prey to all the horrors of imagining what may be happening to one we love. You slowly eat your heart out with anxiety, and to endure such suspense is simply the hardest of all trials that come to the soldier's wife. I gladly consented to be taken along every day, but there never seemed a time when it was not necessary to get accustomed to some new terror. However, it is only the getting used to it that is so bad. It is the unexpected things that require fresh relays of courage. When a woman has come out of danger, she is too utterly a coward by nature not to dread enduring the same thing again. But it is something to know that she is equal to it. Even though she may tremble and grow faint in anticipation, having once been through it, she can count on rising to the situation when the hour actually comes. The rattlesnakes were so numerous on this march that all Texas and Kansas experience seemed to dwarf in contrast. My horse was over sixteen hands high, but I would gladly have exchanged him for a camelopard when I rode suddenly almost upon a snake coiled in the grass and looked down into the eyes of the upraised head. We counted those we encountered in one day's journey until we were tired. The men became very expert and systematic in clearing the camp of these reptiles. If we halted at night in the underbrush, they cut and tore away the reeds and grass and began at once to beat the ground and kill the snakes. When I say that as many as forty were killed in one night, some literal person may ask if I actually saw the bodies of all those lately slain. It is not an exaggerated story, however, and one only needs to see hundreds of men pounding and clearing such a place to realize that many snakes could be disposed of in a short time. After that, when the ground was selected for our camp in the low part of the valley, I was loath to lie down and sleep until the soldiers had come up to prepare the ground. My husband used to indulge this little prejudice of mine against making my head a reproduction of Medusa's, and we often sought the high ground for a rest until the command came up. The guide rode often at the head of the column, and we found him full of information about the country. We began also to listen for a new domestic disclosure every time we approached an Indian village. He was the most married of any man I ever saw, for in every tribe he had a wife. Still, this superfluity did not burden him, for the ceremony of tying a marital knot in the far west is simple and the wives support themselves. Sometimes he gave us new points about making ourselves comfortable in camp. One day I was very grateful to him. We were far in advance of the wagon train containing the tents. The sun was scorching. Not a tree nor a clump of bushes was near. In a brief time, however, the guide had returned from the stream where he had cut some willow saplings. Sticking them in the ground, he made what he called a wickiup. He wove the ends loosely together on top, and over this oval cover he threw the saddle blankets. There was just room enough to crawl into this oven-like place, but it was an escape from the heat of the sun, and I was soon asleep. After I emerged, the general took my place. When he had taken his nap, the dogs crept in, 
so a very grateful family thanked the guide for teaching us that new device the bends in the missouri river are sometimes so long that the steamer with supplies would have to make a journey of sixty miles while we had perhaps only five to march across the peninsula all the soldiers officers servants teamsters and other citizen employees took that time to wash their clothes for we were two days in camp the creek on which we halted was lined with bending figures their arms moving vigorously back and forth as they wrung out each article later on the camp looked like an animated laundry from every tent rope and bush floated the apparel i had only a small valise with my summer's outfit but mary had soon taken out our few things and around the kitchen tent was suspended the family linen as soon as this was dry she folded and pressed it as best she could and laid it between the mattresses as a substitute for ironing all the way up the river the guide was constantly interviewed concerning the chances for fishing he held out promises that were to be realized upon reaching choctaw creek we arrived there on one of the resting days and camp was no sooner made and food and water brought than a great exodus took place the general called me to the tent door to see the deserted camp and we wondered how the soldiers could all have disappeared so quickly another problem was where the fishing tackle came from some had brought rods even in the restricted space allotted them but many cut them from the bushes along the river attaching hooks and lines while some bent pins and tied them to strings the soldiers shared so generously with one another that one pole was loaned about while the idle ones watched i never cared for fishing but my husband begged me to go with him always and i carried my book and work i sat under a bush near him which he covered with a shawl to protect me from the sun and there we stayed for hours officers and men competed alike for the best places by the quiet pools the general could hardly pay attention to his line he was so interested in watching the men and enjoying their pleasure his keen sense of the ludicrous took in the comical figures as far as we could see in cramped and uncomfortable positions with earnest eyes fixed steadily in one place for hours they nearly fell into the water with excitement if they chanced to draw out a tiny fish the other men came from all along the bank to observe if any one was successful one of the men near us was a member of the band he was a perfect reproduction of the old prince of isaac walton the fixedness of his gaze his whole soul in his eyes while he was utterly unconscious of anyone's being near was too much for the general's equanimity he put his head under the canopy made by my shawl not daring to laugh aloud for fear he might be heard by the man and said it was more fun to see that soldier fish than to hear him play on the violin no wonder the men enjoyed the sport for even those little bull fish fairly gritty from the muddy water in which they lived were a great addition to their pork and hardtack fare for once the sun overcame me and i knew the ignominy of being compelled to own that i was dizzy and faint i had not been long in military life before i was as much ashamed of being ill as if i had been a real soldier the troops pride themselves on being invulnerable to bodily ailments i was obliged to submit to being helped back to camp and in the cool of the evening watched the return of the fishers who were as proud of the strings of ugly little things they carried as if they had been pickerel or bass then the blue flame and soft smoke began to ascend from the evening fires and the odor of the frying supper rose on the air in my indolent weak condition i never knew how i was able to perform such agile pirouettes as i did but hearing a peculiar sound i looked 
down and saw a huge rattlesnake gliding toward me. I had long ago learned to suppress shrieks, but I forgot all such self-control then. How I wished myself the Indian baby we had seen the day before, the veritable baby in the treetop, for it was tied by buckskin thongs to a limb. There, I thought, I could rest in peace. The snake was soon dispatched. The men had left camp so hurriedly in the morning that the usual beating of the ground was omitted, and so I had this unwelcome visitor. When we camped near a village, the Indians soon appeared. Groups of half a dozen on ponies, with children running after, would come. The ponies were, most of them, dull and sway-backed. It was no wonder, for I have seen four persons on one pony, an Indian and three half-grown boys. No horse could keep its shape loaded down, as those of the Indians usually are, with game and property. These visitors grew to be great trials, for they were inveterate beggars. One day an old Indian called the man with the broken ear came riding in, elaborately decorated and on a shapely pony. He demanded to see the chief. The general appeared, assisted him to dismount, and seated him in my camp chair. The savage leaned back in a grand sort of manner and calmly surveyed us all. I was soon in agonies of anxiety, for Colonel Tom and the young officers lounging near entered the tent. They bowed low, took the hand of the old fellow with profound deference, and, smiling benignly, addressed him. In just as suave a voice, as if their words had been genuine flattery, they said, You confounded old galoot, why are you here begging and thieving, when your wretched old hands are hardly dry from some murder, and your miserable mouth still red from eating the heart of your enemy? Each one saluted him, and each vied with the other in pouring forth a tirade of forcible expletives, to which he bowed in acknowledgment and shook hands. My terror was that he might understand, for we often found these people as cunning as foxes, sitting stolid and stupid, pretending not to know a word, while they understood the gist of much that was said. The officers gave this chief tobacco, Perique, I think it is called, and so strong that even though I was accustomed to all kinds, I rather avoided the odor of it. We had no whiskey, but if we had kept it, the general obeyed the law of the reservation too strictly to allow it to be given away. However, he was called to the office tent for a few moments, and in a trice, one of the others had emptied the alcohol from the spirit lamp and offered the cup to the distinguished guest. Putting the great square of perique into his mouth with a biscuit besides, he washed it all down with gulps of the burning fluid. His eyes, heretofore dull, sparkled at the sight of the fire water. The officers said, How? and he replied, How? This did not surprise me for that one word is the Indian toast, and all tribes know it. But my breath almost went out of my body when they asked him if he would have more, and he replied, You bet. I was sure then that he had understood all the railing speeches, and that he would plan a revenge. Loud cries of laughter greeted his reply, but matching their cunning against his, they eventually found that he knew no more English. He had learned these words, without understanding their meaning, at the trader's store on the reservation. He waited around in the tent, hoping for more alcohol, until I was weary of the sight of him. But I was too much afraid of him, limp as he then was, to look bored. Finally, he was lifted out, a tumbled-up, disorganized heap of drooping feathers, trailing blanket and demoralized legs when once however one drunken old foot was lifted over the pony for him he swung himself into the saddle and though swaying uncertainly he managed to ride away during the last days of our march 
we came upon another premonitory warning from the Indians. A pole was found stuck in the trail before us with a red flag to which were fastened locks of hair. It was a challenge, and when interpreted, meant that if we persisted in advancing, the hostiles were ready to meet the soldiers and fight them. The officers paid little attention to this, but my heart was like lead for days afterward. We encamped that night near what the Indians call Medicine Rock. My husband and I walked out to see it. It was a large stone, showing on the flat surface the impress of hands and feet made ages ago, before the clay was petrified. The Indians had tied bags of their herb medicine on poles around the rock, believing that virtue would enter into articles left in the vicinity of this proof of the marvels or miracles of the Great Spirit. Tin cans, spoons, and forks that they had bought at the agency on account of the brightness of the metal were left there as offerings to an unseen god everything pertaining to the indians was new and interesting to me while we were in kansas the tribes were at war and we had not the opportunity to see their daily life as we did while passing through the sioux reservations on the march i regretted each day that brought us nearer to the conclusion of our journey for though i had been frightened by the indians and though we had encountered cold storms and rough life the pleasures of the trip overbalanced the discomforts end of chapter seven chapter eight of boots and saddles or life in dakota with general custer by elizabeth custer this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by sue anderson chapter eight separation and reunion the day came at last for our march of five hundred miles to terminate a rickety old ferry boat that took us over the river made a halt near fort rice and there we established ourselves strange to say the river was no narrower there than it was so many hundred miles below where we started muddy and full of sandbars as it was we began bravely to drink the water when the glass had been filled long enough for the sediment partially to settle and to take our baths in what at first seemed liquid mud we learned after a time to settle the water with alum and we finally became accustomed to the taste the commandant at fort rice was most hospitable and his wife was charming their quarters were very ordinary frame buildings with no modern improvements they were painted a funereal tint but one warranted to last the interior showed the presence of a tasteful woman she met us as cheerfully as if she were in the luxurious home from which we knew she had gone as a girl to follow a soldier's life contrast often helps us to endure and dakota was not so bad as their last station in arizona the dinner was excellent and our entertainers were the happy possessors of a good cook rarely do army people have two good servants at the same time on the frontier our host and hostess made no apologies but quietly waited on the table themselves and a merry time we had over the blunders of the head of the house who was a distinguished general in his endeavors to find necessary dishes in the china closet a steamer that arrived a day or two after we had reached fort rice brought the regimental property consisting of everything that was not used on the march our household effects and trunks were delivered to us in a very sorry condition they had been carelessly stored on the wharf at yankton near the government warehouse without any covering 
during all the storms that drenched us coming up the river almost everything was mildewed and ruined we tried to dry our clothing in the sun many a little bit of silken finery that we had cherished since our marriage days feeling sure that we should never attain to such grandeur again was suspended from the tent ropes stained and dull our sister's husband helped her to unpack her clothes and his own soaked uniform he was dignified and reserved by nature but on that occasion the barriers were broken i heard him ask margaret to excuse him while he went outside the tent to make some remarks to himself that he felt the occasion demanded there were furious people on all sides and savage speeches about the thoughtlessness of those who had left our property exposed to snow and rain when we were no longer there to care for it i endured everything until my pretty wedding dress was taken out crushed and spotted with mildew my husband had great control over himself in the small annoyances of life and was able to repeat again the proverb he had adopted in his boyhood never cry for spilled milk how he could submit so quietly when he took out his prized books and the few pictures i knew he valued was a mystery all thought began now to center on the coming events of the summer it was decided that the regiment was to go out to guard the engineers of the northern pacific railroad while they surveyed the route from bismarck to the yellowstone river the ladies necessarily were to be left behind now began the summer of my discontent i longed to remain in dakota for i knew it would take much longer for our letters to reach us if we went east besides it was far more comforting to stay at a military post where everyone was interested in the expedition and talked about it as the chief topic of concern i remembered when i had gone east before during a summer when our regiment was fighting indians and my idea was that the whole country would be almost as absorbed as we were how shocked i was to be asked when i spoke of the regiment ah is there a campaign and for what purpose has it gone out i was willing to live in a tent alone at the post but there were not even tents to be had then we all looked with envious eyes at the quarters at fort rice the post was small and there were no vacant rooms except in the bachelor quarters these are so called when the unmarried men take rooms in the same house and mess together no opportunity was given us to wheedle them into offering us a place our officers hinted to them but they seemed to be completely intimidated regarding women they received an honest and emphatic no when they asked if the ladies of the seventh cavalry quarreled even then these wary men said they did not dare to offer to take in any women they added that there were but three in the post and no two of them spoke to each other they thought if we were asked to remain it might be the history of the kilkenny cats repeated and they were obdurate there was nothing left for us then but to go home it was a sore disappointment we were put on the steamer that was to take us to bismarck a heartbroken little group i hated dakota the ugly river and even my native land we were nearly devoured with mosquitoes at once only the strongest ammonia on our faces and hands served to alleviate the torment the journey was wretchedness itself i had thrown myself on the berth in one of the little suffocating staterooms exhausted with weeping and too utterly overcome with the anguish of parting to know much of the surroundings i was roused by the gentle hand of a woman who had forgotten her own trouble to come to me ah even now 
when the tears rained down my face at the remembrance of those agonizing good-byes, which were like death each time, and which grew harder with each separation, I think of the sympathy shown me. The sweet, tender eyes of the wives of officers come to me now, and I feel the soft touch of their hands as they came to comfort me, even when their own hearts were wrung. Grief is so selfish. I wonder now that they could have been such ministering angels. At last the slow, wearisome journey was over, and we went into the little town of Bismarck to take the cars. The department commander, returning to his headquarters, had offered to take charge of us to St. Paul, and was kind enough to share with us the car of the president of the Northern Pacific Railroad, which had been placed at his disposal. There were seven of us and his own personal staff. Another five hundred miles were before us, but in such luxury it hardly seemed that my sister and I were the same two who had been roughing it on the march a few days before. The journey was very quiet and over an uninteresting country, but we ladies had something to occupy our time as we began to prepare some of our meals, for the untidy eating houses on the road were almost unendurable. The staff of the commanding general went out at the stations and foraged for what food they could find to add to our bill of fare. At St. Paul we bade them all good-bye, and soon found ourselves welcomed by dear father and mother Custer at Monroe. Their hearts were ever with the absent ones. For several slow, irksome months I did little else than wait for the tardy mails, and count each day that passed again. I had very interesting letters from my husband, sometimes thirty and forty pages in length. He wrote of his delight at having again his whole regiment with him, his interest in the country, his hunting exploits, and the renewal of his friendship with General Rosser. The Seventh Cavalry was sent out to guard the engineers of the Northern Pacific while they surveyed the route to the Yellowstone. This party of citizens joined the command a few days out from Fort Rice. The general wrote me that he was lying on the buffalo robe in his tent, resting after the march, when he heard a voice outside asking the sentinel which was General Custer's tent. The general called out, Halloo, old fellow! I haven't heard that voice in thirteen years, but I know it. Come in and welcome. General Rosser walked in, and such a reunion as they had. These two had been classmates and warm friends at West Point, and parted with sorrow when General Rosser went into the Southern Army. Afterward they had fought each other in the Shenandoah Valley time and time again. Both of them lay on the robe for hours, talking over the campaigns in Virginia. In the varying fortunes of war, sometimes one had got possession of the wagon trains belonging to the other. I knew of several occasions when they had captured each other's headquarters wagons with the private luggage. If one drove the other back in retreat, before he went into camp, he wrote a note addressing the other as, Dear Friend, and saying, you may have made me take a few steps this way today, but I'll be even with you tomorrow. Please accept my good wishes and this little gift. These notes and presents were left at the house of some southern woman as they retreated out of the village. Once General Custer took all of his friend's luggage and found in it a new uniform of Confederate gray. He wrote a humorous letter that night, thanking General Rosser for setting him up with so many new things, but audaciously asking if he would direct his tailor to make the coat-tails of his next uniform a little shorter, as there was a difference in the height of the two men. General Custer captured his herd of cattle at one time, 
but he was so hotly pursued by General Rosser that he had to dismount, cut a whip, and drive them himself until they were secured. To return to the Yellowstone expedition, the hour for starting never varied more than a few moments during the summer, and it was so early the civilians connected with the engineering party could not become reconciled to it. In the afternoon, my husband sometimes walked out on the outskirts of camp and threw himself down in the grass to rest with his dogs beside him. It was a source of amusement to him if he accidentally overheard the grumbling. His campaigning dress was so like that of an enlisted man, and his insignia of rank so unnoticeable, that the tongues ran on indifferent to his presence. Sometimes in their growling the civilians accused him of having something on his conscience, and declared that, not being able to sleep himself, he woke everyone else to an unearthly reveille. At this he choked with laughter, and to their dismay they discovered who he was. I remember his telling me of another occasion when he unavoidably heard a soldier exclaim, There goes taps, and before we get a mouthful to eat, reveille will sound, and old Curly will hike us out for the march. The soldier was slightly discomforted to find the subject of his remarks was within hearing. The enlisted men were constantly finding new names for the general, which I would never have known, thereby losing some amusement, if Mary had not occasionally told me of them. A favorite was Jack, the letters G, A, C, on his valise having served as a suggestion. When the expedition returned from the Yellowstone, a dispatch came to me in Michigan, saying the regiment had reached Fort Lincoln in safety. Another soon followed, informing me that my husband was on his way home. The relief from constant anxiety and suspense, together with all the excitement into which I was thrown, made me almost unfit to make preparation to meet him. There was to be an army reunion in the city nearest us, and in my impatience I took the first train, thinking to reach there in advance of General Custer. As I walked along the street, looking into shop windows, I felt, rather than saw, a sudden rush from a door, and I was taken off my feet and set dancing in air. Before I could resent what I thought was an indignity, I discovered that it was my husband, who seemed utterly regardless of the passers-by. He was sunburned and mottled for the flesh was quite fair where he had cut off his beard, the growth of the summer. He told me the officers with whom he had traveled in the Pullman car had teased him and declared that no man would shave in a car going at forty miles an hour except to prepare to meet his sweetheart. I was deeply grateful, though, for I knew the fiery tint of the beard and infinitely preferred the variegated flesh tints of his sunburned face. End of chapter 8「Chapter 9 of Boots and Saddles, or Life in Dakota with General Custer, by Elizabeth Custer. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Sue Anderson Chapter 9 Our New Home at Fort Lincoln In a few days we were ready to return to Dakota, and very glad to go, except for leaving the old parents. The hardest trial of my husband's life was parting with his mother. Such partings were the only occasions when I ever saw him lose entire control of himself and I always looked forward to the hour of their separation with dread. For hours before we started, I have seen him follow his mother about, whispering some comforting word to her, or opening the closed door of her own room, 
where woman-like she fought out her grief alone sit beside her as long as he could endure it she had been an invalid for so many years that each parting seemed to her the final one her groans and sobs were heart-rending she clung to him every step when he started to go and exhausted at last was led back half fainting to her lounge the general would rush out of the house sobbing like a child and then throw himself into the carriage beside me completely unnerved i could only give silent comfort my heart bled for him and in the long silence that followed as we journeyed on i knew that his thoughts were with his mother at our first stop he was out of the cars in an instant buying fruit to send back to her before we were even unpacked in the hotel where we made our first stay of any length he had dashed off a letter i have since seen those missives no matter how hurriedly he wrote they were proofs of the tenderest most filial love and full of the prophecies he never failed to make of the reunion that he felt would soon come after long debates with her parents we had captured a young lady who was to return with us she was a joy for ever and submitted without a word to the rough part of our journey after we left st paul the usual struggle for decent food began some of the officers returning from leave of absence had joined us and we made as merry over our hardships as we could when we entered the eating houses one young member of our party whom we called the butter fiend was made the experimenter if he found the butter too rancid to eat undisguised he gave us a hint by saying under his breath this is a double over place that meant that we must put a layer of bread on top of the butter to smother the taste the general was so sensitive when living in civilization that the heartiest appetite would desert him if an allusion to anything unpleasant or a reference to suffering was made at the table but he never seemed to be conscious of surroundings when roughing it of course i had learned to harden myself to almost anything by this time but i can see the wide open eyes of our girlfriend when she saw us eat all around any foreign ingredients we found in our food she nearly starved on a diet consisting of the interior of badly baked potatoes and the inside of soggy rolls one of the eating places on the road was kept in a narrow little house built on a flat car two men presided one cooking and the other waiting on the table we were laboriously spearing our food with two tined forks and sipping the muddy coffee with pewter spoons when i heard with surprise the general asking for a napkin it seemed as foreign to the place as a finger bowl the waiter knew him however and liked him too well to refuse him anything so he said i have nothing but a towel general just the thing repeated my husband in his quick jolly way so the man tied a long crash towel under his chin and the general ate on too indifferent to appearances to care that the table full of travelers smiled when we finally reached the termination of the road at bismarck another train was about starting back to st paul the street was full of people wildly expostulating and talking loudly and fiercely it appeared that this was the last train of the season as the cars were not to run during the winter the passengers were mostly bismarck citizens whose lawless life as gamblers and murderers had so outraged the sentiments of the few law-abiding residents that they had forced them to depart we could see those outlaws crowding at the door hanging out of the windows swearing and menacing and finally firing on the retreating crowd as the cars passed out of town 
I was inclined to remain a fixture in our car. To step down into such a melee was too much for my courage. The general made allowance for my fears, and we were quietly slipped out on the other side of the depot, hurried into the ambulance, and driven to the river. The ice was already thick enough to bear our weight part way over. Then came a swift rushing torrent of water which had to be crossed in a small boat. Some of the soldiers rowed, while one kept the huge cakes of floating ice from our frail boat with a long iron-pointed pole. As I stepped into the little craft, I dropped upon the bottom and hid my eyes, and no amount of reference to dangers I had encountered before induced me to look up. The current of the Missouri is so swift it is something dreadful to encounter. We were lifted out upon the ice again and walked to the bank. Once more on shore, I said to myself, here will I live and die and never go on that river again. Our brother, Colonel Tom, met us and drove us to our new home. In the dim light, I could see the great post of Fort Lincoln where only a few months before we had left a barren plain. Our quarters were lighted, and as we approached, the regimental band played Home Sweet Home, followed by the general's favorite, Gary Owen. The general had completely settled the house before he left for the east, but he had kept this fact secret as a surprise. Our friends had lighted it all and built fires in the fireplaces. The garrison had gathered to welcome us, and Mary had a grand supper ready. How we chattered and gloried over the regiments having a home at last. It seemed too good to believe that the 7th Cavalry had a post of its own with room for half of the regiment assigned to duty there. In other garrisons, when we had come in late in the fall from campaigns, the officers, in order to get places for themselves, had been obliged to turn someone else out. There is a disagreeable, though probably necessary, law in the Army regulations which directs officers to take their quarters according to rank. Fort Lincoln was built with quarters for six companies. The barracks for the soldiers were on the side of the parade ground nearest the river, while seven detached houses for officers faced the river opposite. On the left of the parade ground was the long granary and the little military prison called the guardhouse. Opposite, completing the square, were the quartermaster and commissary storehouses for supplies and the adjutant's office. Outside the garrison proper, near the river, were the stables for six hundred horses. Still further beyond were the quarters for the laundresses, easily traced by the swinging clotheslines in front, and, dubbed for this reason, Suds Row. Some distance on from there were the log huts of the Indian scouts and their families, while on the same side also was the level plain used for parades and drill. On the left of the post was the sutler's store, with a billiard room attached. Soon after the general arrived, he permitted a citizen to put up a barber shop, and afterward another built a little cabin of cottonwood with a canvas roof for a photographer's establishment. The post was located in a valley, while just back of us stretched a long chain of bluffs. On the summit of a hill, Nearly a mile to the left was a small infantry garrison, which had been established some time and now belonged to our post. When we went to return the visits of the infantry ladies, the mules dragged the ambulance up the steep hill with difficulty. We found living in this bleak place, in small, shabbily built quarters, such as a day laborer would consider hardly good enough for his family, delicate women and children, who, as usual, made no complaint about their life. Afterward, we were much indebted to one of the ladies, who, determined to conquer fate, 
varied our lives and gave us something to look forward to by organizing a reading club that met every week she had sent to the east before the trains ceased running for the new books this little post had been built before the railroad was completed and the houses were put together with as few materials as possible there was no plastering but the ceilings and partitions were of thick paper made for the purpose when narrow mouldings of wood were tacked over the joined places and all of it painted the effect was very pretty but when it was torn and ragged it looked poverty-stricken enough in one set of quarters there chanced to be so many children and so little room that the parents had invented a three-story bed where the little ones could be all stowed at night while we were calling there one day i sat talking with the cheerful little mother and wondering how she could be so bright everything in garrison life was of course new to my girlfriend and i discovered she was trying to smother a laugh she commanded a view of the inner door one of the children who had been beating the wall and crying to enter had finally made preliminary preparations she had thrust through a hole in the paper partition each article of her little wardrobe even to her shoes and was putting the first rosy foot through after them when the mother discovered this she laughed heartily and gave us thus an opportunity to join her our own post was somewhat sheltered by the bluffs behind but even though our quarters were plastered the unseasoned lumber warped and it was a struggle to keep warm the wood with which we were provided was far from dry and much of it of that kind that burns quickly but sends out little heat it seemed to require the entire time of one man to keep up the fires it was thus a blessed thing for the poor fellow whose duty it was for he had never been able to remain long with his company at a time he had an uncontrollable habit of drinking most of the time he belonged to the band of prisoners who are taken out of the guardhouse every day under a sentinel to police the garrison and cut the wood mary gave them the coffee and whatever else was left from the table every day this seemingly worthless fellow told mary that he believed he could keep straight if mrs custer would get the general to remit his sentence and let him come to us to keep the fires so he came and was occasionally sober for some time he learned to go through the house with his arms full of wood when he was quite drunk he really had too much heart to cause me trouble and used to say mary i am pretty full but don't let mrs custer know it for i told her i would not do so again and i don't like to make her feel bad so mary spied out the land before him and opened his doors after he had tried her patience long she finally lost her temper on finding that he had swallowed all the worcestershire sauce and her bottle of painkiller she held out the can of kerosene oil to him and asked if he would not add that to his dram and began such a berating that he hurried off to escape from the violence of her tongue the soldiers asked the general's permission to put up a place in which they could have entertainments and he gave them every assistance he could they prepared the lumber in the sawmill that belonged to the post the building was an ungainly looking structure but large enough to hold them all the unseasoned cottonwood warped even while the house was being built but by patching and lining with old torn tents they managed to keep out the storm the scenery was painted on condemned canvas stretched on a framework and was lifted on and off as the plays required the footlights in front of the rude stage were tallow candles that smoked and sputtered inside the clumsily cobbled casing of tin the seats were narrow benches without backs 
the officers and ladies were always invited to take the front row at every new performance and after they entered the house filled up with soldiers some of the enlisted men played very well and used great ingenuity in getting up their costumes the general accepted every invitation and enjoyed it all greatly the clog dancing and negro character songs between the acts were excellent indeed we sometimes had professionals who having been stranded in the states had enlisted a regiment is recruited from all classes and conditions of men occasionally accident revealed the secret that there were fugitives from justice in the ranks if they changed their names they found no place where they were so hidden from everyone they ever knew as in a regiment that is always on duty in the territories it came to pass sometimes that a man of title who had left his country for his country's good wore the government blue as a disguise and served as a trooper for want of anything better to do among the men who sent word they would be glad to help me about the house when we were settling either as a carpenter a saddler to sew carpets or a blacksmith to put up stoves there were several with histories although they were strictly military with the general observing the rule of never speaking unless spoken to they sought the first opportunity to tell me their troubles these were invariably domestic difficulties until i began to think our regiment was a city of refuge for outraged husbands it would eventually be found out that these men had run away and enlisted under assumed names when driven desperate by the scoldings of a turbulent wife time and the loneliness of a soldier's life would soften their woes and they began at last to sigh even for the high-pitched voice of the deserted woman the general felt as badly as i did when i carried their stories to him begging him to get them discharged he had a little fashion however of asking me to remember that about this as about every other subject that we ever discussed there were always two sides to a question my sympathy for the soldiers in trouble was of little avail for the law compelling them to serve the five years out was irrevocable all i could do was to write letters at their solicitation revealing their identity and asking for a reconciliation my husband's duties extended over a wide range if the laundresses had a serious difficulty he was asked to settle it they had many pugilists among them and the least infringement of their rights provoked a battle in which wood and other missiles filled the air bandaged and bruised they brought their wrongs to our house where both sides had a hearing the general had occasionally to listen and arbitrate between husband and wife when the laundress and her soldier husband could not agree i was banished from the room while he heard their story and gave them counsel in the same way he listened to whatever complaints the soldiers made some of them came into our quarters on one occasion with a tin cup of coffee for the general to taste and determine whether he agreed with them that it was too poor to drink from that time on after every sunday morning inspection the general went with all the officers to visit the kitchens as well as the barracks of each company and every troop commander was called upon to pass criticisms on the cleanliness of the quarters and on the wholesomeness of the food End of chapter 9chapter 10 of boots and saddles or life in dakota with general custer by elizabeth custer this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by sue anderson chapter 10 incidents of everyday life 
the companies each gave a ball in turn during the winter and the preparations were begun long in advance there was no place to buy anything save the sutler's store and the shops in the little town of bismarck but they were well ransacked for materials for the supper the bunks where the soldiers slept were removed from the barracks and flags festooned around the room arms were stacked and guidons arranged in groups a few pictures of distinguished men were wreathed in imitation laurel leaves cut out of green paper chandeliers and side brackets carved out of cracker box boards into fantastic shapes were filled with candles while at either end of the long room great logs in the wide fireplaces threw out a cheerful light the ball opened headed by the first sergeant after this the officers and their wives were invited to form a set at one end of the room and we danced several times one of the men whose voice was clear and loud sang the calls he was a comical genius and improvised new ways of calling off when the place came in the quadrille to turn your partners his voice rose above the music in the notes of the song oh swing those girls those pretty little girls those girls you left behind you this was such an inspiration to the fun lovers that the swinging usually ended in our being whirled in the air by the privileged members of our family the soldiers were a superb lot of men physically the outdoor life had developed them into perfect specimens of vigorous manhood after the company tailor had cut over their uniforms they were often the perfection of good fitting the older soldiers wore on the sleeves of their coats the rows of braid that designate the number of years in the service some had the army badges of the corps in which they fought during the war while an occasional foreign decoration showed that they had been brave soldiers in the fatherland we were escorted out to the supper room in the company kitchen in advance of the enlisted men the general delighted the hearts of the sergeant and ball managers by sitting down to a great dish of potato salad it was always well flavored with the onion as rare out there as and more appreciated than pomegranates are in new york we ladies took cake of course but sparingly for it was also a great luxury when we returned to watch the dancing the general was on nettles for fear we should be wanting intact and show our amusement by laughing at the costumes of the women there was but a sprinkling of them several from bismarck and a few white servants of the officers each company was allowed but three or four laundresses the soldier was obliged to ask permission to marry and his engagement was a weary waiting sometimes in order to get a vacancy for his sweetheart he had to await the discharge of some other soldier from the company whose wife held the appointment of laundress these women were at the ball in full force and each one brought her baby when we removed our wraps in the room of the first sergeant we usually found his bed quite full of curly-headed infants sleeping while the laundress mothers danced the toilets of these women were something marvelous in construction in low neck and short sleeves their round red arms and well-developed figures wheeled around the barracks all night long even the tall mexican laundress hereafter specially mentioned would deck herself in pink tarlatan and false curls and notwithstanding her height and colossal anatomy she had constant partners the little dutch woman who loved her husband more devotedly after each beating and did not dance with any one else was never absent from the balls her tiny little figure was suspended between heaven and earth while her tall soldier whirled her around the long hall in the endless german waltz some officer would whisper slyly in my ear as she bowed and smiled in passing do you see the get-up of 
old trouble again she had long before earned this sobriquet when coming to me for help out of her misfortunes beginning each story of woe with trouble again wherever we were and when the orders were issued for a campaign she soon appeared claiming sympathy no one could feel at such a time more than i the truth of her preface for if we were to be left behind it was indeed trouble again the pack of hounds were an endless source of delight to the general we had about forty the stag hounds that run by sight and are on the whole the fleetest and most enduring dogs in the world and the foxhounds that follow the trail with their noses close to the ground the first rarely bark but the latter are very noisy the general and i used to listen with amusement to their attempts to strike the keynote of the bugler when he sounded the calls summoning the men to guard mount stables or retreat it rather destroyed the military effect to see beside his soldierly figure a hound sitting down absorbed in imitation with lifted head and rolling eyes there issued from the broad mouth notes so doleful they would have answered for a misericordia the foxhounds were of the most use in the winter for the hunting was generally in the underbrush and timber along the river i never tired of watching the start for the hunt the general was a figure that would have fixed attention anywhere. He had marked individuality of appearance, and a certain unstudied carelessness in the wearing of his costume that gave a picturesque effect not the least out of place on the frontier. He wore troop boots reaching to his knees, buckskin breeches fringed on the sides, a dark navy blue shirt with a broad collar and a red necktie whose ends floated over his shoulder exactly as they did when he and his entire division of cavalry had worn them during the war on the broad felt hat that was almost a sombrero was fastened a slight mark of his rank he was at this time thirty-five years of age weighed one hundred and seventy pounds and was nearly six feet in height his eyes were clear blue and deeply set his hair short wavy and golden in tint his mustache was long and tawny in color his complexion was florid except where his forehead was shaded by his hat for the sun always burned his skin ruthlessly he was the most agile active man i ever knew and so very strong and in such perfect physical condition that he rarely knew even an hour's indisposition horse and man seemed one when the general vaulted into the saddle his body was so lightly poised and so full of swinging undulating motion it almost seemed that the wind moved him as it blew over the plain yet every nerve was alert and like finely tempered steel for the muscles and sinews that seemed so pliable were equal to the curbing of the most fiery animal i do not think that he sat his horse with more grace than the other officers for they rode superbly but it was accounted by others almost an impossibility to dislodge the general from the saddle no matter how vicious the horse might prove he threw his feet out of the stirrups the moment the animal began to show his inclination for war and with his knees dug into the sides of the plunging brute he fought and always conquered with his own horses he needed neither spur nor whip they were such friends of his and his voice seemed so attuned to their natures they knew as well by its inflections as by the slight pressure of the bridle on their necks what he wanted by the merest inclination on the general's part they either sped on the wings of the wind or adapted their spirited steps to the slow movement of the march it was a delight to see them together 
they were so in unison and when he talked to them as though they had been human beings their intelligent eyes seemed to reply as an example of his horsemanship he had a way of escaping from the stagnation of the dull march when it was not dangerous to do so by riding a short distance in advance of the column over a divide throwing himself on one side of his horse so as to be entirely out of sight from the other direction giving a signal that the animal understood and tearing off at the best speed that could be made the horse entered into the frolic with all the zest of his master and after the race the animal's beautiful distended nostrils glowed blood red as he tossed his head and danced with delight in hunting the general rode either vic or dandy the dogs were so fond of the latter they seemed to have little talks with him the general's favorite dog blucher would leap up to him in the saddle and jump fairly over the house in starting the spirited horses mounted by officers who sat them so well the sound of the horn used for the purpose of calling the dogs their answering bay the glad voices and hoopla to the hounds as the party galloped down the valley are impressions ineffaceable from my memory they often started a deer within sound of the bugle at the post in a few hours their shouts outside would call me to the window and there drooping across the back of one of the orderly's horses would be a magnificent black-tailed deer we had a saddle of venison hanging on the woodhouse almost constantly during the winter the officers and even the soldiers tables had this rarity to vary the monotony of the inevitable beef after these hunts the dogs had often to be cared for they would be lame or cut in the chase through the tangle of vines and branches these were so dense it was a constant wonder to the general how the deer could press through with its spreading antlers the english hounds unacquainted with our game used to begin with a porcupine sometimes it was pitiful though for a moment at first sight amusing to see their noses and lips looking like animated pincushions there was nothing for us to do after such an encounter but to begin surgery at once the general would not take time to get off his hunting clothes nor go near the fire until he had called the dog into his room and extracted the painful quills with the tweezers from his invaluable knife i sat on the dog and held his paws but quivered even when i kept my head averted the barbed quills cannot be withdrawn but must be pulled through in the same direction in which they entered the gums lips and roof of the mouth were full of little wounds but the dogs were extremely sagacious and held very still when the painful operation was over they were very grateful licking the general's hand as he praised them for their pluck sometimes when the weather was moderate and i rode after the foxhounds one of them separated himself from the pack and came shaking his great velvet ears and wagging his cumbrous tail beside my horse the general would call my attention to him and tell me that it was our latest surgical patient paying us his bill of gratitude which is the exchequer of the poor among the pack was an old hound that had occasional fits when he felt the symptoms of an attack he left the kennel at the rear of the house came round to the front door and barked or scratched to get in my husband knew at once that the dog was going to suffer and that instinct had taught him to come to us for help rover would lie down beside the general until his hour of distress and then solicit the ever ready sympathy with his mournful eyes the general rubbed and cared for him while the dog writhed and foamed at the mouth he was always greatly touched to see the old hound when he began to revive 
try to lift up the tip of his tail in gratitude. With the staghounds, hunting was so bred in the bone that they sometimes went off by themselves, and even the half-grown puppies followed. I have seen them returning from such a hunt, the one who led the pack holding proudly in his mouth a jackrabbit. The wolves, in their desperate hunger, used to come up on the bluffs almost within a stone's throw of our quarters. It was far from pleasant to look out the window and see them prowling about. Once, when the stag hounds were let out of the kennel for exercise, they flew like the winds over the hills after a coyote. The soldier who took care of them could only follow on foot as the crust on the snow would not bear the weight of a horse. After a long, cold walk, he found the dogs standing over the wolf they had killed. When he dragged it back to our woodshed, he sent in to ask if the general would come and see what the dogs had done unaided and alone, for he was very proud of them. As the family all stood talking over the size of the coyote and its fur, I said triumphantly, Now I shall have a robe. It was enough for them, and they made no end of sport about my planning a robe out of one small skin. After we had all gone into the house, the soldier, who was not accustomed to hear such badgering, went into Mary and indignantly exclaimed, Be jabbers, and they'll not tease her about that long. After that, during the winter, he walked frequently over the plain with the dogs, and when they had started a trail and run almost out of sight, he patiently followed until he reached the spot where they had brought down the game. Even in that bitter weather, he brought in enough foxes, swifts, and coyotes to make me a large robe. When it was made up, I triumphantly placed myself on it, and reminded my family of their teasing, and the time so lately passed when I had been an object of jest to them. The weather seemed to grow colder and colder as the winter advanced. From twenty to thirty degrees below zero was ordinary weather. The officers were energetic enough to get up sleighs, even with all the difficulties they had to encounter. There was no lumber at the post except unseasoned cottonwood. The man who could get a packing box for the body of his sleigh was a Croesus. The carpenter cut and sawed the edges into scallops and curves. The rudest bobs were ironed by the company blacksmith, and the huge tongue of an army wagon was attached to the frail eggshell. The woodwork was painted black, and really the color and shape reminded one of a little baby hearse. Sister Margaret and I disliked sleighing, even under favorable circumstances, but that made no sort of difference. We were expected to go twice a day and try in turn each new sleigh. My husband found a sketch in some of the illustrated papers which he thought such a fitting representation of us that he added some lines and drew some applicable features to the picture, and wrote underneath, Margaret and Libby enjoying a sleigh ride. Two wretched, shivering beings, wrapped in furs, sit with their feet in a tub of ice water while a servant rings a dinner bell over their heads. When we were thus taken out, as a sacrifice, we were enveloped in so many wraps we had literally to be carried and dropped into the sleigh, and after hot bricks were adjusted to our feet, we assumed the martyr look that women understand how to take on when persuaded against their will, and off we flew. It made no impression if we were speechless. The dearth of women made the men far from critical. Sometimes we went to the Hart River, which empties into the Missouri, and which we were not afraid to drive over, as it was frozen solid. And yet it should be understood that we preferred to go and be frozen 
rather than stay at home and be comfortable for we were a band of friends sharing the same isolation and each took comfort in contributing to the enjoyment of the rest one sort of sleighing we really did enjoy one of the officers got up a long sleigh using the bed of an army wagon for the box he was his own coachman and stood in front driving an excellent four in hand we all placed ourselves in the straw and robes and nothing of the whole party was visible except two rows of tip-tilted rosy-tinted noses peeking out from under fur caps and gay mufflers if anyone rashly left the seat to play some prank it was never regained the space closed up instantly and it was a choice of standing for the rest of the distance or uncomfortably sitting on the spurs arctics or buffalo overshoes of the others another of our number tried driving tandem and as his horses were very fleet and his sleigh very frail it was a study from first to last how soon we should gather up the fragments of our scattered selves from the white plain over which we flew at eagle speed when the thermometer went down to forty-five degrees below zero the utmost vigilance was exercised to prevent the men from being frozen the general took off all the sentinels but two and those were encased in buffalo overcoats and shoes and required to walk their beat but fifteen minutes at a time there were no wells or cisterns and the quartermaster had no means of supplying the post with water except with a water wagon that required six mules to haul it around the garrison the hole in the river through which the water was drawn was cut through five feet of ice it was simply dreadful on those bitter days to see the poor men whose duty it was to distribute the supply my husband used to turn away with a shudder from the window when they came in sight and beg me not to talk of a matter that he was powerless to remedy the two barrels at the kitchen door were all that we could have and on some days the men and wagon could not go around at all we husbanded every drop and borrowed from a neighbor if any neighbor was fortunate enough not to have used all his supply end of chapter ten chapter eleven of boots and saddles or life in dakota with general custer by elizabeth custer this librivox recording is in the public domain Recording by Sue Anderson Chapter 11 The Burning of Our Quarters Carrying the Mail We had hardly finished arranging our quarters when one freezing night I was awakened by a roaring sound in a chimney that had been defective from the first. Women have such a rooted habit of smelling smoke and sending men on needless investigating trips in the dead of night that i tried to keep still for a few moments the sound grew too loud to be mistaken and i awakened my husband he ran upstairs and found the room above us on fire he called to me to bring him some water believing he could extinguish it himself while i hurried after the water there came such a crash and explosion that my brain seemed to reel from fright. I had no thought but that my husband was killed. Nothing can describe the relief with which I heard his voice calling back to my agonized question about his safety. His escape was very narrow. The chimney had burst. The whole side of the room was blown out, and he was covered with plaster and surrounded with fallen bricks. The gas from the petroleum paper put on between the plastering and the outer walls to keep out the cold had exploded the roof had ignited at once 
and was blown off with a noise like the report of artillery. The sentinel at the guardhouse fired his carbine as an alarm. The general ran to one of the lower windows, and with his powerful voice that he could throw so far, called for the guard. Then we hurried to the room occupied by our girlfriend. The plaster falling on her head from the burning roof was the first hint she had of the danger. It was unsafe for her to stop to gather her clothes, and wrapping a blanket about her, we sent her to our sister next door. In an incredibly short time, the men were swarming about the house. The general had buttoned his vest, containing his watch and purse, over his long nightdress, and unconscious of his appearance, he gave just as cool orders to the soldiers as if it were a drill. They also were perfectly cool, and worked like beavers to remove our things, for with no engine, and without water, it was useless to try to save the house. The general stood upon the upper landing, and forbade them to join him, as it was perilous, the floors being then on fire. He had insisted upon my going out of the house, but I was determined not to do so until he was safe. When I did leave, I ran in my nightdress over the snow to our sister's. The house burned very quickly. Fortunately, it was a still cold night, and there was no wind to spread the flames. Except for this, the whole garrison might have been burned. When the morning came, we went to inspect the heap of household belongings that had been carried out on the parade ground. It was a sorry collection of torn, broken, and marred effects. Most of my clothes were gone. Our poor girlfriend looked down into her trunk, empty except for one tarlatan party gown. I had lost silver and linen, and what laces and finery I had. The only loss I mourned, as it was really irreparable, was a collection of newspaper clippings regarding my husband that I had saved during and since the war. Beside these, I lost a little wig that I had worn at a fancy dress ball, made from the golden rings of curly hair cut from my husband's head after the war, when he had given up wearing long locks. The fire served one purpose after all. Before it occurred, I had always been a trial to Mary, because I cared so little for dress and really owned so few ornaments. When the servants gathered together after that to boast of the possessions of their several mistresses, as is customary with the colored people who so love display, Mary was armed with an excuse for me. I used to hear of her saying, You just oughter see what Miss Libby had afore the fire, and then she would describe in detail elegant apparel that I had never even thought of having. Long afterward, I heard of the comments of one of our number, who loved the loaves and fishes of this life beyond everything. In vain she accumulated, and had the proud satisfaction of outdoing everyone in the number of her dresses. Mary managed to slip into her kitchen on some feigned errand, and, drawing upon her imagination, related how much richer Miss Libby's possessions were before the fire. I had a hearty laugh by myself when I heard that Miss Flora McFlimsey of our circle worn out with the boasting of the cook, was heard to exclaim, I wish I might have seen for myself all the gorgeousness described. I am tired to death of hearing about before the fire. The general selected another set of quarters next to his brother's, and thither removed the remnants of our household goods. He begged me not to go near the house or attempt to settle until I had recovered from the fright of the fire and of his imperiled life the night before. We were all busy enough trying to fit our things upon our little friend. 
her purse with abundance to buy a new outfit was burned and it would be weeks before she could receive a remittance from home by our slow mails next day as she sat among us in borrowed apparel several sizes too large she had a surprise a huge clothes basket was handed in at the door with a note addressed to her begging her to consider herself what the garrison had long felt that she was the daughter of the regiment the basket contained everything that the generous hearts of friends could suggest not content with this another was sent on the next day with a further supply of things bought in the store at bismarck she objected to the acceptance and tears rose in her eyes at the thoughtfulness but there were no names signed to the note so we could not heed remonstrances every one came with needles and thimbles and the scissors flew i was too much absorbed in this scheme to ask many questions about the new quarters when i did inquire the general put me off by saying that in a few days i should begin to settle the second evening after the fire he sent for me and asked if i would come and consult with him about some arrangement of the furniture as he was too busy to come after me i started at once but Mary, ever thoughtful of my appearance and deep in the mystery that followed, urged me to put on my other gown. I was unwillingly put into it and went to the new house to find both sets of quarters lighted throughout and the band playing Home Sweet Home. My husband, meeting me, led me in, and to my utter surprise, I found the whole place completely settled, a door cut through into Colonel Tom's quarters, and the garrison assembled at the general's invitation for the housewarming. The pantry was full of good things to eat that Mary had prepared for the supper. Everyone tried, by merry frolic and dancing, to make me forget the catastrophe, and the general, bubbling over with fun, inspired me to join then he told me to what subterfuges he had resorted to get the house ready and repeated to me again that it was never worth while to cry over spilled milk the life of the enlisted men was very dull during the cold weather in the summer they had mounted drill and parades and an occasional scout to vary the life they got very little good out of their horses in the winter. An hour in the morning and another in the afternoon were spent every day in grooming them. The general took me down to the stables sometimes to watch the work. Each horse had the name given to him by his rider printed in home-made letters over his stall. Some of the men were so careful of their horses that they were able to keep them for service during the five years of their enlistment. The daily intercourse of horse and rider quickened the instinct of the brute so that he seemed half human. Indeed, I have seen an old troop horse from whose back a raw recruit had tumbled go through the rest of the drill as correctly as if mounted by a well-trained soldier many of the soldiers love and pet their dumb beasts and if the supply of grain gives out on a campaign they unhesitatingly steal for them as a mother would for a starving child beside every stall hung the saddle and equipments of the trooper and the companies vied with one another in keeping them in perfect condition some of the horses coats shone like satin under the busy currycomb of an attached master. The captain of a company and his first sergeant soon discovered the faults of a horse. When the preparations for a campaign began, it was really laughable to hear the ingenious excuses why an apparently sound horse should be exchanged for another from the fresh supply. In the same way, a soldier who was hopelessly worthless 
was often transferred to another company the officers who had been the recipient of the undesirable soldier would come to the general to complain i could not always keep a straight countenance when the injured captain narrated his wrongs one told of what desperate need he had been in for a tailor he had been proffered this man with many eulogies by a brother officer and the final recommendation given which ensured the acceptance of this seemingly generous offer was he has made clothes for me not until the transfer was effected and a suit of clothes ruined for the captain was he told by his would-be liberal friend the whole story which was oh yes he made clothes for me but i forgot to add i couldn't wear them the general sympathized with the impatience of the enlisted men in their dull life which drove the sergeants to solicit as a privilege the transportation of the mail for a man of my husband's temperament it was easy to understand that danger was more endurable than the dead calm of barrack life the telegraph lines were frequently down and except for the courage of the sergeants we should have been completely isolated from the outside world with four mules and the covered body of a government wagon on bobs they went over a trackless waste of snow for two hundred and fifty miles occasionally there were huts that had once been stage stations where they could stop but it was deadly perilous for them to leave the telegraph line no matter through what drifts they were compelled to plunge the bewilderment of a snowstorm comes very soon an officer lying in the hospital quite crazed from having been lost in attempting to cross a parade ground only large enough for the regiment in line was a fearful warning to these venturesome men if the mail sergeant did not appear when he was due at the end of two weeks the general could scarcely restrain his anxiety he was so concerned for the man's safety that he kept going to the window and door incessantly he spoke to me so often of his fears for him that i used to imagine he would for once express some of his anxiety when the sergeant finally appeared to report but military usage was too deeply bred in the bone of both and the report was made and received with the customary repressed dignity of manner however i have seen my husband follow the man to the door tell him that he had felt great concern about him and renew his directions to take every precaution for his safety how thankful i used to be that i was not hedged in with a soldier's discipline but that i could follow the faithful old trooper and tell him how the general had worried about him and how thankful we all were for his safe return it did not take long for the garrison to discover the poor mules with their tired drooping heads and wilted ears dragging the mail sleigh into the post every officer rushed to the adjutant's office for his mail it was a great event and the letters were hailed with joy an orphan and having no brothers and sisters i must have been the only one who was contented not to get any for my world was there an officer's wife who could hardly wait for news from her lonely delicate mother in the east used to say pathetically realizing the distance that intervened that no one knew what it was to be married to a husband and a mother at the same time as soon as the mail was distributed the general buried himself with the newspapers for several days after he agreed with me that an old engraving called my husband was a faithful likeness of him at such a time the picture represented a man sitting in a chair 
completely hidden except his crossed legs and his hands and clasping an outspread newspaper as soon as the contents were devoured he cut from the illustrated papers comic pictures and adding to them some doggerel sent them in to our witty neighbor as illustrating some joke that had transpired against her with other papers by a little drawing he transposed the figures and likenesses of some of the officers who had been placed previously in some ludicrous position adding marginal comments he left the picture uppermost where they were sure to be seen by the persons for whom they were intended when they came in as usual to look over the papers and magazines in his room a clever lady in a neighboring garrison speaking of the arrival of the mail described how voraciously she seized the new reading matter and closeted herself for hours to read up in advance of the others she felt that having exhausted every other topic she must coach up on something new in spite of the great risks and dangers of the mail carriers their journeys were accomplished without serious accident i used to hear occasionally that the sergeant had levied such a heavy tax upon the citizens of bismarck when he brought small parcels through for them that he had quite a little sum of money for himself by spring End of chapter 11chapter twelve of boots and saddles or life in dakota with general custer by elizabeth custer this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by sue anderson chapter twelve perplexities and pleasures of domestic life the climate of dakota was so fine that those who had been poisoned by malaria in the south became perfectly well after a short residence there sickness was of rare occurrence and because of its infrequency it drew forth lavish sympathy in the autumn a beautiful little girl the daughter of the sutler was brought into the garrison dying with diphtheria there was no law like the city ordinance compelling a warning placard to be placed on the door and it would have been of no avail in keeping her friends away when i begged the heartbroken mother to turn from the last breath of her idol it seemed to me her lot was too hard for human endurance every sorrow seemed much worse out there where we were so unaccustomed to suffering as i looked at the little waxen body prepared for burial lying so like a pretty flower i did not wonder at the mother's grief and despair she was a thousand miles from eastern friends her husband was absent on business and she among strangers at another time when a young mother was caring for her newly born babe the little toddling brother was unfortunately exposed to the cold and fell violently ill with pneumonia every lady came daily to help care for him and at last the officers repeated proffered services were accepted for night nursing i remember watching and admiring the tenderness of a handsome dashing young fellow as he walked the floor with a feverish little sufferer or rocked him patiently until dawn and when i saw him often afterward gliding about in the dance or riding beside some pretty girl i used to think to myself that i could tell his sweetheart something good about him we were all like one family everyone was so quick to sympathize so ready to act if trouble came after the trains had been taken off and winter had fairly set in the young mother whom we all loved was in despair about clothing for her little ones we had reached a land where there were no seamstresses no ready-made clothing and nothing suitable for children money did no good though our friend had an abundance of that 
but busy fingers were needed. The ladies quietly arranged, as a surprise, a sewing bee. We impressed our brother Tom into our service, and taught him to use the sewing machine. A laughing crowd dropped scissors and thimbles at parade time, and followed to the door to watch him hurry on his belt and saber, and take his place, the quintessence then of everything military and manly. A room full of busy women, cutting, basting, making buttonholes, and joining together little garments, soon had a passable outfit for the brave mother's little ones, and even a gown for her own sweet self. I do not remember ever seeing anything quite so dutchy and cumbersome, however, as those little children, dressed in the cobbled-out woolen clothes our ignorant fingers had fashioned. A woman on the frontier is so cherished and appreciated, because she has the courage to live out there, that there is nothing that is not done for her if she be gracious and courteous. In twenty little ways the officers spoiled us. They never allowed us to wait on ourselves, to open or shut a door, to draw up our own chair, or to do any little service that they could perform for us. If we ran to the next house for a chat, with a shawl thrown over our heads, we rarely got a chance to return alone, but with this undignified head covering were formally brought back to our door. I wonder if it will seem that we were foolishly petted, if I reveal that our husbands buttoned our shoes, wrapped us up if we went out, warmed our clothes before the fire, poured the water for our bath out of the heavy pitcher, and studied to do innumerable little services that a maid would have done for us in the States. I don't think it made us helpless, however. In our turn, we watched every chance we could to anticipate their wants. We did a hundred things we would not have remembered to do had not the quickly passing time brought nearer each day those hours of separation when we would have no one to do for. I am sure I never saw more tender men than the officers. One learned to conceal the fact that one was ailing or fatigued, for it made them so anxious. The eyes of Sister Margaret's husband come to me now, full of intense suffering for his wife, as she silently read her home letters telling of our mother Custer's failing strength. She suppressed her weeping until they had retired, and she believed him asleep. She found her mistake when his gentle hands stole softly to her cheeks to feel if they were moistened with tears. So seldom did we hear of an officer's unkindness to his wife that a very old legend used to be revived if a reference to anything of the kind was needed. Before the war, some officer wished to measure the distance of a day's march, and, having no odometer, elected his wife to that office. The length of the revolution of a wheel was taken, a white handkerchief tied to a spoke, and the madam was made to count the rotations all day long. The story seldom failed to fire the blood of the officers when it was told. They agreed that nothing but a long life among Indians and having the treatment of the squaw before him would cause a man to act with such brutality. Domestic care sat very lightly on me. Nothing seemed to annoy my husband more than to find me in the kitchen. He determinedly opposed it for years, and begged me to make a promise that I would never go there for more than a moment. We had such excellent servants that my presence was unnecessary most of the time, but even in the intervals when our fare was wretched, he submitted uncomplainingly rather than that I should be wearied. A great portion of the time, my life was so rough that he knew it taxed me to the utmost, 
and I never forgot to be grateful that I was spared domestic care in garrison. We had so much company that, although I enjoyed it, I sometimes grew weary. When the winter came and there was little to do officially, my husband made every preparation for our receptions, ordered the supplies, planned the refreshment, and directed the servants. The consequence was that I sometimes had as enjoyable a time as if I had been entertained at someone else's house. To prove how much pleasure I had, I recall a speech that the family kept among a collection of my faux pas. They overheard me saying to some of our guests, Don't go home, we are having such a good time. Afterward, the tormenting home circle asked me if it would not have been in a little better taste to let the guests say that. We had such a number of my husband's family in garrison that it required an effort occasionally to prevent our being absorbed in one another. A younger brother came on from Michigan to visit us, and our sister Margaret's husband had a sister and brother at the post. Sometimes we found that nine of us were on one side of the room, deeply interested in conversation. Something would rouse us to a sense of our selfishness, and I was the one sent off to look out the quiet ones at the hop who needed entertaining. If I chanced to be struggling to teach new steps in dancing to feet unaccustomed to anything but march or drill, or strove to animate the one whom all pronounced a bore, the family never failed to note it. They played every sly trick they could to disconcert and tease me, but I did not submit tamely. As soon as I could, I made my way to them, and by threats and intimidations, scattered them to their duty. At the hops, the officers waited long and patiently for the women to dance with them. Sometimes the first waltz they could get during the evening would not come before midnight. I think it would have been very hard for me to have kept a level head with all the attention and delightful flattery which the ordinary manners of officers convey, if I had not remembered how we ladies were always in the minority. The question whether one was old or young, pretty or plain, never seemed to arise with them. I have seen them solicit the honor of taking a grandmama to drive, and even to ride as gallantly as if she were young and fair. No men discover beauty and youth more quickly, but the deference they feel for all women is always apparent. It seemed very strange to me that with all the value that is set on the presence of the women of an officer's family at the frontier posts, the Book of Army Regulations makes no provision for them, but in fact ignores them entirely. It entered into such minute detail in its instructions, even giving the number of hours that bean soup should boil, that it would be natural to suppose that a paragraph or two might be wasted on an officer's wife. The servants and the company laundresses are mentioned as being entitled to quarters and rations and the services of the surgeon. If an officer's wife falls ill, she cannot claim the attention of the doctor, though it is almost unnecessary to say that she has it through his most urgent courtesy. I have even known a surgeon who, from some official difficulty, was not on friendly terms with an officer, go personally and solicit the privilege of prescribing through the illness of his wife, whom he knew but slightly. The officers used, sportively, to look up the rules in the army regulations for camp followers and read them out to us as they would the riot act. In the event of any questions being raised regarding our privileges, we women really came under no other head in the book 
which is the sole authority for our army. If we put down an emphatic foot, declaring that we were going to take some decisive step to which they were justly opposed as involving our safety, perhaps, we would be at once reminded, in a laughingly exultant manner, of the provision of the law. The regulations provide that the commanding officer has complete control over all camp followers, with power to put them off the reservation or detain them as he chooses. Nevertheless, although army women have no visible thrones or scepters, nor any acknowledged rights according to military law, I never knew such queens as they, or saw more willing subjects than they govern. End of chapter 12 Chapter 13 of Boots and Saddles or Life in Dakota with General Custer by Elizabeth Custer. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Sue Anderson. Chapter 13 A Strong Heart Dance. The Indian scouts employed by our government and living at our post belonged to a tribe called the Arikarees. This tribe was small, and though not strong enough in numbers to attack the more powerful Sioux, there was implacable enmity between them and a constant desire for revenge. During the preceding summer, a band of Sioux came to Fort Lincoln and drew the scouts belonging to the infantry garrison out of their quarters by some cunningly devised pretext. No sooner did they appear than they were fired upon by the Sioux. They fought all day, and finally the Rees succeeded in driving their enemies away. All this took place right at the post, where the firing could be seen from the windows. It was not known how many Sioux were killed, for all tribes make extraordinary exertions to carry their dead from the field four only were left after some months the sioux for some reason best known to themselves sent word that they were coming for a treaty the rees prepared to receive them with what they termed a strong heart dance a message inviting the garrison was sent by them through the interpreter and we hailed with relief the variety in our existence this spectacle would afford Indian life was still a novelty to us, for we had not been with any peaceable tribe before coming into Dakota. We stowed ourselves away in long sleighs, which took us to the quarters of the scouts. Their buildings were of logs, and were long and low in construction. Around the walls on the inside were bunks, on which were marks showing the quarters assigned to each family. When the outer door closed upon us, we could scarcely breathe. The atmosphere was stifling and loaded with the odor of smoked meat, tanned skins, and killikinic tobacco. The place was lighted by burning logs in a large fireplace, and the deep shadows threw into high relief the figures that came into the glare of the fire and produced effect from which Doré might have found material for a most powerful work. Before the ceremonies began, we women went round the place to see the papooses in their mother's arms, as they sat in the bunks or on the earthen floor. Each mother held her baby up for our inspection, with as much pride as if there had never been a little one on earth before. The squaws were not permitted to come near the charmed circle in front of the fire where the mimic orchestra beat their drums. They were allowed to sing at a distance and joined in the low monotone of the musicians. At regular intervals, as if keeping time, they jerked out a nasal twanging note, which was emphasized by the coarse voices of the warriors. 
the dancers were naked except for the customary covering over their loins they had attached to their belts beads and metal ornaments some had so fastened to their girdles the feathers from the tail of the wild turkey that they stood up straight as the savages bent over in the evolutions of the dance one leg and arm would be painted bright vermilion or blue and the other a vivid green with cabalistic characters drawn on them in black the faces were hideous being painted in all colors a few had necklaces of bear's claws on which they set great value these hung over the bronze shoulders the claws pointing into the brown skin of their chests one evidently poorer than the rest had a rudely cut shirt made out of an old ham bag on which the trademark and names of the manufacturing firm figured conspicuously as his sole decoration another equally poor wore only the covering over his hips while suspended by a cord from his neck was a huge tin toy horse from the scalp lock of some there was a strip of cloth falling to the ground on which silver discs made of coins were fastened at close intervals in the plate of hair falling to their waists we saw sticks crossed and running through the braid the interpreter explained that these represented coups our attention was arrested at once by a little four-year-old boy who from time to time during the evening was brought to the circle by his mother and left to make his little whirling gyrations around the ring of the dancers it was explained to us that he had won his right to join in the festivities of the tribe when the fight took place the summer before to settle which this treaty was planned of the four sioux left on the battlefield that day one though mortally wounded was not yet dead when the retreat took place a re squaw knowing that it would count her child a coup if he put another wound in the already dying man sent him out and incited the child to plunge a knife into the wounded warrior as a reward he was given the privilege of joining in all celebrations and the right to wear an eagle feather standing straight from the scalp lock of his tiny head we saw the mother's eyes gleam with pride as she watched this miniature warrior admitted among the more mature and experienced braves all the dancers rotated around together for a time their bodies always bent and they howled as they moved in the shadowy gloom only momentarily made brilliant by the flashes of light from the fire these grotesque crouching figures were wild enough for gnomes only occasionally where there was a large mixture of white blood did we see a well-developed figure the legs and arms of indians are almost invariably thin none of them ever do any manual labor to produce muscle and their bones are decidedly conspicuous we were surprised to observe that though dancing in so small a space and weaving in and out in countless figures without an apparent effort to avoid collisions they never interfered or caught their brandished weapons in the ornaments of one another's toggery when a warrior wished to speak he made some sign to the others they then sat down around him and the music ceased he began with a recital of his achievements indians never failed to recapitulate these as a preface to each speech sometimes the speaker's career was illustrated and a cotton sheet was unfolded on which were painted a number of primitive figures he gradually grew more and more earnest his dull eyes glared as he pointed to the scalps he had taken which were even then dangling from his belt finally the warrior began to give presents and to receive them in return as is the custom on those occasions if he gave a pony he declared it by throwing down a stick on which were cut notches that signified the gift 
to the recipient. After several had told their coups, for so they designate their deeds of prowess, one bounded with great energy into the circle. He narrated with spirit how he had revenged the death of two of their band by killing the murderer at the last fight at the post. Before anyone realized it, an old squaw pushed her way violently into the open space, threw down a roll of calico at his feet, and flung off her leggings and blanket as presents in her gratitude, for it was of her husband and son that he spoke. As she was about to complete the gift by removing her last garment, the interpreter, in consideration for us, hurried her out to her bunk in the darkness, and we saw her no more. Last of all, an old Sioux, wrapped in a black mourning blanket, tottered into the circle, and silence settled down on all. He spoke of his son, who had been in the fight, and had fallen bravely, but said that before he was killed he had made many rees bite the dust, as he then figuratively expressed it. Excited by the story of the courage of his offspring, he tottered back to his place, but his pride soon succumbed to his greater sorrow. He buried his head in his blanket when he sank down to his seat. Hardly had he ceased before a young re leaped into the midst of the warriors, threw off his blanket, and with flashing eye plunged into a hurried enumeration of his achievements to prove his courage in days past. Then, striding up to the bereaved father, he said in exultant, imperious tones, Boast no longer of the successes of your dead, I who stand here am he who killed him. The father did not even raise his eyes. The re called out to the listening warriors, Will he not fight me? I stand ready. The old warrior remained unmoved, even under the insolent words of the aggressor. Many years of an eventful life had made him too well versed in and too subservient to the laws of Indian warfare not to know that a strong heart dance bound all in inviolable honor not to break the temporary peace. But he knew that once meeting each other on the open plain, there were no restrictions. When we left the unearthly music, the gloom and the barbaric sights, and breathed pure air again, it seemed as if we had escaped from pandemonium. One morning soon after that, we heard singing, and found that the squaws were surging down from their quarters nearly a mile distant. We had not received a hint of the honor to be conferred, and were mystified when they all halted in front of our house. They had come to give us a dance. It was an unusual occurrence, for the women rarely take part in any but the most menial services. They were headed by Mrs. Long Back, the wife of the chief of the scouts. She was distinguished as the leader by a tall dress hat that had been the property of some society man when he wore civilian dress in the States. They began going around after each other in a jogging, lumbering sort of movement and singing a humdrum song in a minor key. Much of the finery we had seen at the genuine war dance was borrowed from the warriors for this occasion. It was festooned over the figures of the women, already well covered with blankets, and the weight was not calculated to add materially to their grace. The ranking lady had a saber, which her chief had received as a present, and this she waved over the others in command. One woman carried her six-week-old papoose on her back, and its little lolling head rolled from side to side as the mother trotted round and round after the others. During the dance, one of the officer's colored servants rushed out, and in his excitement almost ran his head into the charmed precincts. An infuriated squaw, 
to whom all this mummery was the gravest and most momentous of concerns, flew at him, brandishing a tomahawk over his head. He had no need to cry, Oh, that this too, too solid flesh would melt, for his manner of vanishing was little short of actual evaporation into air. Neither his master nor anyone else saw him for twenty-four hours afterward. When the women stopped their circumvolutions for want of breath, we appeared on the porch and made signs of thanks. They received them with placid self-satisfaction. But the more substantial recognition of the general's thanks, in the shape of a beef, they acknowledged more warmly. End of chapter 13chapter fourteen of boots and saddles or life in dakota with general custer by elizabeth custer this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by sue anderson chapter fourteen garrison life there were about forty in our garrison circle and as we were very harmonious we spent nearly every evening together I think it is the general belief that the peace of an army post depends very much upon the example set by the commanding officer. My husband, in the six years previous, had made it very clear, in a quiet way, that he would much prefer that there should be no conversation detrimental to others in his quarters. It required no effort for him to refrain from talking about his neighbors but it was a great deprivation to me occasionally. Once in a while, when someone had brought down wrath upon his or her head by doing something deserving of censure, the whole garrison was voluble in its denunciation. And if I plunged into the subject also and gave my opinion, I soon noticed my husband grow silent and finally slip away. I was not long in finding an excuse to follow him and ask what I had done. Of course, I knew him too well not to divine that I had hurt him in some manner. Then he would make a renewed appeal to me, beginning by an unanswerable plea, if you wish to please me, and imploring me not to join in discussions concerning any one. He used to assure me that in his heart he believed me superior to such things. In vain I disclaimed being of that exalted order of females, and declared that it required great self-denial not to join in a gossip. The discussion ended by his desiring me to use him as a safety valve if I must criticize others. For motives of policy alone, if actuated by no higher incentive, it seemed wise to suppress one's ebullitions of anger. In the States it is possible to seek new friends if the old ones become tiresome and exasperating. But once in a post like ours, so far removed, there is no one else to whom one can turn. We never went away on leave of absence and heard ladies in civil life say emphatically, that they did not like some person they knew and never would without a start of terror i forgot that their lives were not confined to the small precincts of a territorial post where such avowed enmity is disastrous i had very little opportunity to know much of official matters they were not talked about at home instinct guided me always in detecting the general's enemies and when i found them out a struggle began between us over my manner of treating them my husband urged that it would embarrass him if others found out that i had surmised anything regarding official affairs he wished social relations to be kept distinct and he could not endure to see me show dislike to anyone who did not like him 
i argued in reply that i felt myself dishonest if i even spoke to one whom i hated the contest ended by his appealing to my good sense arguing that as the wife of the commanding officer i belonged to every one and in our house i should be hospitable upon principle as every one visited us there was no escape for me but i do not like to think now of having welcomed any one from whom i inwardly recoiled i was not let off on such occasions with any formal shake of the hand my husband watched me and if i was not sufficiently cordial he gave me afterward in our bedroom a burlesque imitation of my manner i could not help laughing even when annoyed to see him caricature me by advancing coldly extending the tips of his fingers and bowing loftily to some imaginary guest his raillery added to my wish to please him had the effect of making me shake hands so vigorously that i came near erring the other way and being too demonstrative and thus giving the impression that i was the best friend of some one i really dreaded as i was in the tent during so many summers and almost constantly in my husband's library in our winter quarters i naturally learned something of what was transpiring i soon found however that it would do no good if i asked questions in the hope of gaining further information as to curiosities ever being one of my conspicuous faults i do not remember but i do recollect most distinctly how completely i was taken aback by an occurrence which took place a short time after we were married i had asked some idle question about official matters and was promptly informed in a grave manner though with a mischievous twinkle of the eye that whatever information i wanted could be had by application to the adjutant general this was the stereotyped form of endorsement on papers sent up to the regimental adjutant asking for information one incident of many comes to me now proving how little i knew of anything but what pertained to our own home circle the wife of an officer once treated me with marked coldness i was unaware of having hurt her in any way and at once took my grievance to that source where i found sympathy for the smallest woe my husband pondered a moment and then remembered that he and the husband of my friend had had some slight official difficulty and the lady thinking i knew of it was taking her revenge on me when i first entered army life i used to wonder what it meant when i heard officers say in a perfectly serious voice mrs so-and-so commands her husband's company it was my good fortune not to encounter any such female grenadiers a circumstance occurred which made me retire early from any attempt to assume the slightest authority one of the inexhaustible jokes that the officers never permitted me to forget was an occurrence that happened soon after the general took command of the seventh cavalry a soldier had deserted and had stolen a large sum of money from one of the lieutenants my sympathy was so aroused for the officer that i urged him to lose no time in pursuing the man to the nearest town whither he was known to have gone in my interest and zeal i assured the officer that i knew the general would be willing and he need not wait to apply for leave through the adjutant's office i even hurried him away when the general came in i ran to him with my story expecting him to sympathize and endorse all that i had done on the contrary he quietly assured me that he commanded the regiment and that he would like me to make it known to the lieutenant that he must apply through the proper channels for leave of absence 
thereupon i ate a large piece of humble pie but was relieved to find that the officer had shown more sense than i and had not accepted my proffered leave but had prudently waited to write out his application years afterward when my husband told me what a source of pride it was to him that others had realized how little i knew about official affairs and assured me that my curiosity was less than that of any woman he had ever known i took little credit to myself it would have been strange after the drilling of military life if i had not attained some progress the general planned every military action with so much secrecy that we were left to divine as best we could what certain preliminary movements meant one morning when it was too cold for anything but important duty without any explanations he started off with a company of cavalry and several wagons as they crossed the river on the ice we surmised that he was going to bismarck it seemed that the general had been suspicious that the granaries were being robbed and finally a citizen was caught driving off a loaded wagon of oats from the reservation in broad daylight this was about as high-handed an instance of thieving as the general had encountered and he quietly set to work to find out the accomplices in a little while it was ascertained that the robbers had concealed their plunder in a vacant store in the principal street of bismarck the general determined to go himself directly to the town thinking that he could do quickly and without opposition what another might find difficult the better class of citizens honored him too highly to oppose his plan of action even though it was unprecedented for the military to enter a town on such an errand the general knew the exact place at which to halt and drew the company up in line in front of the door he demanded the key and directed the men to transfer the grain to the wagons outside without a protest or an exchange of words even the troops marched out of the town as quietly as they had entered this ended the grain thefts it was a surprise to me that after the life of excitement my husband had led he should grow more and more domestic in his tastes his daily life was very simple he rarely left home except to hunt and was scarcely once a year in the sutler's store where the officers congregated to play billiards and cards if the days were too stormy or too cold for hunting as they often were for a week or more at a time he wrote and studied for hours every day we had the good fortune to have a billiard table loaned us by the sutler and in the upper room where it was placed my husband and i had many a game when he was weary with writing the general sometimes sketched the outline of my pictures which i was preparing to paint for he drew better than i did and gladly availed himself of a chance to secure variety of occupation the relatives of the two young housemaids whom we had in our service regretted that they were missing school so the general had the patience to teach them the day rarely passed that colonel tom my husband and i did not have a game of romps the grave orderly who sat by the hall door used to be shocked to see the commanding officer in hot pursuit of us up the steps the quick transformation which took place when he was called from the frolic to receive the report of the officer of the day was something ridiculous occasionally he joined those who gathered in our parlor every evening he had a very keen sense of his social responsibilities as post commander and believed that our house should be open at all hours to the garrison his own studious habits made it a deprivation if he gave up much of his time to entertaining i learned that in no way could i relieve him so much 
as by being always ready to receive he grew to expect that i would be in the parlor at night and would plan whatever diversions we had i managed to slip away several times in the evening and go to him for a little visit or possibly a waltz while the rest danced in the other room if i delayed going to him while absorbed in the general amusement a knock at the door announced the orderly carrying a note for me these missives always reminded me of my forgetfulness in some ingenious arrangement of words when i laughed outright over one of these little scraps our friends begged me to share the fun with them it was only a line and read do you think i am a confirmed monk of course they insisted laughingly upon my going at once to the self-appointed hermit we spent the days together almost uninterruptedly during the winter the garrison gave me those hours and left us alone my husband had arranged my sewing chair and work basket next to his desk and he read to me constantly at one time we had read five authorities on napoleon whose military career was a never-ending source of interest to him he studied so carefully that he kept the atlas before him and marked the course of the two armies of the french and english with pencils of different color one of his favorite books was a life of daniel webster given him in the states by a dear friend anything sad moved him so that his voice choked with emotion and i have known him to lay down the book and tell me he could not go on one of the many passages in that beautifully written book which my husband thought the most utterly pathetic of all was the tribute an old farmer had paid to the dead statesman looking down upon the face of the orator for the last time the old man says in soliloquy ah daniel the world will be lonesome now you are gone i became so accustomed to this quiet life in the library with my husband that i rarely went out if i did begin the rounds of our little circle with our girl friend whom every one besought to visit them an orderly soon followed us up without the glint of a smile and in exactly the tone of a man giving the order for a battle he said the general presents his compliments and would like to know when he shall send the trunks i recollect a message of this sort being once brought to us when we were visiting an intimate friend by the tallest most formidable soldier in the regiment it was a mystery to us how he managed to deliver his errand without moving a muscle of his face he presented the compliments of the commanding officer and added he sent you these we did not trust ourselves to look up at his lofty face but took from his extended hands two bundles of white muslin there was no mistaking the shape they were our night dresses when we hurried home and took the general to task for making us face the solemn orderly he only replied by asking if we had intended to stay forever pointing to his open watch and speaking of the terrors of solitary confinement it was the custom at guard mount every morning to select the cleanest most soldierly looking man for duty as orderly for the post commander it was considered the highest honor and really was something of a holiday as the man detailed for this duty had but little to do and then had his night in bed otherwise belonging to the guard and being newly appointed every twenty-four hours he would have been obliged to break his rest to go on picket duty at intervals all night there was great strife to get this position and it was difficult for the adjutant to make the selection he sometimes carried his examination so far 
as to try and find dust on the carbines with his cambric handkerchief guard mount in pleasant weather with the adjutant and officer of the day in full uniform each soldier perfect in dress with a band playing was a very interesting ceremony in dakota's severe cold it looked like a parade of animals at the zoo all were compelled to wear buffalo overcoats and shoes fur caps and gloves when the orderly removed these heavy outside wraps however he stood out as fine a specimen of manhood as one ever sees his place in our hall was near the stove and on the table by his side were papers and magazines many of which were sent by the young men's christian association of new york the general had once met the secretary of the society and in response to his inquiry about reading matter he impressed him by a strong statement of what a treasure anything of the kind was at an isolated post there was usually a variety of reading matter but one day the orderly stole out to the cook with a complaint he asked for the general's turf field and farm or wilkes spirit of the times which he was accustomed to find awaiting him and confessed that those pious papers were too bigoted for him he usually sat still all day only taking an occasional message for the general or responding to a beckoning invitation from mary's brown finger at the kitchen door there he found a little offering from her of home things to eat occasionally in the evening the general forgot to dismiss him at taps after that a warning cough issued from the hall when this had been repeated several times my husband used to look up so merrily and say to me it was remarkable how temporary consumption increased after the hour of bedtime had come when the general had a message to send he opened his door and rattled off his order so fast that it was almost impossible for one unacquainted with his voice to understand if i saw the dazed eyes of a new soldier i divined that probably he did not catch a word without the general's noticing it i slipped through our room into the hall and translated the message to him when i returned and gave my husband the best imitation i could of the manner in which he spoke when hurried and described the orderly standing rubbing his perplexed head over the unintelligible gibberish he threw himself on the lounge in peals of laughter while we were in the states sometimes he was invited to address audiences but being unaccustomed to public speaking and easily embarrassed he made very droll attempts he realized that he had not the gift of oratory and i used to wish that he would practice the art i insisted that if he continued to speak so fast in public i would be obliged to stand beside him on the platform as interpreter for his hearers or else take my position in the audience and send him a sign of warning from there i proposed to do something so startling that he could not help checking his mad speech he was so earnest about everything he did i assured him no ordinary signal would answer and we finished the laughing discussion by my volunteering to rise in the audience the next time he spoke and raise an umbrella as a warning to slacken up end of chapter fourteen Chapter 15 of Boots and Saddles, or Life in Dakota with General Custer, by Elizabeth Custer. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Sue Anderson. Chapter 15, General Custer's Literary Work. 
when my husband began to write for publication it opened to him a world of interest and afterward proved an unfailing source of occupation in the long dakota winters i think he had no idea when it was first suggested to him that he could write when we were in new york several years before he told me how perfectly surprised he was to have one of the magazine editors seek him out and ask him to contribute articles every month and a few days after he said i begin to think the editor does not imagine that i am hesitating about accepting his offer because i doubt my ability as a writer but because he said nothing about payment at first for today he added not yet over his surprise at what seemed to him a large sum he came again and offered me a hundred dollars for each contribution we at once seemed to ourselves bonanzas many times afterward we enjoyed intensely the little pleasures and luxuries given us by what his pen added to the family exchequer on the frontier where the commanding officer keeps open house he has little opportunity to have more than a passing glimpse of his pay accounts so quickly do they go to settle table expenses it made very little difference to us though our tastes became more simple each year that we lived so much out of doors there was little dress competition in garrison and in no way could we enjoy the general's salary more than in entertaining at our first post after the war the idle tediousness of the life was in such contrast to the whirl and dash of the years just past that the days seemed insupportable to my husband while there we entertained a charming officer of the old school his experience and age made me venture to speak to him confidentially of the sympathy i felt for the aimlessness of my husband's life i was in despair trying to think of some way in which to vary the monotony for though he said little i could see how he fretted and chafed under such an existence the old officer appreciated what i told him and after thinking seriously for a time urged me to try and induce him to explore new territory and write descriptive articles for publication when the actual offer came afterward it seemed to me heaven sent i used every persuasive argument in my power to induce him to accept i thought only of its filling up the idle hours i believed that he had the gait of a ready writer for though naturally reticent he could talk remarkably well when started i had learned to practice a little stratagem in order to draw him out i used to begin a story and purposely bungle so that in despair he would take it up and in rapid graphic sentences place the whole scene before us afterward he was commended for writing as he talked and making his descriptions of plains life pen pictures the general said to me that it was with difficulty he suppressed a smile when his publisher remarked to him that his writing showed the result of great care and painstaking the truth was he dashed off page after page without copying or correcting he had no dates or journal to aid him but trusted to his memory to take him back over a period of sixteen years i sat beside him while he wrote and sometimes thought him too intent on his work to notice my going away he would follow shortly and declare that he would not write another line unless i returned this was an effectual threat for he was constantly behind and even out there heard the cry for copy which the printer's devil is always represented as making i never had anything to do with his writing except to be the prod which drove him to begin 
he used to tell me that on some near date he had promised an article and would ask me solemnly to declare to him that i would give him no peace until he had prepared the material in vain i replied that to accept the position of nag and torment was far from desirable he exacted the promise when he was in the mood for writing we used laughingly to refer to it to each other as genius burning at such times we printed on a card this is my busy day and hung it on the door it was my part to go out and propitiate those who objected to the general shutting himself up to work while my father lived he used to ask me if i realized what an eventful life i was leading and never ceased to inquire in his letters if i was keeping a journal when the most interesting portions of our life were passing each day represented such a struggle on my part to endure the fatigues and hardships that i had no energy left to write a line when the evening came my husband tried for years to incite me to write and besought me to make an attempt as i sat by him while he worked i greatly regret that i did not for if i had i would not now be entirely without notes or dates and obliged to trust wholly to memory for events of our life eleven years ago when my husband returned from the east in the spring of eighteen seventy six he had hardly finished his greeting before he said let me get a book that i have been reading and which i have marked for you while he sought it in his travelling bag i brought one to him telling him that i had underlined much of it for him and even though it was a novel and he rarely read novels he must make this book an exception what was our surprise to find that we had selected the same story and marked many of the same passages one sentiment which the general had enclosed with double brackets in pencil was a line spoken by the hero who is an author he begs the heroine to write magazine articles assuring her she can do far better than he ever did once when on leave of absence the general dined with an old officer whose high character and long experience made whatever he said of real value he congratulated my husband on his success as a writer but added with a twinkle in his eye custer they say that your wife wrote the magazine articles if they say that replied my husband they pay me the highest compliment that i could possibly receive ah well replied the generous friend whoever wrote them they certainly reflect great credit on the family my husband wrote much but was not a voluble talker as i have said most of the entertaining devolved upon me and the fact that i often spoke of the scenes in his life on the plains that we had shared together must have been the reason why some persons listening to the oft-repeated stories ascribed the book to me as for my congratulations the very highest meed of praise i could give him was that he had not taken the opportunity offered in describing his life in the book to defend himself against the unjust charges of his enemies i had found that they expected and dreaded it for the pen is mightier than the sword and military people are quick to realize it my husband appreciated my having noticed what he studied to avoid though while i commended i frankly owned i could not have been equal to the task of resisting what could not but be a temptation to retaliate End of chapter fifteen chapter sixteen of boots and saddles or life in dakota with general custer by elizabeth custer 
This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Sue Anderson. Chapter 16 Indian Depredations. Long after the flowers were blooming in the States, the tardy spring began to appear in the far north. The snow slowly melted, and the ice commenced to thaw on the river. For a moment it would be a pleasure to imagine the privilege of again walking out on the sod without peril of freezing. The next instant, the dread of the coming campaign, which summer is almost certain to bring to a cavalry command, filled every thought and made me wish that our future life could be spent where the thermometer not only went down to twenty degrees below zero, but remained there. When I spied the first tiny blade of grass, I used to find myself acting like a child and grinding the innocent green with my heel back from where it sprang. The first bunch of flowers that the soldiers brought me, long before the ground had begun to take on even a faint emerald tint, were a variety of anemone, a bit of blue set deep down in a cup of outer petals of gray. These were so thick and fuzzy they looked like a surrounding of gray blanket, and well the flowers needed such a protection on the bleak hills where they grew. They were a great novelty, and I wanted to go and seek them myself, but in reply my husband gave me the strictest injunction not to step outside the garrison limits. We had received warning only a short time before that the Indians had crawled out of their winter teepees, and we knew ourselves to be so surrounded that it became necessary to station pickets on the high ground at the rear of the post. On the first mild day, my husband and I rode over to the opposite bank of the river, which was considered the safe side. Thinking ourselves secure from danger there, we kept on further than we realized. A magnificent black-tailed deer, startled by our voices and laughter, and yet too well hidden by the underbrush to see us, resorted to a device habitual with deer, when they wished to see over an extent of country. He made a leap straight into the air, his superb head turned to us searchingly. He seemed hardly to touch the earth as he bounded away. It was too great a temptation to resist. We did not follow far, though, for we had neither dogs nor gun. Scarcely any time elapsed before an officer and a detachment of men riding over the ground where we had started the deer, but obliged to pursue their way further up the valley as they were on duty, came to a horrible sight. The body of a white man was staked out on the ground and disemboweled. There yet remained the embers of the smoldering fire that had consumed him. If the Indians are hurried for time, and cannot stay to witness the prolonged torture of their victim, it is their custom to pinion the captive and place hot coals on his vitals. The horror and fright this gave us women lasted for a time, and rendered unnecessary the continued warning of our husbands about walking outside the line of the pickets. Even with all the admonitions, we began to grow desperate and chafed under the imprisonment that confined us to a little square of earth month in and month out. One day, temptation came suddenly upon us as three of us were loitering on the outskirts of the post. The soldier who drove our traveling wagon, the imperturbable Berkman, came near. We cajoled him into letting us get in and take ever so short a turn down the valley. Delighted to have our freedom again, we wheedled the good-natured man to go a little and a little further. At last even he, amiable as he was, refused to be coaxed any longer, and he turned around. We realized then how far away we were. 
but we were not so far that we could not plainly discover a group of officers on the veranda at our quarters they were gesticulating wildly and beckoned us with all their might as we drove nearer we could almost see by a certain movement of the lower jaw that the word being framed was one that seems to be used in all climates for extreme cases of aggravation they were all provoked and caught us out of the carriage and set us down after a little salute for all the world like mothers i have seen who received their children from narrow escapes with alternate shakings and hugs it seemed hard to tell whether anger or delight predominated in vain we made excuses when order was restored and we could all speak articulately we were then solemnly sworn each one separately never to do such a foolhardy thing again the government had made a special appropriation for rations to be distributed through the officers to the suffering farmers throughout minnesota and dakota whose crops had been destroyed by grasshoppers since we were on the side of the river with the warlike indians we knew of but one ranch near us it was owned by an old man who had been several times to the general for assistance he was a man of extraordinary courage for he had located his claim too far away from any one to be able to obtain assistance if he needed it he never left his home except to bring into market the skins that he had trapped or his crops when the season was profitable he was so quaint and peculiar and so very grateful for the help given him that my husband wanted me to hear him express his thanks the next time he came the door into our room was left open in order that i might listen to what otherwise he would have been too shy to utter he blessed the general in the most touching and solemn manner the tears were in his eyes and answering ones rose in my husband's for no old person failed to appeal to his sympathies and recall his own aged parents referring to some domestic troubles that he had previously confided to the general he spoke of their having driven him beyond the pale of civilization when he was old and feeble compelled him to take his dinner of herbs in a deserted spot at this point in his narrative the door was significantly shut and i was thus made aware that the gratitude part was all that i was to be permitted to hear my husband considered his confidence sacred we knew that the old man lived a hermit's life entirely alone the year through in the blizzards he could not leave his doorstep without being in danger of freezing to death some time after this a scout brought word that during the spring he had passed the ranch and nothing was to be seen of the old man the general suspected something wrong and took a company himself to go to the place he found that the indians had been there had dismantled and robbed the house driven off the cattle and horses and strewn the road with plunder on the stable floor lay the body of the harmless old man his silvery hair lying in a pool of blood where he had been beaten to death they were obliged to return and leave his death unavenged for by the time the first news reached us the murderers were far away end of chapter sixteen Chapter 17 of Boots and Saddles or Life in Dakota with General Custer by Elizabeth Custer. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Sue Anderson. Chapter 17 A Day of Anxiety and Terror. When the air became milder, it was a delight, after our long housing, to be able to dawdle on the piazza the valley below us was beginning to show a tinge of verdure several hundred mules belonging to the supply wagon train dotted the turf and nibbled as best they could 
the sprouting grass half a dozen citizens lounged on the sod sleepily guarding the herd for these mules were hired by the government from a contractor one morning we were walking back and forth looking as we never tired of doing down the long level plain when we were startled by shouts we ran to the edge of the piazza and saw the prisoners who had been working outside the post and the guard who had them in charge coming in at a double quick a hatless and breathless herder dashed up to the officer on an unsaddled mule with blanched face and protruding eyeballs he called out that the indians were running off the herd the general came hastily out just in time to see a cloud of dust rising through a gap in the bluffs marking the direction taken by the stampeded mules instantly he shouted with his clear voice to the bugler to sound the call boots and saddles and keep it up until he told him to stop the first notes of the trumpet had hardly sounded before the porches of the company quarters and the parade were alive with men everyone without stopping to question rushed from the barracks and officers quarters to the stables the men threw their saddles on their horses and galloped out to the parade ground soldiers who were solely on garrison duty and to whom no horse was assigned stole whatever ones they could find even those of the messengers tied to the hitching posts others vaulted barebacked onto mules some were in jackets others in their flannel shirt sleeves many were hatless and occasionally a head was tied up with a handkerchief it was anything but a military looking crowd but everyone was ready for action and such spirited looking creatures it is rarely one's lot to see finding the reason for the hasty summons when they all gathered together they could hardly brook even a few moments delay the general did not tarry to give any but brief directions he detailed an officer to remain in charge of the garrison and left him some hurried instructions he stopped to caution me again not to go outside the post and with a hasty good-bye flung himself into the saddle and was off the command spurred their horses toward the opening in the bluff not a quarter of a mile away through which the last mules had passed in twenty minutes from the first alarm the garrison was emptied and we women stood watching the cloud of dust that the hoofs of the regimental horses had stirred as they hurled themselves through the cleft in the hills we had hardly collected our senses before we found that we were almost deserted as a rule there are enough soldiers on garrison duty who do not go on scouts to protect the post but in the mad haste of the morning and impelled by indignant fury at having the herd swept away from under their very noses as it were all this home guard had precipitously left without permission fortunately for them and his own peace of mind regarding our safety the general did not know of this until he returned besides the officers never dreamed the pursuit would last for more than a mile or so as they had been so quick in preparing to follow after our gasping and wild heart-beating had subsided a little we realized that in addition to our anxiety for those who had just left us we were in peril ourselves the women with one instinct gathered together although indians rarely attack a post directly the pickets that were stationed on the low hills at the rear of the garrison had been fired upon previously we also feared that the buildings would be set on fire by the wily creeping savages it was even thought that the running off of the herd was but a ruse to get the garrison out in order to attack the post of course we knew that only a portion of the indians had produced the stampede and we feared that the remainder were waiting to continue the depredations and were aware of our depleted numbers huddled together in an inner room 
we first tried to devise schemes for secreting ourselves. The hastily built quarters had then no cellars. How we regretted that a cave had not been prepared in the hill back of us for hiding the women in emergencies. Our means of escape by the river were uncertain, as the ferry boat was in a shocking condition. Besides, the citizens in charge would very naturally detain the boat upon some pretext on the safe side of the river. Finally, nervous and trembling over these conferences, we returned to the piazza and tried to think that it was time for the return of the regiment. Our house being the last in the line and commanding an extended view of the valley, we kept our lookout there. Each one of us took turns in mounting the porch railing, and, held there in place by the others, fixed the field glass on the little spot of earth through which the command had vanished. With a plaintive little laugh, one of our number called out the inquiry that has symbolized all beleaguered women from time immemorial. Sister Anne, do you see anyone coming? all of us scanned the horizon unflaggingly we knew the indian mode of taking observation they pile a few stones on the brow of the hill after dark before dawn they creep up stealthily from the further side and hiding behind the slight protection watch all day long with unwearying patience these little picket posts of theirs were scattered all along the bluffs we scarcely allowed ourselves to take our eyes off them. Once in a while, one of our group on watch called out that something was moving behind the rocks. Chairs were brought out and placed beside her in order that a second pair of eyes might confirm the statement. This threw our little shivering group into new panics. There was a window in the servants' room at the rear of the house to and from which we ascended and descended all day long. I do not think the actual fear of death was thought of so much as the all-absorbing terror of capture. Our regiment had rescued some white women from captivity in Kansas, and we never forgot their stories. One of our number became so convinced that their fate awaited us that she called a resolute woman to one side to implore her to promise that when the Indians came into the post, she would put a bullet through her heart before she carried out her determination to shoot herself. We sincerely discussed whether, in extreme danger, we could be counted upon to load and fire a carbine. It would be expected that army women would know a great deal about firearms. I knew but few who did. I never even went into the corner of my husband's library where he kept his stand of unloaded arms, if I could help it. I am compelled to confess that the holster of a pistol gave me a shiver. One of our ladies, however, had a little of the Molly Pitcher spirit. She had shot at a mark, and she promised to teach us to put in the cartridges and discharge the piece. We were filled with envy because she produced a tiny Remington pistol that heretofore she had carried in her pocket when traveling in the States. It was not much larger than a lead pencil, and we could not help doubting its power to damage. She did not insist that it would kill, but even at such a time we had to laugh at the vehement manner in which she declared that she could disable the leg of an enemy. She seemed to think that sufficient pluck would be left to finish him afterward. The officer who had remained in command was obliged to see that the few troopers left were armed, and afterward he visited the pickets. Then he came to us and tried to quiet our fears, and from that time his life became a burden. We questioned twenty times his idea of where he thought the command had gone, when it would come back, and such other aimless queries as only the ingenuity of frightened women can devise. He
he was driven almost desperate in assuring us that he hoped there was no immediate danger he asked us to remember that the infantry post was near enough to give assistance if we needed it alas that post seemed miles away and we believed the gullies that intervened between the two garrisons would be filled with indians after a prolonged season of this experience the officer tried to escape and go to his quarters we were really so anxious and alarmed that he had not the heart to resist our appeals to him to remain near and so that long day dragged away about five o'clock in the afternoon a faint haze arose on the horizon we could hardly restrain our uneasy feet we wanted to run up over the bluff to discover what it meant we regretted that we had given our word of honor that we would not leave the limits of the post soon after the mules appeared traveling wearily back through the same opening in the bluffs through which so many hours before they had rushed headlong we were bitterly disappointed to find only a few soldiers driving them and they gave but little news when the regiment overtook the stock these men had been detailed to return with the recaptured animals to the garrison the command had pushed on in pursuit of the indians the night set in and still we were in suspense we made a poor attempt to eat dinner we knew that none of the regiment had taken rations with them and several of the officers had not even breakfasted there was nothing for us to do but to remain together for the night from this miserable frame of mind we were thrown into a new excitement but fortunately not of fear we heard the sound of the band ringing out on the still evening air every woman was instantly on the piazza from an entirely different direction from that in which they had left the regiment appeared marching to the familiar notes of gary owen such a welcome as met them the relief from the anxiety of that unending day was inexpressible when the regiment was nearing the post the general had sent in an orderly to bring the band out to meet them he cautioned him to secrecy because he wished to have a joyous release from the suspense he knew we had endured the regiment had ridden twenty miles out as hard as the speed of the horses would allow the general and one other officer mounted like himself on a kentucky thoroughbred found themselves far in advance and almost up to some of the indians seeing themselves so closely pressed they resorted to the cunning of their race to escape they threw themselves from their ponies and plunged into the underbrush of a deep ravine where no horse could follow the ponies were captured but it was useless to try any further pursuit all the horses were fagged and the officers and men were suffering from the want of food and water when the herders were questioned next day it was found that the indians had started the stampede by riding suddenly up from the river where they had been concealed uttering the wildest yells they each swung a buffalo robe about the ears of the easily excited mules an astonishing collection of maimed and halt appeared the next morning neither men nor officers had been in the saddle during the winter this sudden ride of so many miles without preparation had so bruised and stiffened their joints and flesh that they could scarcely move naturally when they sat down it was with the groans of old men when they rose they declared they would stand perpetually until they were again limber and their injuries healed as for the officer who had been left behind he insisted that their fate was infinitely preferable to his we heard that he said to the others in confidence that should he ever be detailed to command a garrison 
where agitated women were left, he would protest and beg for active duty, no matter if his life itself were in jeopardy. End of chapter 17「Eighteen of Boots and Saddles, or Life in Dakota with General Custer, by Elizabeth Custer. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Sue Anderson. Chapter 18 Improvements at the Post and Gardening. The General began, as soon as the snow was off the ground, to improve the post young cottonwood trees the only variety that would grow in that soil were transplanted from the river bank they are so full of sap that i have seen the leaves come out on the logs that had been cut some time and were in use as the framework of our camp huts this vitality even when the roots were dying deceived us into building hopes that all the trees we planted would live we soon found by experience however that it was not safe to regard a few new leaves as a sure augury of the long life of these trees it would have been difficult to estimate how many barrels of water were poured around their roots during the summer a few of them survived even during the dry season and we watched them with great interest one day my husband called me to the door with a warning finger to come softly he whispered to me to observe a bird perched on a branch trying to get under the shade of two or three tiny leaflets that were struggling to live such a harbinger of hope made us full of bright anticipations of the day when our trees would cast a broad shadow no one who has not experienced it can dream what it is to live so many years in a glare as we did many of the officers were almost blind from time to time owing to the reflection of the sand over which they marched and which they were surrounded in camp and garrison i once asked a friend who had crossed the plains several times what she would prefer above everything else on the march when she replied a tree i agreed with her that nothing else could have been such a blessing my husband felt that any amount of care spent on the poor little saplings would be labor well bestowed if we were ordered away he knew that others coming after us stationed in that dreary waste would derive the benefit several years afterward i was assured that someone was reaping his sowing for a large leaf was enclosed to me in an envelope and a word added to explain that it was from the tree in front of our quarters on the opposite side of the missouri river except for the scattered underbrush along the banks there was a stretch of country for eighty miles eastward without a tree and with hardly a bush the only one i knew of on our side of the river i could not help calling a genuine ancestral tree it was a burying place for the indians we counted seventeen of them that were lashed to boards and laid across the main branches and there securely fastened so that a tornado could not dislodge them much as we longed to enjoy what had become by its rarity a novelty the sitting under the shade of green trees and hearing the sound of the wind through the foliage not one of us could be induced to tarry under those sepulchral boughs the struggles to make the grass grow on the sandy parade ground were unceasing not only would it have been an improvement to the post in its general appearance but it would certainly have added materially to our comfort how we longed to escape from the clouds of dust that the unceasing wind took up in straight whirling eddies and then 
wafted in great sheets of murky yellow into our doors and windows making our eyes smart and throats raw and parched as alkaline sand can do so effectually the general sent east for grass seed which with oats was sown over and over again our referee on all agricultural questions assured us that the oats sprouted so soon the oncoming blades of grass would be protected he was so enthusiastically in earnest that he seemed to be studying the soil at all hours of the day to detect a verdant tinge one moonlight night we were attracted to the gallery by seeing him stalking slowly back and forth waving his arms in apparent gesticulation of speech as he traversed the length of the parade ground some said in explanation that the moon was at that stage when reason totters on her throne most readily another declared that having become tired of the career of a mars he had resumed his old role as a statesman and was practicing addressing his imaginary constituents all were wrong the faithful promoter of the general good was sowing oats again doubtless hoping that the witchery of the moonlight would be a potent spell to induce their growth even after such indefatigable efforts the soil refused to encourage the sprouting of more than occasional patches of pallid green a portion of ground near the river was assigned the companies for their gardens and there were enough soldiers looking forward to the result who counted it no hardship to plant dig and weed all this tilling of the soil inspired our energies and a corner of our own yard was prepared a high fence was put up so that the stag hounds which make such incredible leaps could not scale the enclosure the household even gathered about the general to see him drop the seed so full of interest were we all long before it was time to look for sprouting we made daily pilgrimages to the corner and peered through the fence the general colonel tom and i watered weeded and watched the little bit of earth the cook and housemaid took our places and resumed our work when we ceased never was a patch of terra firma so guarded and cared for at last mary became impatient and even turned the tiny sprouts upside down putting the plants back after examining the roots her watch was more vigilant than ours and she actually surprised the general one morning by putting beside him a glass of radishes it was really a sensation in our lives to have raised them ourselves and we could not help recalling the pitiful statement of a dear friend who also belonged to a mounted regiment that she had planted gardens for twelve successive springs but had never been stationed long enough in one place to reap the benefit of a single attempt of course being naturally so sanguine as a family we began in imagination almost to taste the oncoming beets turnips etc we reckoned too hastily however for a perfect army of grasshoppers appeared one day they came in swarms and when we looked up at the sun we seemed to be gazing through clouded air absorbed in this curious sight we forgot our precious garden but colorado tom remembered and insisted upon trying an experiment recommended in print by a minnesota farmer seizing some tins from the kitchen and followed by the servants and their mistress all armed in the same manner he adopted the advice of the newspaper paragraph and beat the metal with perfectly deafening noise around the small enclosure had grasshoppers been sensitive to sound it would have ended in our triumph as it was they went on peacefully and stubbornly eating every twig in our sight 
having finished everything they soared away carrying on their departing wings our dreams of radishes and young beets the company gardens were demolished in the same manner and everyone returned for another year to the tiresome diet of canned vegetables i remember the look of amazement that came into the face of a luxurious citizen when i told him that we gave a dinner at once if we had the good fortune to get anything rare and pray what did you call a rarity he responded i was obliged to own that over a plebeian cabbage we have had a real feast once in a while one was reluctantly sold us in bismarck for a dollar and fifty cents we used condensed milk and as for eggs they were the greatest of luxuries in the autumn we brought from st paul several cases but five hundred miles of jostling made great havoc with them the recipe books were exasperating they invariably called for cream and fresh eggs and made the cook furious it seemed to me that some officer's servant on the frontier must have given the recipe for waffles for it bears the indefinite tone of the darky eggs just as you has em honey a sprinkling of flour as you can hold in your hand milk well cordin to what you has the crystallized eggs put up in airtight cans kept a long time and were of more use to us than any invention of the day in drying the egg the yolks and whites were mixed together and nothing could be made of this preparation when the two parts were required to be used separately it made very good batter cakes however and at first it seemed that we could never get enough in the spring when it was no longer safe to hunt we had to return to beef as we had no other kind of meat my husband never seemed to tire of it however and suggested to one of our friends who had the hackneyed motto in his dining room that he change it to give us this day our daily beef once only in all those years of frontier life i had strawberries they were brought to me as a present from st paul the day they came there were as usual a number of our friends on the piazza i carefully counted noses first and hastily went in before anyone else should come to divide the small supply into infinitesimal portions i sent the tray out by the maid and was delayed a moment before following her my husband stepped inside his face as pleased as a child over the surprise but at the same time his eyes hastily scanning the buttery shelves for more berries when i found that in that brief delay another officer had come upon the porch and that the general had given him his dish i was greatly disappointed in vain my husband assured me in response to my unanswerable appeal asking him why he had not kept them himself that it was hardly his idea of hospitality i was only conscious of the fact that having been denied them all these years he had after all lost his only strawberry feast this doubtless seems like a very trifling circumstance to chronicle and much less to have grieved over but there are those who having ventured eight miles for a lemon have gained some faint idea what temporary deprivations are when such a life goes on year after year and one forgets even the taste of fruit and fresh vegetables it becomes an event when they do appear end of chapter eighteen chapter nineteen of boots and saddles or life in dakota with general custer by elizabeth custer this librivox recording is in the public domain 
Recording by Sue Anderson. Chapter 19 General Custer's Library. The order came early in the season to rebuild our burned quarters, and the suggestion was made that the general should plan the interior. He was wholly taken up with the arrangement of the rooms in order that they might be suitable for the entertainment of the garrison. Even though he did not enter into all the post gaiety, he realized that ours would be the only house large enough for the accommodation of all the garrison, and that it should belong to every one. It was a pleasure to watch the progress of the building, and when the quartermaster gave the order for a bay window to please me, I was really grateful. The window not only broke the long line of the parlor wall, but varied the severe outlines of the usual type of army quarters. On one side of the hall were the general's library, our room, and dressing room. The parlor was opposite and was thirty-two feet in length. It opened with sliding doors into the dining room, and still beyond was the kitchen. Upstairs there was a long room for the billiard table, and we had sleeping rooms and servants' rooms besides. To our delight, we could find a place for everybody. Space was about all we had, however. There was not a modern improvement. The walls were unpapered and not even tinted. The windows went up with a struggle and were held open by wooden props. Each room had an old-fashioned box stove, such as our grandfathers gathered round in country schoolhouses. We had no well or cistern, and not even a drain, and the sun poured in, unchecked by a blind of even primitive shape. It was a palace, however, compared with what we had been accustomed to in other stations, and I know we were too contented to give much thought to what the house lacked. My husband was enchanted to have a room entirely for his own use. Our quarters had heretofore been too small for him to have any privacy in his work. He was like a rook in the sly manner in which he made raids on the furniture scattered through the rooms and carried off the best of everything to enrich his corner of the house. He filled it with the trophies of the chase. Over the mantel, a buffalo's head plunged, seemingly, out of the wall. Buffaloes were rare in Dakota, but this was one the general had killed from the only herd he had seen on the campaign. The head of the first grizzly that he had shot, with its open jaws and great fang-like teeth, looked fiercely down on the pretty, meek-faced jackrabbits on the mantel. My husband greatly valued the bear's head, and in writing to me of his hunting had said of it, I have reached the height of a hunter's fame. I have killed a grizzly. Several antelope head were also on the walls. One had a mark in the throat where the general had shot him at a distance of six hundred yards. The head of a beautiful black-tailed deer was another souvenir of a hunt the general had made with bloody knife, the favorite Indian scout. When they sighted the deer, they agreed to fire together the Indian selecting the head, the general taking the heart. They fired simultaneously, and the deer fell, the bullets entering head and heart. The scout could not repress a grunt of approval, as the Indian considers the white man greatly his inferior as a hunter or a marksman. A sand hill crane, which is very hard to bring down, stood on a pedestal by itself. A mountain eagle, a yellow fox, and a tiny fox with a brush, called out there a swift, were disposed of in different corners. Over his desk, claiming a perch by itself on a pair of deer antlers, was a great white owl. On the floor before the fireplace, where he carried his love of building fires so far as to put on the logs himself, was spread the immense skin of a grizzly bear. On a wide lounge at one side of the room, my husband used to throw himself down on the cover of a Mexican blanket, often with a dog 
for his pillow. The camp chairs had the skins of beavers and American lions thrown over them. A stand for arms in one corner held a collection of pistols, hunting knives, Winchester and Springfield rifles, shotguns and carbines, and even an old flintlock musket as a variety. From antlers above hung sabers, spurs, riding whips, gloves and caps, field glasses, the map case, and the great compass used on marches. One of the sabers was remarkably large, and when it was given to the general during the war, it was accompanied by the remark that there was doubtless no other arm in the service that could wield it. My husband was next to the strongest man while at West Point, and his life after that had only increased his power. The saber was a Damascus blade, and made of such finely tempered steel that it could be bent nearly double. It had been captured during the war, and looked as if it might have been handed down from some Spanish ancestor. On the blade was engraved a motto in that high-flown language which ran, Do not draw me without cause, do not sheathe me without honor. Large photographs of the men my husband loved kept him company on the walls. They were of General McClellan, General Sheridan, and Mr. Lawrence Barrett. Over his desk was a picture of his wife in bridal dress. Comparatively modern art was represented by two of the Rogers statuettes that we had carried about with us for years. Transportation for necessary household articles was often so limited it was sometimes a question whether anything that was not absolutely needed for the preservation of life should be taken with us. But our attachment for those little figures and the associations connected with them made us study out a way always to carry them. At the end of each journey, we unboxed them ourselves and sifted the sawdust through our fingers carefully, for the figures were invariably dismembered. My husband's first occupation was to hang the few pictures and mend the statuettes. He glued on the broken portions and molded putty in the crevices where the biscuit had crumbled. Sometimes he had to replace a bit that was lost, and as he was very fond of modeling, I rather imagined that he was glad of an opportunity to practice on our broken statuettes. My husband, like many other men who achieve success in the graver walks of life, could go on and accomplish his ends without being dependent on the immediate voice of approval. But in all the small, more trifling acts of daily life, he asked for a prompt acknowledgment. It amused me greatly. It was so like a woman who can scarcely exist without encouragement. When he had reset an arm or modeled a cap, I could quite honestly praise his work. On one occasion, we found the head of a figure entirely severed from the trunk. Nothing daunted, he fell to patching it up again. I had not the conscience to promise him the future of a Thorvaldson this time. The distorted throat, made of unwieldy putty, gave the formerly erect, soldierly neck a decided appearance of goiter. My laughter discouraged the impromptu artist, who for one moment felt that a restoration is not quite equal to the original. He declared that he would put a coat of gray paint over all, so that in a dim corner they might pass for new. I insisted that it should be a very dark corner. Both of the statuettes represented scenes from the war. One was called Wounded to the Rear, and the other Letter Day. The latter was the figure of a soldier sitting in a cramped, bent position holding an inkstand in one hand and scratching his head for thoughts with the pen. The inane poise of his chin as he looked up into the uninspiring air and the hopeless expression of his eyes as he searched for ideas 
showed how unusual to him were all efforts at composition. We had a witty friend who had served with my husband during the war. Many an evening in front of our open fire they fought over their old battles together. He used to look at the statuette quizzically as he seated himself near the hearth, and once told us that he never saw it without being reminded of his own struggles during the war to write to his wife. She was southern in sympathies as well as in birth, but too absolutely devoted to her husband to remain at her southern home. When he wrote to her in the north where she was staying, it was quite to be understood that there was a limit to topics between them, as they kept strictly to subjects that were foreign to the vexed question. To the army in the field, the all-absorbing thought was of the actual occurrences of the day. The past was, for the time, blotted out. The future had no personal plans in the hearts of men who fought as our heroes did. And so it came to pass that the letters between the two, with such diversity of sentiment regarding the contest, were apt to be short and solely personal how the eyes of that bright man twinkled when he said i used to look just like that man in the rogers statuette when i was racking my brains to fill up the sheet of paper my orders carried me constantly through the country where my wife's kin lived why custer old man i could not write to her and say i have cut the canal in the shenandoah valley and ruined your mother's plantation or yesterday i drove off all your brother's stock to feed our army of course one can't talk sentiment on every line and so i sometimes sent off a mighty short epistle we often lounged about my husband's room at dusk without a lamp the firelight reflected the large glittering eyes of the animals heads and except that we were such a jolly family the surroundings would have suggested arenas and martyrs i used to think that a man on the brink of mania thrust suddenly into such a place in the dim flickering light would be hurried to his doom by fright we loved the place dearly the great difficulty was that the general would bury himself too much in the delight of having a castle as securely barred as if the entrance were by a portcullis. When he had worked too long and steadily, I opened the doors, determined that his room should not resemble that of Walter Scott. An old engraving represents a room in which but one chair is significantly placed. In our plans for a home in our old age, we included a den for my husband at the top of the house. We had read somewhere of one like that, ascribed to Victor Hugo. The room was said not even to have a staircase, but was entered by a ladder which the owner could draw up the aperture after him. End of chapter 19« Chapter Twenty of Boots and Saddles, or Life in Dakota with General Custer, by Elizabeth Custer. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Sue Anderson. Chapter Twenty: The Summer of the Black Hills Expedition. I used to be thankful that ours was a mounted regiment on one account. If we had belonged to the infantry. The regiment would have been sent out much sooner. The horses were too valuable to have their lives endangered by encountering a blizzard, while it was believed that an enlisted man had enough pluck and endurance to bring him out of a storm in one way or another. Tardy as the spring was up there, the grass began at last to be suitable for grazing, and preparations for an expedition to the Black Hills were being carried on. I had found accidentally 
that my husband was fitting up an ambulance for traveling, and as he never rode in one himself, nor arranged to take one for his own comfort, I decided at once that he was planning to take me with him. Mary and I had lived in such close quarters that she counted on going also, and went to the general to petition. To keep her from knowing that he intended to take us, he argued that we could not get along with so little room, that there was only to be allowed half a wagon for the camp outfit of the headquarters mess. You done no better than that, General, she replied. Me and Miss Libby could keep house in a flour barrel. At the very last, news came through Indian scouts that the summer might be full of danger, and my heart was almost broken at finding that the general did not dare to take me with him. Whatever peril might be awaiting me on the expedition, nothing could be equal to the suffering of suspense at home. The black hour came again, and with it the terrible parting, which seemed a foreshadowing of the most intense anguish that our Heavenly Father can send to His children. When I resumed my life, and tried to portion off the day with occupations, in order that the time should fly faster, I found that the one silver thread running through the dark woof of the dragging hours was the hope of the letters we were promised. Scouts were to be sent back four times during the absence of the regiment. The infantry came to garrison our post. In the event of attack, my husband left a Gatling gun on the hills at the rear of the camp. It is a small cannon which is discharged by turning a crank that scatters the shot in all directions, and is especially serviceable at short range. A detachment of soldiers was stationed on the bluff back of us that commanded the most extended view of the country. The voice of the sentinel calling at regular intervals during the night all's well often closed our anxious eyes out there one slept lightly and any unusual noise was attributed to an attack on our pickets and caused us many a wakeful hour with what relief we looked up daily to the little group of tents when we finally realized that we were alone the officer who commanded this little station was an old bachelor who did not believe in marriage in the army. Not knowing this, we told him with some enthusiasm how safe and thankful we felt in having him for our defender. He quite checked our enthusiasm by replying briefly that, in case of attack, his duty was to protect government property the defense of women came last. This was the first instance I had ever known of an officer who did not believe a woman was God's best gift to man. We were not effectually suppressed, for the only safe place in which we could walk was along the beat of the sentry on the brow of the hill near the tent of this zoological specimen. Here we resorted every evening at twilight to try and get cool, for the sun burns fiercely during the short northern summer. With the hot weather, the Mosquito War began. Fort Lincoln was celebrated as the worst place in the United States for these pests. The inundations recurring each spring opposite us brought later in the year myriads of the insects, those I had known on the Red River of the South were nothing in comparison. If the wind was in a certain direction, they tormented us all day long. I can see now how we women looked, taking our evening stroll, a little procession of fluttering females, with scarfs and overdresses drawn over our heads, whisking handkerchiefs and beating the air with fans. It required constant activity to keep off the swarms of those wretched little insects that annoyed us every moment during our airing. In the evening we became almost desperate. It seemed very hard, after our long winter's imprisonment, to miss a single hour out of doors during the short summer. 
we had petitioned that in the rebuilding of our house the piazza around it should be made wide like those we enjoyed in the south on this delightful gallery we assembled every evening we were obliged to make special toilets for our protection and they were far from picturesque or becoming someone discovered that wrapping newspapers around our ankles and feet and drawing the stocking over would protect down to the slipper then after tucking our skirts closely around us we fixed ourselves in a chair not daring to move one night a strange officer came to see us and taking his place among the group of huddled up women he tried not to smile i discovered him taking in my tout ensemble however and realized myself what an incongruity i was on that lovely gallery and in the broad moonlight i had adopted a head net they were little tarlatan bags gathered at one end and just large enough to prevent their touching the face they looked like dolls crinolines and would make a seraph seem ugly in desperation i had added a waterproof cloak buckskin gauntlets and forgot to hide under my gown the tips of the general's riding boots tucked up like a mummy i was something at which no one could resist laughing the stranger beat off the mosquitoes until there lay on the floor before him a black semicircle of those he had slain he acknowledged later that all vanity regarding personal appearance would be apt to disappear before the attacks to which we were subjected we fought in succession five varieties of mosquitoes the last that came were the most vicious they were so small they slid easily through the ordinary bar and we had to put an inside layer of tarlatan on doors and windows we did not venture to light a lamp in the evening and at five o'clock the netting was let down over the beds and the doors and windows were closed when it came time to retire we removed our garments in another room and grew skillful in making sudden sallies into the sleeping room and quick plunges under the bar the cattle and horses suffered pitiably during the reign of the mosquitoes they used to push their way into the underbrush to try if a thicket would afford them protection if a fire were lighted for their relief they huddled together on the side toward which the wind blew the smoke as it was down by the river they were worse off than ever the cattle grew thin for there were days when it was impossible for them to graze we knew of their being driven mad and dying of exhaustion after a long season of torment the poor dogs dug deep holes in the side of the hills where they half smothered in their attempt to escape the missouri river at the point where we had to cross sometimes represented a lifetime of terror to me we were occasionally compelled to go to the town of bismarck four miles back on the other side i could not escape the journey for it was the termination of the railroad and officers and their families coming from the east were often detained there while waiting for the steamer to take them to their posts they were compelled to stay in the untidy uncomfortable little hotel if i sent for them they declined to come to us fearing they might make extra trouble if i went for them in the post ambulance i rarely made a fruitless errand even when elated with the prospect of a little outing at st paul i so dreaded that terrible river that we must cross going and coming it almost destroyed my pleasure for a time the current was so swift that it was almost impossible for the strongest swimmer to save himself if once he fell in the mud settled on him instantly clogging his movements and bore him under some of the soldiers had been drowned in attempting to cross in frail insecure skiffs to the drinking huts opposite 
as I looked into this roaring torrent, whose current rushes on at the rate of six miles an hour, I rarely failed to picture to myself the upturned faces of those lost men. The river is very crooked and full of sandbars, the channel changing every year. The banks are so honeycombed by the force of the water that great portions are constantly caving in. They used to fall with a loud thud into the river, seeming to unsettle the very foundations of the earth. In consequence, it was hard work for the ferry boat to make a landing, and more difficult to keep tied up when once there. The boat we were obliged to use was owned by some citizens who had contracted with the government to do the work at that point. In honor of its new duty, they renamed it the Union. The western word ramshackly described it. It was too large and unwieldy for the purpose, and it had been condemned as unsafe further down the river, where citizens value life more highly. The wheezing and groaning of the old machinery told plainly how great an effort it was to propel the boat at all. The road down to the plank was so steep, cut deep into the bank as it was, that even with the brakes on, the ambulance seemed to be turning a somersault over the four mules. They kicked and struggled, and opposed going on the boat at all. We struck suddenly at the foot of the incline, with a thump that drew us off the seat of the ambulance. The high eyes of the driver, the creak of the iron brake, and the expressive remarks of the boatman in malediction upon the mules made it all seem like a descent into Hades, and the sticks an enviable river in contrast. The ambulance was placed on deck where we could see the patched boiler, and through the chinks and seams of the furnace we watched the fire, expecting an explosion momentarily. After we were once out in the channel, the real trouble began. I never knew, when I started for Bismarck, whether we would not land at Yankton, five hundred miles below. The wheel often refused to revolve more than halfway. The boat would turn about, and we would shoot down the river at a mad rate. I used to receive elaborate nautical explanations from the confused old captain about why that happened. My intellect was slow to take in any other thought than the terrifying one, that he had lost control of the boat. I never felt tranquil, even when the difficulty was righted, until I set my foot on the shore, although the ground itself was insecure from being honeycombed by the current. The captain doubtless heard my paean of thanks when I turned my back on his old craft, for once afterward I received from him a crumpled, soiled letter, with curious spelling and cramped hand, in which he addressed me as highly honored lady, and in lofty-sounding terms proceeded to praise his boat, assuring me that, if I would deign to confer on him the honor of my presence, he would prove it a quite safe and as pert a steamer as sailed. With a great flourish, he added, for the Union must and shall be preserved, and signed himself my most humble admirer. We were told when the expedition started that we might expect our first letters in two weeks. The mail was delayed, unfortunately, and each day after the fortnight had expired seemed a month. In spite of all my efforts to be busy, there was little heart in any occupation. The women met together every day and read aloud in turn. Everyone set to work to make a present for the absent ones, with which to surprise them on their return. We played croquet. This was tame sport, however, for no one dared to vary the humdrum diversion by a brisk little quarrel which is the usual accompaniment of that game. 
we feared to disagree even over trifles for if we did it might end in our losing our only companionship we knew that we could not expect in that climate that the freshness of summer would last for more than a short time after the sun had come to its supremest in the way of heat the drought was unbroken the dews were hardly perceptible that year even our brief enjoyment of the verdure was cut short a sirocco came up suddenly the sky became copper-colored and the air murky and stifling the slightest touch of metal or even the door handles almost blistered the fingers the strong wind that blew seemed to shrivel the skin as it touched us the grass was burned down into the roots and we had no more of it that season this wind lasted for two hours and we could not keep back apprehensions at the strange occurrence after that during the summer as we walked over the little space allowed us our shoes were cut by the crisp brown stubble and the sod was dry and unyielding under our feet as far as we could see the scorched earth sent up over its surface floating waves of heated atmosphere no green thing was left the only flowers that had not been scorched out of existence were the soap plants which have a sword-like stalk out of which grow the thick creamy petals of its flower the roots that extend for many feet in all directions near the surface of the soil enable it to secure moisture sufficient to keep it alive the only other flower was the bluebell which dotted a hill where we were accustomed to climb in order to command a better view of the country in our efforts to discover the scouts with the mail one can scarcely imagine how hungrily we gazed at those little blossoms they swung lightly on their cunningly fashioned stems that swayed and tossed the tiny azure cups but withstood the strongest wind i cannot see even a sketch of that flower now without thinking how grateful we were for them out there in that stripped and almost god-forgotten land when we threw ourselves on the turf among them the little bells almost seemed to us to ring out a tiny sound as if they were saying in flowery cadence the hand that made us is divine our eyes seemed to be perpetually strained watching the horizon for the longed for scouts at dawn one morning which is at three o'clock in summer in dakota i was awakened by strange sounds at the door when i drew the curtain there were the re scouts and on their ponies the mail bag marked by some facetious hand black hills express it took but a second to fling on a wrapper and fairly tumble down the steps the indians made the sign of long hair and called ouches which is the word denoting that in their language the general had borne this name with them for some time i was too impatient to wait for their tardy movements and tried to loosen the mail bag the indian always pompous and important if he carries dispatches wafted me away i understood enough to be sure that no one would receive the mail but the officer in command as the scout slowly moved down the line toward his quarters other impatient female figures with flying hair came dancing restlessly out on the porches every woman soon knew the news had come even the cooks scantily attired ran out to stand beside their mistresses and waved their fat arms to the indians to hurry them on our faithful soldier kivan whom my husband had left to care for us hearing the commotion came to ask what he could do i sent him to bring back the letters he in turn thinking only to serve me made an effort to open the mail bag but the watchful indian suppressed him quickly the old fellow's face beamed with delight when he placed the great official envelope 
crowded with closely written pages in my hand how soon they were devoured though and what a blank there seemed in the day when we knew we had nothing more to expect three times after that we had letters they were most interesting with descriptions of the charm of travelling over ground no white feet had ever before touched my family could not avoid even at that distance studying up little plans to tease me after describing their discovery and entrance into a huge and almost hidden cave my husband said that colonel tom and he had come upon the bones of a white man doubtless the only one who had ever set foot in that portion of the world beside him lay a tin cup some buttons from his coat and a rusty ancient flintlock musket all were marked with his initials they were the same as those of one of the friends whom i had known when a little romping girl of seventeen this they said in the language of a dime novel explains the mysterious disappearance of your old love rather than meet such a fate as awaited him in marrying you old lady he has chosen to seek out solitude in a cavern and there die of course i thought what ingenuity they had employed to invent such a tale when they came back at the end of the summer and brought the musket and other mementos with the very initials rusting in the metal and declared on honor they had found the skeleton i was compelled to believe them not that the remains of the unfortunate man were those of my early friend who was soon afterward accounted for but that some unhappy man had actually wandered into that dismal place and died a tragic lonely death when the day of their return came i was simply wild with joy i hid behind the door as the command rode into garrison ashamed to be seen crying and laughing and dancing up and down with excitement i tried to remain there and receive the general screened from the eyes of outsiders it was impossible i was down the steps and beside my husband without being conscious of how i got there i was recalled to my senses and overwhelmed with confusion by a great cheer from the soldiers who i had forgotten were lookers-on regular soldiers rarely cheer and the unusual sound together with the embarrassment into which i had unconsciously plunged myself made the few steps back to the house seem a mile when we could take time to look every one over they were all amusing some wives did not know their husbands and looked indignant enough when caught in an embrace by an apparent stranger many like the general had grown heavy beards all were sunburned their hair faded and their clothes so patched that the original blue of the uniform was scarcely visible of course there had been nothing on the expedition save pieces of white canvas with which to reinforce the riding breeches put new elbows on sleeves and replace the worn knees the boots were out at the toes and the clothing of some was so beyond repair that the officers wanted to escape observation by slipping with their tattered rags into the kitchen door the instruments of the band were jammed and tarnished but they still produced enough music for us to recognize the old tune of gary owen to which the regiment always returned by and by the long wagon train appeared many of the covers had elk horns strapped to them and they looked like strange bristling animals as they drew near some of the antlers were brought to us as presents besides them we had skins specimens of gold and mica and petrified shells of iridescent colors snake rattles pressed flowers and petrified wood my husband brought me a keg of the most delicious water from a mountain stream it was almost my only look at clear water for years 
as most of the streams west of the Missouri are muddy. As soon as the column appeared in sight, the old soldier, who had served me with such fidelity all summer, went to Mary to tell her the news. He also said that as long as the general had put Mrs. Custer in his charge, he knew how to behave. Now, being no longer on honor, he added, I intend to celebrate their return by going on a tremendous bum. How anyone could get drunk in so short a time was a mystery. The general had hardly removed his buckskin coat before the old fellow stumbled up the steps and nearly fell in the door with his arms full of puppies that had arrived during the summer. The rejoicing was too general for misdemeanors to be noticed. The man was thanked for his watchful care over me during the months past, and advised to find a place to go to sleep as soon as possible. End of chapter 20「Chapter Twenty One of Boots and Saddles or Life in Dakota with General Custer by Elizabeth Custer. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Sue Anderson. Chapter Twenty One Domestic Trials. From the clouds and gloom of the summer days, I walked again into the broad blaze of sunshine which my husband's blithe spirit made. I did everything I could to put out of my mind the long, anxious, lonely months. It was still pleasant enough to ride, and occasionally we went out in parties large enough to be safe, and had a jackrabbit or wolf chase. In the autumn we went into the States on a short leave of absence. Much to our regret, we had to take our prized girlfriend home. Her family begged for her return. The last goodbye to us was an appeal from the young officers to bring back another, and we did so, for while we were east we had the good fortune to persuade another father and mother to part with their daughter. An incident of our journey was an amusing illustration of the vicissitudes of Western life. In passing through Fargo on the Northern Pacific Railroad, an old townsman of ours always came to see us, but invariably after dark. He had taken a claim in the very heart of the town, which was disputed by an energetic widow. If he left his place in the daytime for a few hours, he always returned to find his cabin occupied by the goods and chattels of the widow, and his own effects reposing on the snow outside his door. Then ensued the ejection of the interloper by one of the town authorities, and our friend would re-establish himself. After these raids were repeated a few times, he learned to keep guard during the day and steal out after dark. In vain, outsiders advised him to settle the difficulty by asking a clergyman to unite the claims. His eyes turned from the widow to a young girl in his native state, who now presides unmolested over the disputed domicile, while the widow has forsaken war for the peace of another hearthstone. The question of servants was a very serious one to those living on the borders of civilization as we did. There was never a station equal to those frozen up regions. Should servants go out there in the fall, they were almost certain to become engaged to the soldiers and marry after the trains were taken off and no new ones could reach us. It often happened that delicate ladies had to do all kinds of menial service for a time. Except for a kind-hearted soldier now and then, who was too devoted to the wife of his company officer to see her do everything, I hardly know how army ladies would have endured their occasional domestic trials. The soldiers were especially fond of children, and knew how to amuse them. 
indeed their willing hearts made them quick to learn all kinds of domestic work i think they even regretted that they could not sew when they saw an overtaxed lady wearily moving her needle we had no trouble fortunately our colored cook not only commanded us and as much of the post as she could but she tyrannized over her two sisters whom she had brought from kentucky for us these were thought excellent servants but mary invested with a little brief authority ruled like a despot the youngest having been born after the emancipation proclamation was looked down upon by her elder sister who had been a slave in her moments of rage the most deadly insult was to call the younger one you worthless free nigger you i think with deep gratitude of their devotion to us since they were colored people they had not even the excitement of beau among the enlisted men sometimes they sighed and longed for home at such times mary used to say to me miss libby you has the general and you don't mind whar you is so long as you has him but you can't tell what it is for us to live in a country whar there's no festivals meetin houses or dances when we reached st paul on our return from leave of absence we were generally met with telegrams from our friends at fort lincoln imploring us to bring them cooks the railroad officials were good enough to give us passes so we could always take them without much trouble the first time after advertising only the young and pretty ones were selected from those who came to us at the hotel their almost instantaneous capitulation to the devotion of the soldiers taught us a lesson after that we only took the middle-aged and plain when we were fairly started on our journey the general would look them over chuckle to himself and jog my elbow for me to see the ancients as tourists he would add under his breath that evidently we had settled the question that time for no soldier would look at such antediluvians he reckoned too soon he hardly took into consideration that after hundreds of soldiers had lived for months without seeing so much as the distant flutter of a woman's drapery they ceased to be fastidious or critical without an exception these antique parchment-faced women in a few weeks after we had delivered them over to their mistresses began to metamorphose they bought tawdry ornaments at the sutler's store and hurried after dinner to adorn themselves to meet the enlisted men who even under adverse circumstances will a wooing go i remembered well the disheartened eyes of one of our pretty young friends when she told me it was of no manner of use to try to keep a white servant even the ugly old female that we had brought her and that cooked so well was already beginning to primp and powder by this time our dearly loved neighbor had become exhausted by the almost constant care of her two children and with only inefficient servants to help her through our sympathy for the hard life she had led out in that wilderness we had fallen into the way of calling her poor miss annie having known her as a girl in the states she would have been rich miss annie with a brave handsome husband a distinguished father an abundant income and bright healthful children she was rich it would not have been strange if the clouds had obscured these blessings living the taxing and wearying life she did on the frontier in vain the devoted husband sought to share her cares the very climax of her troubles seemed to have arrived when she confided to me that she would soon need an experienced nurse to care for her through her coming peril the trains had ceased running so that one could not be sent for from st paul there was no neighborly help to be expected even 
for all of our ladies were young and inexperienced. There seemed to be no one to whom we could look for aid. Instead of rejoicing, as we would have done in the States, over the sweet privilege of coming maternity, we cried and were almost disconsolate. There were no soft, dainty clothes to receive the little stranger, no one to take care of it when it did come. The young surgeon was wholly inexperienced in such duty, and the future looked gloomy enough. Fortunately, I remembered at last one of the camp women, who had long followed the regiment as laundress and had led a quiet, orderly life. Poor Miss Annie shuddered when I spoke of her, for the woman was a Mexican, and like the rest of that hairy tribe, she had so coarse and stubborn a beard that her chin had a blue look after shaving, in marked contrast to her swarthy face. She was tall, angular, awkward, and seemingly coarse, but I knew her to be tender-hearted. In days gone by I had found, when she told me her troubles, that they had softened her nature. When she first came to our regiment, she was married to a trooper, who, to all appearance, was good to her. My first knowledge of her was in Kentucky. She was our laundress, and when she brought the linen home, it was fluted and frilled so daintily that I considered her a treasure. She always came at night, and when I went out to pay her, she was very shy and kept a veil pinned about the lower part of her face. The cook told me one day that she was sick and in trouble, and I went to see her. It seemed the poor thing had accumulated several hundred dollars by washing, baking pies for the soldiers, and sewing the clothes for them that had been refitted by the tailor. Her husband had obtained possession of the money and had deserted. She told me that she had lived a rough life before coming to the seventh even dressing as a man in order to support herself by driving the ox teams over the plains to new mexico the railroads had replaced that mode of transporting freight and she was thrown out of employment finding the life as a laundress easier she had resumed her woman's dress and entered the army and thinking to make her place more secure had accepted the hand of the man whose desertion she was now mourning. It was not long after this, however, before old Nash, for through everything she kept her first husband's name, consoled herself. Without going through the ceremony or expense of a divorce, she married another soldier and came with us out to Dakota. Of course, her husband was obliged to march with his company, it was a hard life for her, camping out with the other laundresses, as they are limited for room, and several are obliged to share a tent together. In the daytime they ride in an army wagon, huddled in with children and baggage. After all the rough summer out of doors, it was a great boon to her to get a little cabin in Laundress Row at our post. Another trouble came to her, however. Her new husband succeeded in stealing her savings and deserting like the first. Old Nash mourned her money a short time, but soon found solace in going to the soldiers' balls dressed in gauzy, low-necked gowns. Notwithstanding her architectural build and massive features, she had no sooner accumulated another bank account than her hand was solicited for the third time, again ignoring the law, and thinking divorce a superfluous luxury, she captured the handsomest soldier in her company. He was Colonel Tom's own man, and when we were riding, we often admired the admirably fitting uniform his wife had made over, and which displayed to advantage his well-proportioned figure. It was certainly a mariage de conviance. Fortunes are comparative. A few hundred dollars out there 
was quite equal to many thousands in New York. The trooper thought he had done a very good thing for himself, for notwithstanding his wife was no longer young and was undeniably homely, she could cook well and spared him from eating with his company, and she was a good investment, for she earned so much by her industry. In addition to all these traits, she was already that most desirable creature in all walks of life a woman of means the bride and groom returned from the ceremony performed by the bismarck clergyman and began housekeeping in the little quarters old nash had refurnished for the occasion when miss annie and i went down to see her and make our petitions we found the little place shining the bed was hung with pink cambric and on some shelves she showed us silk and woolen stuffs for gowns. Bits of carpet were on the floor, and the dresser, improvised out of a packing box, shone with polished tins. Outside we were presented to some chickens, which were riches indeed out there in that Novaya Semlea climate. She was very gentle with our friend when we told our errand, and gave her needful advice in her broken Mexican tongue. After listening to her tribute to the goodness of her husband, we made such pitiful entreaties that we at last prevailed on her to leave him. She insisted upon the promise that she might come home every evening and cook her Manny Manny's supper. We learned from her that her own two children had died in Mexico and that she had learned midwifery from her mother. She confirmed what I had previously heard, that she had constant practice among the camp women. Old Nash appeared at the required hour, and was as skillful a physician as she was a nurse. My friend used to whisper to me that when she watched her moving about in the dim light of the sick room, she thought with a shiver sometimes, how like a man she seemed occasionally she came to the bed and in her harsh voice asked are you comf meaning comfortable the gentle dexterous manner in which she lifted and cared for the little woman quieted her dread of this giant giraffe by degrees i was promoted to the duty of bathing and dressing the little newcomer the young mother giving directions from the pillow when old Nash was no longer absolutely necessary, she went back to her husband, a richer woman by much gratitude and a great deal of money. Her past life of hardship and exposure told on her in time, and she became ailing and rheumatic. Finally, after we had left Dakota, we heard that, when death approached, she made an appeal to the camp women who surrounded her and had nursed her through her illness she implored them to put her in her coffin just as she was when she died and bury her at once they thinking such a course would not be paying proper attention to the dead broke their promise the mystery which the old creature had guarded for so many years through a life always public and conspicuous, was revealed. Old Nash, years before, becoming weary of the laborious life of a man, had assumed the disguise of a woman, and had hoped to carry the secret into the grave. The surgeon's certificate, stating the sex of Old Nash, together with the simple record of a laundress in the regiment for ten years, was all the brief history ever known. After enduring the jibes and scoffs of his comrades for a few days, life became unbearable to the handsome soldier who had played the part of husband in order to gain possession of his wife's savings and vary the plain fare of the soldier with good suppers. He went into one of the company's stables when no one was there and shot himself. When our friend, whom the old creature had so carefully nursed, read the newspaper paragraph describing old Nash's death, 
her only comment was a reference to the mexican's oft repeated question to her poor old thing i hope she is comf at last end of chapter twenty one chapter twenty two of boots and saddles or life in dakota with general custer by elizabeth custer this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by sue anderson chapter twenty two capture and escape of rain in the face as the second winter progressed it bade fair to be a repetition of the first until an event happened that excited us all very much i must preface my account of the occurrence by going back to the summer of the yellowstone campaign two of the citizens attached to the expedition one as the sutler the other as the veterinary surgeon were in the habit of riding by themselves a great deal not being enlisted men much more liberty than soldiers have was allowed them many warnings were given however and an instance fresh in the minds of the officers of the killing by indians of two of their comrades the year before was repeatedly told to them one day their last hour of lingering came while they stopped to water their horses some indians concealed in a gully shot them within sight of our regiment who were then fighting on the hill and did not find the bodies for some time afterward both of the murdered men were favorites both left families and regret and sympathy were general throughout the command a year and a half afterward information came to our post fort lincoln that an indian was then at the agency at standing rock drawing his rations blankets and ammunition from the government and at the same time boasting of the murder of these two men this intelligence created intense indignation in our garrison a detachment was quickly prepared and started out with sealed orders the day was bitter and not a still cold for the wind blew and cut like needle points into the faces of the troopers no one was aware even what direction they were to take general custer knew that it was absolutely necessary that caution and secrecy should be observed at the next post twenty miles below there were scouts employed they would not fail to send out a runner and warn the standing rock indians of the coming of the command and its object if they could learn what it was when the runner carries important news he starts with an even gait in the morning and keeps it up all day hardly stopping to drink at the streams he crosses such a courier would outstrip a command of cavalry in the ordinary time it makes on a march accordingly fort rice was left behind many miles before the orders were opened they contained directions to capture and bring back an unk papa indian called rain in the face the avowed murderer of the sutler and the veterinary surgeon the command consisted of two officers and one hundred men the general had selected his brother to assist in this delicate transaction as he had been wont to do ever since they began their life of adventure together during the war they arrived on the day that the indians were drawing their rations of beef there were five hundred at the agency armed with the latest long-range rifles it was more and more clear that too much care could not be taken to prevent the object of the visit from being known to the warriors an expedition had been sent down once before but news of its intentions had reached the agency in time for the culprit to escape he could not refrain even after this warning from openly vaunting his crime in order then to deceive the indians about their appearance at the agency the captain in command resorted to a ruse 
he sent fifty men to the camp ten miles away to make inquiries for three indians who had murdered citizens on the red river the year before colonel custer was ordered to take five picked men and go to the trader's store where the indians resort constantly this required great coolness and extreme patience for they had to lounge about seemingly indifferent until they could be certain the right man was discovered the cold made the indians draw their blankets around them and cover their heads there is never any individuality about their dress except when arrayed for a council or a dance it was therefore almost impossible to tell one from the other colonel tom had to wait for hours only looking furtively when the sharp eyes of these wary creatures were off guard at last one of them loosened his blanket and with the meagre description that had been given him colonel tom identified him as rain in the face coming suddenly from behind he threw his arms about him and seized the winchester rifle that the savage attempted to cock he was taken entirely by surprise no fear showed itself but from the characteristically stolid face hate and revenge flashed out for an instant he drew himself up in an independent manner to show his brother warriors that he did not dread death among them he had been considered brave beyond precedent because he had dared to enter the agency store at all and so encounter the risk of arrest the soldiers tied his hands and mounted guard over him about thirty indians surrounded them instantly and one old orator commenced an harangue to the others inciting them to recapture their brother breathless excitement prevailed at that moment the captain in command appeared in their midst with the same coolness he had shown in the war and during the six years of his indian campaigns he spoke to them through an interpreter with prudence and tact he explained that they intended to give the prisoner exactly the treatment a white man would receive under like circumstances that nothing would induce them to give him up and the better plan to save bloodshed would be for the chiefs to withdraw and take with them their followers seeing that they could accomplish nothing by intimidation or by superior numbers they had recourse to parley and proposed to compromise they offered as a sacrifice two indians of the tribe in exchange for rain in the face it was generosity like that of artemus ward who offered his wife's relatives on the altar of his country for they took care not to offer for sacrifice any but indians of low rank rain in the face was a very distinguished warrior among them and belonged to a family of six brothers one of whom iron horse was very influential the officers prevailed in the end and the prisoner was taken to the cavalry camp during the time that the indians were opposing his removal the troopers had assembled around the entrance ready for an emergency and prepared to escort the murderer away the indians instantly vanished all went quickly and quietly to their camp ten miles distant later in the day a party of fifty mounted warriors dashed through the agency to the road beyond which had to be taken by our troopers on the way home of course our officers expected an attack from that party when they began their homeward march to their surprise they were unmolested we learned afterward that the mounted indians went to the camp of two bears to urge the young braves there to combine with them in the recapture of rain in the face but two bears had long been friendly to the white man he was too old to fight and prevented his young men from joining in the contemplated rescue after the command had returned and the officers had reported general custer sent for rain in the face 
He was tall, straight, and young. His face was quite imperturbable. In a subsequent interview, the general locked himself in his room with him, through an interpreter, and with every clever question and infinite patience, he spent hours trying to induce the Indian to acknowledge his crime. The culprit's face finally lost its impervious look, and he showed some agitation. He gave a brief account of the murder, and the next day made a full confession before all the officers. He said neither of the white men was armed when attacked. He had shot the old man, but he did not die instantly, riding a short distance before falling from his horse. He then went to him, and with his stone mallet beat out the last breath left. Before leaving him, he shot his body full of arrows. The younger man signaled to them from the bushes, and they knew that the manner in which he held up his hand was an overture of peace. When he reached him, the white man gave him his hat as another and further petition for mercy, but he shot him at once, first with his gun and then with arrows. One of the latter entering his back, the dying man struggled to pull it through. Neither man was scalped, as the elder was bald, and the younger had closely cropped hair. This cruel story set the blood of the officers flowing hotly. They had already heard from one of the white scouts a description of rain in the face at a sun dance, when he had betrayed himself as the murderer of the veterinary surgeon by describing in triumph his beating out the brains of the old man with his mallet. After all, this is not to be wondered at that each officer strode out of the room with blazing eyes. Two Indians, one of them Iron Horse, had followed the cavalry up from the agency and asked to see their comrade. The general sent again for rain in the face. He came into the room with clanking chains and with the guard at his heels. He was dressed in mourning. His leggings were black and his sable blanket was belted by a band of white beads. One black feather stood erect on his head. Iron Horse supposed that he was to be hung at once, and that this would be the final interview. The older brother, believing there was no hope, was very solemn. He removed his heavily beaded and embroidered buffalo robe, and replaced it with the plain one that Rain in the Face wore. He exchanged pipes, also giving him his highly ornamented one that he might afterward present it to the general. These pipes are valuable, as the material of which the bowls are made has to be brought from Kansas. Then, finding that there was a prospect of rain in the faces having his trial in Washington, he took off the medal that had been given to his father by a former president, whose likeness was in the medallion, and placed it over the neck of his brother, that it might be a silent argument in his favor when he confronted the great father. It was an impressive and melancholy scene. Iron Horse charged his brother not to attempt to escape, saying that if he did get back to the reservation, he would surely be recaptured. He believed that he would be kindly treated while a captive, and perhaps the white chief would intercede for him to obtain his pardon. After asking him not to lose courage, they smoked again and silently withdrew. In about ten days, Iron Horse returned, bringing a portion of his tribe with him. The valley of the Missouri is wide and slopes gradually back to the bluffs. Beyond are the plains, rolling away for hundreds of miles to another river. There was a level stretch of three miles below our post down the river. From this direction we were accustomed to watch the approach of the bands of Indians coming from the reservation. We could see their arms glistening far down the valley long before we could distinguish who they were, except with a powerful field glass. As they came nearer, the sun caught a bit of gaudy scarlet or touched for a moment one of the feathers in a war bonnet. 
a new york charity ball could bring out no more antique heirlooms nor take more time in preparation than the costumes of indians prepared for council the war bonnets shields and necklaces of bear's claws are all handed down from faraway grandfathers and only aired on grand occasions every available bit of metal that could catch the light reflected and shone in the morning sun the belts were covered with brass nails shining with many an hour's polishing they had many weapons all kept in brilliant and glistening state the tomahawk is one of the heirlooms of the collection of arms it is not like the ones i used to see at mackinac as a child it looks more like a large ice pick the knife pistol and henry rifle are very modern and are always kept in the most perfect condition mrs lowe is the venus who prepares mars for war and many a long weary hour she spends in polishing the weapon and adorning the warrior the indians with iron horse came directly to headquarters and asked for a council as many as could get into the general's room entered there was time while they were preparing to send for the ladies and a few of us were tucked away on the lounge with injunctions not to move or whisper for my husband treated these indians with as much consideration as if they had been crowned heads the indians turned a surprised rather scornful glance into the ladies gallery for their women are always kept in the background in return for this we did not hesitate to criticize their toilets they were gorgeous in full dress iron horse wore an elaborate beaded and painted buckskin shirt with masses of solid embroidery of porcupine quills the sleeves and shoulders were ornamented with a fringe of scalp locks some of the hair we saw with a shudder was light and waving i could not but picture the little head sunning over with curls from which it had been taken for all the indian locks i have ever seen were straight and black the chief wore on his shoulders a sort of cape trimmed with a fringe of snowy ermine his leggings and moccasins were a mass of beadwork he wore a cap of otter without a crown though for it is their custom to leave the top of the head uncovered his hair was wound round and round with strips of otter that hung down his back the scalp locks were also tightly wound three eagle feathers that denote the number of warriors killed were so fastened to the lock that they stood erect there were several perforations in each ear from which depended bead earrings he had armlets of burnished brass thrown around him was a beaded blanket the red clay pipe had the wooden stem inlaid with silver and was embellished with the breast feathers of brilliantly plumaged birds the tobacco bag about two feet long had not an inch that was not decorated the costume was simply superb the next in rank had an immense buffalo robe as the distinguishing feature of his dress the inside was tanned almost white and his history was painted on the surface whoever ran might read for it represented only two scenes oft repeated the killing and scalping of warriors and the capture of ponies the general's patience with indians always surprised me he was of such an active temperament and dispatched his own work so rapidly that i have often wondered how he contained himself waiting an hour or more for them to get at the object of their visit they took their places according to rank in a semicircle about the general the pipe was filled and a match lighted by one of their number of inferior grade and then handed to iron horse who took a few leisurely whiffs even though we were so shut in the smoke was not oppressive 
Their tobacco is killick kinnick, prepared by drying the bark of the osier and mixing it with sumac. They inhale the smoke and exhale it from their nostrils. After all, in the first circle had smoked a little, the general included, they observed the Indian etiquette and passed the pipe back through each warrior's hand to the chief. It was then relighted, and he began again. It seemed to us that it went back and forth an endless number of times. No matter how pressing the emergency, every council begins in this manner. Iron Horse tired us out, but he was collecting himself and rehearsing his speech. We found afterward that it was prepared in advance, for during its recital he forgot and was prompted by one of the Indians in the outer circle. When the pipe was finally put away, they asked to have Rain in the Face present. He came into the room, trying to hide his pleasure at seeing his friends and his grief at his imprisonment. In an instant, the imperturbable expression settled down on his face like a curtain. The officers present could scarcely believe their eyes when they saw his brother approach and kiss him. Only once before, among all the tribes they had been with, had they seen such an occurrence. The Indian kiss is not demonstrative. The lips are laid softly on the cheek, and no sound is heard or motion made. It was only this grave occasion that induced the chief to show such feeling. Several of the ranking Indians followed his example. Then an old man among them stepped in front of Rain in the Face, lifted his hands, and raising his eyes reverentially, said a few words of prayer to the Great Spirit in behalf of their unfortunate brother. The prisoner dropped his head to hide the look in his eyes that he thought ill became a warrior as brave as he really was. The bitter, revengeful thoughts with which I had entered the room were for a moment forgotten, and I almost wished that he might be pardoned. But the vision of the hearthstones he had desolated came back to me directly, and I could not forget. Iron Horse began his speech in the usual high-pitched, unchangeable key. He thanked the general for his care of his brother, and the whole tenor of the rest was repeated petitions to ask the great father in Washington to spare his life. He then slowly took off his elaborate buckskin shirt and presented it to my husband. He ended by making a singular request which was worthy of Damon and Pythias, two shy young braves in the outer circle of the untitled, asked permission through their chief to share the captivity of rain in the face. I could not help recalling what someone had told me in the East, that women sometimes go to the state prison at Sing Sing and importune to be allowed to share the imprisonment of their husbands or brothers but no instance is found in the history of that great institution where a man has asked to divide with a friend or relative the sufferings of his sentence. Consent was given to the comrades to return to the guardhouse, but they were required to remain in confinement as he did until they were ready to return to the reservation. After all the ranking Indians had followed Iron Horse in speeches, with long, maundering, slowly delivered sentences, each like the other, the pipe was again produced. When it was smoked, the whole band filed out to eat the presence of food the general had given them, and soon afterward disappeared down the valley on their way home. After his two friends had left him, Rain in the Face occupied a part of the guardhouse with a citizen who had been caught stealing grain from the storehouse. For several months they had been chained together and used to walk in front of the little prison for exercise and air. 
the guardhouse was a poorly built insecure wooden building after a time the sentinels became less vigilant and the citizen with help from his friends outside who were working in the same way cut a hole in the wall at night and escaped he broke the chain attaching him to the indian who was left free to follow we found afterward that rain in the face did not dare to return to the reservation but made his way to the hostile camp in the spring of eighteen seventy four he sent word from there by an agency indian that he had joined sitting bull and was awaiting his revenge for his imprisonment as will be seen further on the stained waters of the little bighorn on june twenty fifth eighteen seventy six told how deadly and fatal that was the vengeance of that incarnate fiend was concentrated on the man who had effected his capture it was found on the battlefield that he had cut out the brave heart of the gallant loyal and lovable man our brother tom End of chapter twenty two